Section 58 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 58. How the 49ers Reached California. By Henry Charles Merwin. The length of the voyage from Atlantic ports to San Francisco was from four to five months, but most of the pioneers who came by sea avoided the passage around Cape Horn and crossed the Isthmus of Nicaragua, or, more commonly, of Panama. This, in either case, was a much shorter route, but it added the horrors of pestilence and fever, and of possible robbery and murder, to the ordinary dangers of the sea. All the blacklegs, it was noticed, took the shorter route, deeming themselves, no doubt, incapable of sustaining the prolonged ennui of a voyage around the Cape. Passengers who crossed the Isthmus of Panama disembarked at Chagres, a port so unhealthy that policies of life insurance contained a clause to the effect that if the insured remained there more than one night, his policy would be void. Chagres enjoyed the distinction of being the dirtiest place in the world. The inhabitants were almost all Negroes, and one pioneer declared that a flock of buzzards would present a favorable comparison with them. From Chagres there was, first, a voyage of seventy-five miles up the river of the same name to Gorgona, or to Cruces, five miles farther. This was accomplished in dugouts propelled by native Indians. Thence to Panama the pioneers travelled on foot, or on muleback, over a narrow, winding, bridle path through the mountains so overhung by trees and dense tropical growths that in many places it was dark even at midday. This was the opportunity of the Indian muleteer, and more than one gold-seeker never emerged from the gloomy depths of that winding trail. Originally it was the work of the Indians, but the Spaniards who used the path in the sixteenth century had improved it, and in many places had secured the bank with stones. Now, however, the trail had fallen into decay, and in spots was almost impassable. But the tracks worn in the soft, calcareous rock by the many iron-shot hoofs which had passed over it still remained, and the mule that bore the American seeking gold in California placed his feet in the very holes which had been made by his predecessors, painfully bearing the silver of Peru on its way to enrich the grandees of Spain. Bad as the journey across the isthmus was, or might be, the enforced delay at Panama was worse. The number of passengers far exceeded the capacity of the vessels sailing from that port to San Francisco, and those who waited at Panama were in constant danger of cholera, of the equally dreaded Panama fever, and sometimes of smallpox. The heat was almost unbearable, and the blacks were a source of annoyance and even of danger. Quote, there is not in the whole world remarked a contemporary San Francisco paper, a more infamous collection of villains than the Jamaica Negroes who are congregated at Panama and Chagres. End quote. In their eagerness to get away from Panama, some pioneers paid in advance for transportation in old rotten hogs, which were never expected or intended to reach San Francisco, but which, springing a leak or being otherwise disabled, would put into some port in Lower California, where the passengers would be left without the means of continuing their journey, and frequently without money. Both on the voyage from Panama and also on the long route around Cape Horn, ship captains often saved their good provisions for the California market, and fed their passengers on nauseous, quote, lobscows and dunderfunk, end quote. Scurvy and other diseases resulted. An appeal to the United States consul at Rio Janeiro, when the ship touched there, was sometimes effectual, and in other cases the passengers took matters into their own hands and disciplined a rapacious captain or deposed a drunkard one. In view of these uprisings, some New York skippers declined to take command of ships about to sail for California, supposing that passengers who could do such an unheard of thing as to rebel against the master of a vessel must be a race of pirates. Great pains were taken to secure a crew of determined men for these ships, and a plentiful supply of muskets, handcuffs, and shackles was always put on board. But such precautions proved to be ridiculously unnecessary. There was no case in which the pioneers usurped authority on shipboard without sufficient cause. 
and in no case was an emigrant brought to trial on reaching San Francisco. In the various ports at which they stopped, much was to be seen of foreign peoples and customs, and not infrequently the pioneers had an opportunity to show their mettle. At Santa Catarina, for example, a port on the lower coast of Brazil, a young American was murdered by a Spaniard. The authorities were inclined to treat the matter with great indifference, but there happened to be in the harbor two shiploads of passengers en route to San Francisco, and these men threatened to seize the fortress and demolish it if justice was not done. Thereupon the murderer was tried and hanged. Many South Americans in the various ports along the coast got their first correct notion of the people of the United States from these chance encounters with sea-going pioneers. Still more, of course, was the overland journey an education in self-reliance, in that resourcefulness which distinguishes the American, and in that courage which was so often needed and so abundantly displayed in the early mining days independence in the state of missouri was a favorite starting point and from this place there were two routes the southern one being by way of santa fe and the northern route following the oregon trail to fort hall and thence ascending the course of the humboldt river to its rise in the sierra nevadas at fort hall some large companies which had travelled from the mississippi river and even from states east of that separated one half going to oregon the other turning westward to california and thus were broken many ties of love and friendship which had been formed in the close intimacy of the long journey especially between the younger members of the company old diaries and letters reveal suggestions of romance if not of tragedy in these separations and in the choice which the emigrant maiden was sometimes forced to make between the conflicting claims of her lover and her parents in the year eighteen fifty fifty thousand crossed the plains in 1851 immigration fell off because even at that early date there was a business quote unquote, depression almost a quote unquote, panic in california but in 1852 it increased again and the plains became a thoroughfare dotted so far as the eye could see with long trains of white covered wagons moving slowly through the dust in one day a party from virginia passed thirty-two wagons and during a stop in the afternoon five hundred overtook them in after years the course of these wagons could easily be traced by the alien vegetation which marked it wherever the heavy wheels had broken the tough prairie sod there sprang up from the missouri to the sierras a narrow belt of flowering plants and familiar dooryard weeds silent witnesses of the great migration which had passed that way multitudes of horsemen accompanied the wagons and other multitudes plodded along on foot banners were flying here and there and the whole appearance was that of an army on the march at night camp fires gleamed from miles through the darkness and if the company were not exhausted the music of a violin or a banjo floated out on the still air of the prairies but the fatigue of the march supplemented by the arduous labors of camping out was usually sufficient to send the travellers to bed at the earliest possible moment the food consisted chiefly of salt pork or bacon varied when that was possible with buffalo meat or venison beans baked dough called bread and flapjacks the last always associated with mining life in california were made by mixing flour and water into a sort of butter seasoning with salt adding a little saleratus or cooking soda and frying the mixture in a pan greased with fat men ate enormously on these journeys four hundred pounds of sugar lasted for pioneers only ninety days this inordinate appetite and the quantity of salt meat eaten frequently resulted in scurvy from which there were some deaths another cause of illness was the use of milk from cows driven along with the wagon trains and made feverish by heat and fatigue many of the emigrants especially those who undertook the journey in forty nine or fifty were insufficiently equipped and little aware of the difficulties and dangers which awaited them death in many forms hovered over those heavy creaking canvas-covered wagons the quote -unquote, prairie schooners which drawn sometimes by horses sometimes by oxen sometimes by mules jolted slowly and laboriously over two thousand miles and more 
of plain and mountain death from disease from want of water from starvation from indians and in crossing the sierras from ranging snowstorms and intense cold rivers had to be forded deserts crossed and a thousand accidents and annoyances encountered some men made the long journey on foot even from points east of the mississippi river one gray-haired pioneer walked all the way from michigan with a pack on his back another enthusiast obtained some notoriety among the emigrants of eighteen fifty by trundling a wheelbarrow laden with his goods from illinois to salt lake city often the cattle would break loose at night and disappear on the vast plains and men in search of them were sometimes lost and died of starvation or were killed by indians simply for the sake of better grazing oxen have been known to retrace their steps at night for twenty-five miles the opportunities for selfishness for petulance for obstinacy for resentment were almost innumerable cooking and washing were the labours which in the absence of women proved most vexatious to the emigrants Quote, of all miserable work said one washing is the worst and no man who crossed the plains will ever find fault again with his wife for scalding on a washing day End quote. all the pioneers who have related their experiences on the overland journey speak of the bad effect on men's tempers quote, the perpetual vexation and hardships keep the nerves in a state of great irritability the trip is a sort of magic mirror exposing every man's qualities of heart vicious or amiable End quote. End of section 58section 59 of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by colleen mcmahon the world's story volume 13 the united states edited by eva march tappan section 59 early business days in san francisco 1849 to 1853 by henry childs merwin two years ago said the alta california in 1851 trade was a wild unorganized whirl staple goods went furiously up and down in price like wildcat mining stocks there was no telegraph by which supplies could be ordered from the east or inquiries could be answered and several months must elapse before an order sent by mail to new york could be filled a merchant at valparaiso once paid twenty thousand dollars for the information contained in a single letter from san francisco consigners in the east were almost wholly ignorant as to what people needed in california and how goods should be stowed for the long voyage around the cape great quantities of preserved food it was before the days of canning were spoiled en route coal was shipped in bulk without any ventilating appliances and it often took fire and destroyed the vessels in which it was carried one unfortunate woman the wife of a cape cod sea captain was wrecked thrice in this way having been transferred from one coal-laden schooner to another and later to a third all of which were set on fire by the heating of the coal and burned to the water's edge in one of these adventures she was lashed to a chair on deck where she spent five days in a rough sea, with smoke and gas pouring from the ship at every seam. Her final escape was made in a rowboat, which landed at a desolate spot on the coast of Peru. Elaborate gold-washing machines, which proved to be useless, and ready-made houses that nobody wanted, were among the articles shipped to San Francisco. The rate of interest was very high, capital being scarce, and storage in warehouses was both insecure from the great danger of fire and extremely expensive it was therefore nearly impossible for the merchants to hold their goods for a more favorable market in july eighteen forty nine lumber sold at the enormous rate of five hundred dollars a thousand feet fifty times the new england price but in the following spring immense shipments having arrived it brought scarcely enough to pay the freight bills tobacco which at first sold for two dollars a pound became so plentiful afterward that boxes of it were used for stepping stones and in one case as bret hart has related tobacco actually supplied the foundation for a wooden house holes in the sidewalk were stopped with bags of rice or beans with sacks of coffee 
and on one occasion with three barrels of revolvers, the supply far exceeding even the California demand for that article. Potatoes brought $60 a bushel at wholesale in 1849, but were raised so extensively in California the following year that the price fell to nothing, and whole cargoes of these useful vegetables just arrived from the east were dumped into the bay. In some places near San Francisco, it was really feared that a pestilence would result from huge piles of superfluous potatoes that lay rotting on the ground. Salaritus, worth in New York four cents a pound, sold at San Francisco in 1848 for $15 a pound. The menu of a breakfast for two at Sacramento in the same year was as follows. One box of sardines, $16. One pound of hard bread, $2.00. One pound of butter, six dollars. One half pound of cheese, three dollars. Two bottles of ale, sixteen dollars. Total, forty-three dollars. Flour in the mining camps cost four and even five dollars a pound, and eggs were two dollars apiece. A chicken brought sixteen dollars, a revolver one hundred and fifty dollars, a stove four hundred dollars. Laudanum was one dollar a drop, brandy twenty dollars a bottle and dried apples fluctuated from five cents to seventy-five cents a pound. It is a matter of history that a bilious miner once gave fifteen dollars for a small box of Seidlitz powders, and at the Stanislaus diggings, a jar of raisins, regarded as a cure for the scurvy then prevailing, sold for their weight in gold, amounting to four thousand dollars. As showing the dependence of California upon the East for supplies, it is significant that even so late as 1853, 6,000 tons of hard bread were imported annually from New York. Wages and prices were high, but nobody complained of them. There was, in fact, a disdain of all attempts to cheapen or haggle. Gold dust poured into San Francisco from the launches and schooners which plied on the Sacramento River, and almost everybody in California seemed to have it in plenty. Money, said a pioneer in a letter written at the end of 49, is about the most valueless article that a man can have in his possession here. As an illustration of the lavish manner in which business was transacted, it may be mentioned that the stamp box in the express office of Wells Fargo & Company was a sort of common treasury. Clerks, messengers, and drivers dipped into it for change whenever they wanted a lunch or a drink. There was nothing secret about this practice, and if not sanctioned, it was at least winked at by the superior officers. Huge lumps of gold were exhibited in hotels and gambling houses, and the jingling of coins rivaled the scraping of the fiddle as the characteristic music of San Francisco. The first deposit in the United States Mint of gold from California was made on December 8, 1848, and between that date and May 1, 1850, there were presented for coinage gold dust and nuggets valued at $11,420,000. A lot of land in San Francisco rose from $15 in price to $40,000. In September 1850, bricklayers receiving $12 a day struck for $14 and obtained the increase. The wages of carpenters varied from $12 to $20 a day. Those who did best in California were, as a rule, the small traders, the mechanics and skilled workmen, and the professional men who, by resisting the temptation to hunt for gold, made money by being useful to the community. It may truly be said, remarked the San Francisco Daily Herald in 1852, that California is the only spot in the world where labor is not only on an equality with capital, but to a certain extent is superior to it. Women cooks received $100 a month and chambermaids and nurses almost as much. A resident of San Francisco went to the mines for four weeks and came back with a bag of gold dust, which he thought would astonish his wife, who had remained in the city. But meanwhile, she had been taking in washing at the rate of $12 a dozen, and he was crestfallen to find that her gains were twice as much as his. It was cheaper to have one's clothes sent to China or the Sandwich Islands to be laundered, and some thrifty and patient persons took that course. A valuable trade sprang up between China and San Francisco. The solitude became a village, and the village a city, with startling rapidity. In less than a year, 12,000 people gathered at Sacramento, where there had not been a single soul. Events and changes followed one another so rapidly that each year formed an epoch by itself. In 1853, men spoke of 1849 as of a romantic and half-forgotten past. End of section 59
This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 60 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke the United States, Volume 2, Part 9 The Shadow of Civil War Historical Note These events, the Fugitive Slave Law, the John Brown Raid, etc., brought the agitation of the subject of slavery to its highest pitch during president buchanan's administration when the time drew near for the election of a new president the old parties were so broken up that there were four candidates in the field though mr buchanan himself was not one of these out of these four abraham lincoln of illinois was elected he having been nominated by the republican party this being an enlarged form of the free soil party which had itself succeeded the liberty party mr lincoln was a man of very moderate opinions in regard to slavery and was not disposed to interfere with it where it was already established by law but his election was regarded by many in the slave states as very dangerous to the interests of slavery and these men resolved to dissolve the union they maintained that the united states consisted of a co-partnership of entirely independent governments and that any state could withdraw from it at will this was the doctrine called state rights which had long been popular in the southern states and especially in south carolina it was therefore very natural that south carolina should take the lead in withdrawing from the union and a convention was accordingly called in that state and adopted december twenty eighteen sixty an ordinance of secession within six weeks similar conventions had been held and similar votes passed in the states of mississippi florida alabama georgia louisiana and texas these states then formed themselves into what was called the southern confederacy and elected jefferson davis of mississippi as president and alexander h stevens of georgia as vice president the new confederacy placed itself boldly upon the righteousness of slavery as a permanent institution and it openly aimed to establish a slave-holding nation in the southern states thomas wentworth higginson end of section sixty this recording is in the public domain Section 61 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61. The Broadcloth Mob of Boston, 1835. By Harriet Martineau. The author of this article was a well-known English woman who traveled in the United States in 1834. The Editor. The abolitionists were warned that if they met again publicly, they would be answerable for the disorders that might ensue. The abolitionists pleaded that this was like making the rich man answerable for the crime of the thief who robbed him, on the ground that if the honest man had not been so rich, the thief would not have been tempted to rob him. 
the abolitionists also perceived how liberty of opinion and of speech depended on their conduct in this crisis and they resolved to yield to no threats of illegal violence but to hold their legal meeting pursuant to advertisement for the dispatch of their usual business one remarkable feature of the case was that this heavy responsibility rested upon women it was a ladies meeting that was in question upon consultation the ladies agreed that they should never have sought the perilous duty of defending liberty of opinion and speech at the last crisis but as such a service seemed manifestly appointed to them the women were ready on the twenty first of october they met pursuant to advertisement at the office of their association number forty six washington street twenty five reached their room by going three quarters of an hour before the appointed time five more made their way up with difficulty through the crowd a hundred more were turned back by the mob they knew that a handbill had been circulated on the exchange and posted on the city hall and throughout the city the day before which declared that thompson the abolitionist was to address them and invited the citizens under promise of pecuniary reward to snake thompson out and bring him to the tar kettle before dark the ladies had been warned that they would be killed as sure as fate if they showed themselves on their own premises that day they therefore informed the mayor that they expected to be attacked the reply of the city marshal was you give us a great deal of trouble the committee room was surrounded and gazed into by a howling shrieking mob of gentlemen while the twenty-five ladies sat perfectly still awaiting the striking of the clock when it struck they opened their meeting they were questioned as to whether thompson were there in disguise to which they made no answer they began as usual with prayer the mob shouting hurrah here comes judge lynch before they had done the partition gave way and the gentlemen hurled missiles at the lady who was presiding the secretary having risen and begun to read her report rendered inaudible by the uproar the mayor entered and insisted upon their going home to save their lives the purpose of their meeting was answered they had asserted their principle and they now passed out two and two amidst the execration of some thousands of gentlemen persons who had silver shrines to protect the ladies to the number of fifty walked to the house of one of their members and were presently struck to the heart by the news that garrison was in the hands of the mob garrison is the chief apostle of abolition in the united states he had escorted his wife to the meeting and after offering to address the ladies and being refused out of regard to his safety had left the room and as they supposed the premises he was however in the house when the ladies left it he was hunted for by the mob dragged from behind some planks where he had taken refuge footnote garrison was determined to face the mob but was finally persuaded that he ought to avoid capture as long as possible and a footnote and conveyed into the street here his hat was trampled under foot and brickbats were aimed at his bare head a rope was tied round him and thus he was dragged through the streets his young wife saw all this her exclamation was i think my husband will not deny his principles her confidence was just garrison never denied his principles he was saved by a stout truckman who with his bludgeon made his way into the crowd as if to attack the victim he protected the bare head and pushed on toward a station house whence the mayor's office issued and pulled in garrison who was afterwards put into a coach the mob tried to upset the coach and throw down the horses but the driver laid about him with his whip and the constables with their staves and garrison was safely lodged in jail for protection for he had committed no offence before the mayor ascended the stairs to dismiss the ladies he had done a very remarkable deed he had given permission to two gentlemen 
to pull down and destroy the anti-slavery sign bearing the inscription anti-slavery office which had hung for two years as signs do hang before public offices in boston the plea of the mayor is that he hoped the rage of the mob would thus have appeased that is he gave them leave to break the laws in one way lest they should in another the citizens followed up this deed of the mayor with one no less remarkable they elected these two rioters members of the state legislature by a large majority within ten days i passed through the mob some time after it had begun to assemble i asked my fellow passengers in the stage what it meant they supposed it was a busy foreign post day and that this occasioned an assemblage of gentlemen about the post office they pointed out to me that there were none but gentlemen we were passing through from salem fifteen miles north of boston to providence rhode island and were therefore uninformed of the events and expectations of the day on the morrow a visitor who arrived at providence from boston told us the story and i had thenceforth an excellent opportunity of hearing all the remarks that could be made by persons of all ways of thinking and feeling on this affair it excited much less attention than it deserved less than would be believed possible by those at a distance who think more seriously of persecution for opinion and less tenderly of slavery than a great many of the citizens of boston to many in the city of boston the story i have told would be news and to yet more in the country who know that some trouble was caused by abolition meetings in the city but who are not aware that their own will embodied in the laws was overborne to gratify the mercenary interests of a few and the political fears of a few more the first person with whom i conversed about this riot was the president of a university we were perfectly agreed as to the causes and character of the outrage this gentleman went over to boston for a day or two and when he returned i saw him again he said he was happy to tell me that we had been needlessly making ourselves uneasy about the affair that there had been no mob the persons assembled having been all gentlemen an eminent lawyer of boston was one of the next to speak upon it oh there was no mob he said he i was there myself and saw they were all gentlemen they were all in fine broadcloth not the less a mob for that said i why they protected garrison he received no harm they protected garrison from whom or what oh they would not really hurt him they only wanted to show that they would not have such a person live among them why should he not live among them is he guilty under any law he is an insufferable person to them so you may be to-morrow if you can catch garrison breaking the laws punish him under the laws if you cannot he has as much right to live where he pleases as you two law pupils of this gentleman presently entered one approved of all that had been done and praised the spirit of the gentleman in boston i asked whether they had not broken the law yes i asked him if he knew what the law was yes but it could not be always kept if a man was caught in a house setting it on fire the owner might shoot him and garrison was such an incendiary i asked him for proof he had nothing but hearsay to give the case as i told him came to this a says garrison is an incendiary b says he is not a proceeds on his own opinion to break the law lest garrison should do so the other pupil told me of the sorrow of heart with which he saw the law the life of the republic set at naught by those who should best understand its nature and value he saw that the time was come for the true men of the republic to oppose a bold front to the insolence of the rich and the powerful who were bearing down the liberties of the people for a matter of opinion the young men he saw must brace themselves up against the tyranny of the moneyed mob and defend the law or the liberties of the country were gone i afterwards found many such among the young men of the wealthier classes 
if they keep their convictions they and their city are safe no prosecutions followed i asked a lawyer an abolitionist why he said there would be difficulty in getting a verdict and if it was obtained the punishment would be merely a fine which would be paid on the spot and the triumph would remain with the aggressors this seemed to me no good reason i asked an eminent judge the same question and whether there was not a public prosecutor who might prosecute for breach of the peace if the abolitionists would not for the assault on garrison he said it might be done but he had given his advice against it why the feeling was so strong against the abolitionists the rioters were so respectable in the city it was better to let the whole affair pass over without notice end of section sixty one this recording is in the public domain section sixty two of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section sixty two on the underground railway about eighteen fifty eight by francis grierson the following selections are from the boyhood recollections of a famous english author and musician who was brought up on the illinois prairie underground railway was a name given to the secret arrangement by which escaped slaves were taken from one anti-slavery man to another until they reached canada or some other place of safety and freedom the editor on certain evenings my father would sit before the big open fireplace and watch with unalloyed satisfaction the burning logs he would see pictures in the blazing wood and he had a science of his own in the mingling of different logs how well that dried hickory burns with the damp walnut he would say taking the tongs and shifting the pieces now a little more to the front now a little farther back he taught me to see castles people and faces in the flames and embers and i knew what colors to expect from the different woods he kept some that were full of sap that would burn slowly others were split up to dry while sitting before the fire on a clear bracing night my father was wont to forget every care and abandon himself to the pure pleasures of the heart he would dream of the past of friends in the old country and more than once he would remark to me taking the tongs and pointing there's a face that reminds me of poor so and so he loved to revisit the old familiar scenes while the fire gave them momentary life and set them before him in frames of gold and flaming opal then he would tell me stories of the wild animals of the old homestead of the tracks of the marten in the snow and how he discovered its hiding place of a memorable fox hunt when one of his friends held the fox up by the tail and another friend cried out from a distance don't hurt the fox don't hurt the fox and of his sojourn in paris during the reign of louis philippe at such times my mother added a spirit of cheerfulness by some joyful exclamation such as there's a letter in the candle as if the simple expression in itself would assist the arrival of good news from afar and when i looked i saw a large flaming blot on the side of the wick pointing toward us i cannot remember whether the letters arrived as the candle so often announced but how vividly i recollect the night when i lay awake in the next room and heard my parents discuss the uncertainty of the future the imminent need of funds to carry on the work of the farm and the possibility of failure and ruin such conversations occurred after the other members of the family had gone to bed but i heard everything 
and night after night i listened to those talks and racked my brain wondering how it would all end my distress was even greater than that of my mother for she knew what i did not and she could still hope after such talks the quivering song of the cricket dotted the stillness with an accent of deeper melancholy while the heavy pendulum slowly measured out the minutes between midnight and the dismal twilight of dawn we were all sitting quietly together the evening after my visit to the load bearer's home my mother with the bible in her lap the only book she ever read while in the log house my father reading a newspaper containing an account of a recent speech by abraham lincoln my mother's face looked paler and more pensive than usual for some days previous to this my father had had a misunderstanding with one of the settlers the only weapon in the house was a double-barrelled gun and even this stood unloaded against the wall in a corner of the sitting-room no dog was kept on the place for the reason that a dog was regarded as one of the things most likely to cause trouble with the neighbours the wind was blowing across the prairie from the east my mother seemed apprehensive and i must have caught some of the thoughts which filled her mind with gloomy presentiments during a lull of the wind a sound reached us from the prairies it might have been a shout or a call how vividly it all comes before me now she looked inquiringly at my father who was absorbed in his newspaper and heard nothing i needed no words to tell me what she was thinking her face assumed a grave and anxious look i was hoping the sound might be nothing more than the noise of belated travellers passing on horseback when we heard it again like a confused mumbling menace this time a little nearer still disguised in the muffled wind she walked into the next room greatly agitated but instantly returned and began to read in the prayer-book my father had just put aside his newspaper when a low hollow murmur came from the prairie what can it be asked my mother in a voice scarcely audible without answering he went into the next room for the ammunition took the gun from the corner and began to load with buckshot it seemed to me he had never looked so tall so grim so determined as when he rammed the wadding down with the ramrod then he went to the front door and listened my mother sat with closed eyes like one in a trance until it seemed to me as if by some unaccountable hocus-pocus we had been thrust into a world where pantomime and mystery had taken the place of speech and we were waiting for some sudden and terrible stroke of destiny what was going to happen was it the end of all things at the log house my father decided not to go out by the front way and after the light was removed he opened the kitchen door and stood outside in the dark the moon is just rising said my mother in a half whisper looking through the window of the front room then i looked and as the clouds drifted by i saw the moon in the shape of a gleaming scythe a sudden chill of autumn had come to the house she hurried out to beg my father to come in but he was creeping from corner to corner and from tree to tree with the gun held before him cocked and ready for that deadly aim for which he was so well known after going as far as the smoke-house and waiting there some time he returned he thought the sounds must have been due to some prowling animal he was about to give up further search when the moaning was again heard out a little beyond the trees and then as my mother stood trembling at the door a voice shouted don't shoot massa don't shoot for de lord's sake don't ye shoot my father went straight toward the voice we done lost massa someone shouted as soon as he reached the open we is lookin for massa guest's place come in come in my father came back into the kitchen with two negro fugitives where have you been mass snedecker dun drap us ober dere said one of the negroes pointing west he was running you off yes massa and finding he was chased let you down and so you got lost yes massa just then a loud knocking at the front door came with terrible suddenness 
for during the talk and confusion no one had heard any noise in the road my father took his gun and standing at one side of the door asked who was there isaac snedeker answered a familiar voice open went the door and in rushed ike snedeker one of the most intrepid souls that ever risked death for the sake of conscience a man stood before us who had never known fear one glance at his face would be enough to make an enemy stop and think twice before coming to close quarters with such a being he was courage incarnate with the shaggy head of a lion the sharp invisible eye of an eagle the frame of an athlete the earnestness of a convinced reformer his hair stood out thick and bushy and his bearded face with the upper lip clean-shaven gave to the whole countenance a massive formidable look that inspired every fugitive with confidence and struck fear into the hearts of his secret foes i've lost two runaways he said as he walked through to the kitchen had to let them out of the wagon over there near the maple grove we were followed i think they are here said my father and i came near shooting one of them by mistake i directed them to come this way as near as i could hoping they would strike through the prairie at this place my mother was now bringing the fugitive something to eat when isaac snedeker said peremptorily come along it's now or never we've got to get to brother guests with that load before midnight you see i've had to gather em up here and there in different places and i have in the wagon out there two lots one sent over by ebenezer carter and the other by brother wolcott if we get caught it'll be the first time but they'd get a haul that would amount to something i've got fourteen altogether the two fugitives left without having time to drink a cup of coffee and we all went to the road to see them off the wagon was full of frightened trembling runaways negroes mulattoes octoroons not a moment was lost isaac snedeker had only to speak to his horses a fine powerful team to send them going at a great speed down the road toward the appointed meeting-place at elihu guests we went back into the house where my mother sank exhausted into a rocking-chair but she had still another ordeal to go through prayers had been said and we were all about to retire for the night when the noise of galloping horses and men talking could be heard in the road one moment of suspense followed another footsteps were heard near the kitchen door then there came a light and somewhat timid rapping as if the persons outside were not certain about this being the right place my father opened this time without asking who was there two disreputable-looking men stood before him one of them scowling at us through the door like some ferocious animal they carried pistols and dirks their eyes were shaded by slouched hats that partly concealed the upper part of their faces so that for all we knew they might have been neighbors living at no great distance from the log house have ye seen any runaways hangin round hya asked the elder man looking up from under his hat and with an expression that told of a fearful admixture of malicious cunning and moral cowardice i have answered my father who delegated you to look for them the fellow hesitated then he stammered be you a fire-eating abolitionist i have voted for abraham lincoln once if that is what you mean by being an abolitionist ye ain't been long in this country observed the younger man long enough to become an american citizen and vote this surprised them they looked confused but they braced themselves for a final effort we're arter them runaways and we don't calculate to leave hya without taking em all along they went from here some time ago so you'll have to look elsewhere if you want to find them let's go over to the barn said the elder of the two they started for the barn but stopped just beyond the big locust tree and i heard the words say jake i don't like the look of that old britisher no more do i he'll shoot the fust thing we know he's got something mighty juberous in that eye o hisn not another word was said they wheeled about made for the road mounted their horses and were off they had been cowed and disarmed by my father's coolness his independence by his towering height and a scorn that was withering 
to the two slave hunting villains end of section sixty two this recording is in the public domain section sixty three of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section sixty three the great lincoln douglas debate eighteen fifty eight by francis grierson it was the fifteenth day of october eighteen fifty eight crowds were pouring into alton for some days people had been arriving by the steam packets from up and down the river the upboats from st louis bringing visitors with long black hair goatees and stolid indian-like faces slave owners and slave dealers from the human marts of missouri and kentucky the northern visitors arriving by boat or rail abolitionists and republicans with a cast of features distinctly different from the types coming from the south they came from villages townships the prairies from all the adjoining counties from across the mississippi from faraway cities from representative societies north and south from congressional committees in the east from leading journals of all political parties and from every religious denomination within hundreds of miles filling the broad space in front of the town hall eager to see and hear the now famous debaters the popular stephen a douglas united states senator nicknamed the little giant and plain abraham lincoln nicknamed the rail splitter the great debate had begun on the twenty first of august at another town and today the long discussed subject would be brought to a close douglas stood for the doctrine that slavery was nationalized by the constitution that congress had no power to prevent its introduction in the new territories like kansas and nebraska and that the people of each state could alone decide whether they should be slave states or free lincoln opposed the introduction of slavery into the new territories on this memorable day the irrepressible conflict predicted by seward actually began and it was brooded about that lincoln would be mobbed or assassinated if he repeated here the words he used in some of his speeches delivered in the northern part of the state from the surging sea of faces thousands of anxious eyes gazed upward at the group of politicians on the balcony like wrecked mariners scanning the horizon for the smallest sign of a white sail of hope the final debate resembled a duel between two men of war the pick of a great fleet all but those two sunk or abandoned in other waters facing each other in the open the little giant hurling at his opponent from his flagship of slavery the deadliest missiles lincoln calmly waiting to sink his antagonist by one simple broadside alton had seen nothing so exciting since the assassination of lovejoy the fearless abolitionist many years before in the earlier discussions douglas seemed to have the advantage a past master in tact and audacity skilled in the art of rhetorical skirmishing he had no equal on the stump while in the senate he was feared by the most brilliant debaters for his ready wit and his dashing eloquence regarded in the light of historical experience reasoned about in the light of spiritual reality and from the point of view that nothing can happen by chance it seemed as if lincoln and douglas were predestined to meet side by side in this discussion and unless i dwell in detail on the mental and physical contrast the speakers presented it would be impossible to give an adequate idea of the startling differences in the two temperaments douglas short plump and petulant lincoln long gaunt and self-possessed the one white-haired and florid the other black-haired and swarthy the one educated and polished the other unlettered and primitive douglas had the assurance of a man of authority lincoln had moments of deep mental depression often bordering on melancholy yet controlled by a fixed and i may say predestined will for it can no longer be doubted that without the marvellous blend of humour and stolid patience so conspicuous in his character lincoln's genius would have turned to madness after the defeat of the northern army at bull run and the world would have had something like a repetition of napoleon's fate after the burning of moscow lincoln's humour was the balance pole of his genius that enabled him to cross the most giddy heights without losing his head judge douglas opened the debate in a sonorous voice plainly heard throughout the assembly and with a look of mingled defiance and confidence he marshalled his facts and deduced his arguments to the vigour of his attack there was added the prestige of the senate chamber and for some moments it looked as if he would carry the majority with him a large portion of the crowd being pro-slavery men 
while many others were on the fence waiting to be persuaded. At last, after a great oratorical effort, he brought his speech to a close amidst the shouts and yells of thousands of admirers. And now, Abraham Lincoln, the man who, in 1830, undertook to split from Mrs. Nancy Miller 400 rails for every yard of brown jeans dyed with walnut bark that would be required to make him a pair of trousers, the flat boatman, local stump speaker, and country lawyer rose from his seat, stretched his long bony limbs upward as if to get them into working order, and stood like some solitary giant on a lonely summit, very tall, very dark, very gaunt, and very rugged, his swarthy features stamped with a sad serenity, and the instant he began to speak, the ungainly mouth lost its heaviness, the half-listless eyes attained a wondrous power, and the people stood bewildered and breathless under the natural magic of the strangest, most original personality known to the English-speaking world since Robert Burns. There were other very tall and dark men in the heterogeneous assembly, but not one who resembled the speaker. Every movement of his long muscular frame denoted inflexible earnestness, and a something issued forth, elemental and mystical, that told what the man had been, what he was, and what he would do in the future. There were moments when he seemed all legs and feet, and again he appeared all head and neck. Yet every look of the deep-set eyes, every movement of the prominent jaw, every wave of the hard-gripping hand, produced an impression, and before he had spoken twenty minutes, the conviction took possession of thousands that here was the prophetic man of the present and the political savior of the future. Judges of human nature saw at a glance that a man so ungainly, so natural, so earnest, and so forcible had no place in his mental economy for the thing called vanity. Douglas had been theatrical and scholarly, but this tall, homely man was creating by his very looks what the brilliant lawyer and experienced senator had failed to make people see and feel. The little giant had assumed striking attitudes, played tricks with his flowing white hair, mimicking the airs of authority with patronizing allusions, but these affectations, usually so effective when he addressed an audience alone, went for nothing when brought face to face with realities. Lincoln had no genius for gesture and no desire to produce a sensation. The failure of Senator Douglas to bring conviction to critical minds was caused by three things, a lack of logical sequence in argument, a lack of intuitional judgment, and a vanity that was caused by too much intellect and too little heart. Douglas had been arrogant and vehement. Lincoln was now logical and penetrating. The little giant was a living picture of ostentatious vanity. From every feature of Lincoln's face there radiated the calm, inherent strength that always accompanies power. He relied on no props. With a pride sufficient to protect his mind and a will sufficient to defend his body, he drank water when Douglas, with all his wit and rhetoric, could begin or end nothing without stimulants. Here, then, was one man out of all the millions who believed in himself, who did not consult with others about what to say, who never for a moment respected the opinion of men who preached a lie. My old friend, Don Piatt, in his personal impressions of Lincoln, whom he knew well and greatly esteemed, declares him to be the homeliest man he ever saw. But serene confidence and self-poise can never be ugly. What thrilled the people who stood before Abraham Lincoln on that day was the sight of a being who, in all his actions and habits, resembled themselves, gentle as he was strong, fearless as he was honest, who towered above them all in that psychic radiance that penetrates in some mysterious way every fiber of the hearer's consciousness. The enthusiasm created by Douglas was wrought out of smart epigram thrusts and a facile superficial eloquence. He was a match for the politicians born within the confines of his own intellectual circle. Witty, brilliant, cunning, and shallow. His weight in the political balance was purely materialistic. His scales of justice tipped to the side of cotton, slavery, and popular passions. While the man who faced him now brought to the assembly cold logic in place of wit, frankness in place of cunning, reasoned will and judgment in place of chicanery and sophistry. Lincoln's presence infused into the mixed and uncertain throng something spiritual and supernormal. His looks, his words, his voice, his attitude were like a magical essence dropped into the seething cauldron of politics, reacting against the foam, calming the surface, and letting the people see to the bottom. It did not take him long. Is it not a false statementship, he asked that undertakes to build up a system of policy upon the basis of caring nothing about the very thing that everybody does care the most about? Judge Douglas may say he cares not whether slavery is voted up or down, but he must have a choice between a right thing and a wrong thing. 
He contends that whatever community wants slaves has a right to have them. So they have, if it is not a wrong. But if it is a wrong, he cannot say people have a right to do wrong. He says that upon the score of equality, slaves should be allowed to go into a new territory like other property. This is strictly logical if there is no difference between it and other property. If it and other property are equal, his argument is entirely logical. But if you insist that one is wrong and the other right, there is no use to institute a comparison between right and wrong. This was the broadside. The great duel on the high seas of politics was over. The Douglas ship of state sovereignty was sinking. The debate was a triumph that would send Lincoln to Washington as president in a little more than two years from that date. People were fascinated by the gaunt figure in long, loose garments that seemed like a huge skeleton in clothes, attracted by the homely face, and mystified yet proud of the fact that a simple denizen of their own soil should wield so much power. When Lincoln sat down, Douglas made one last feeble attempt at an answer. But Lincoln, in reply to a spectator who manifested some apprehension as to the outcome, rose and, spreading out his great arms at full length, like a condor about to take wing, exclaimed, with humorous indifference, Oh, let him go it! These were the last words he uttered in the greatest debate of the antebellum days. The victor bundled up his papers and withdrew, the assembly shouting, Hurrah for Abe Lincoln as next president! Bully for old Abe! Lincoln forever! Excited crowds followed him about. Reporters caught his slightest word, and by nighttime, the barrooms, hotels, street corners, and prominent stores were filled with his admirers, fairly intoxicated with the exciting triumph of the day. End of section 63. Section 64 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Okite, Rockford, Illinois. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 64, Just Before the War, 1858, by Morris Schaff. Sometime during the winter of 1857-58, to 58, I received from the Honorable Samuel S. Cox, member of Congress from Ohio, representing the district composed of Licking, Franklin, and Pickaway, an appointment as cadet at West Point. I know it was wintertime, for across the vanished years I can see the family gathered before the big wood fire, and I can see my father, who had been to Newark and had stopped at the Kirkersville post office, coming in clad in his greatcoat and bearing in his hand a large and significant-looking official letter. Removing his coat and adjusting his glasses, he opened the communication from Washington and read my appointment. Oh, the quiet radiance of my mother's face. Never, I think, did the fire burn so cheerily as ours burnt that night. And somehow, I am fain to believe, the curling smoke communicated the news to the old farm. For the fields, how often I had wandered over them from childhood. Oh, yes, how often I had seen the cattle grazing, the corn tasseling, and their sweet pomp of daisies and clover, and shocks of ripened wheat, all seemed to greet me the next morning as I walked out to feed the sheep. We sat long round the fire, and read and reread the entrance requirements, both physical and mental, as set forth in the circular accompanying the appointment. This circular, prepared by Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, himself a graduate of West Point, announced that only about a third of all who entered were graduated, and counseled the appointee that unless he had an aptitude for mathematics, etc., it might be better for him not to accept the appointments. Thus he would escape the mortification of failure for himself and family. In view my lack of opportunity to acquire more than the simplest rudiments of an education in any branch, I wonder now that I dared to face the ordeal. But how the future gleams through the gates of youth. It was in the days before competitive examinations, when appointments to West Point and Annapolis were coveted and usually secured 
by the sons of leaders of business, political influence, and social standing, and ours was the capital district. At that time our country differed widely from that in which we are now living, and so great have been the changes that, could the leading merchants of our cities of fifty years ago, or the farmers who settled amid the primeval timber of the West, return, they could not distinguish one street from another, and would look in vain for the fields and woods that met their eyes from the doorstep. The population of the country, now rising eighty millions, was less than thirty-two millions, not counting the territories, and of these, nineteen millions were in the northern or free states, and twelve in the southern or slave states. The frontier was along the western boundary of Arkansas, and thence north to the Canadian line. The great tide of emigration that set in with the building of the National Road was still flowing west. While the railroads and telegraph were just beginning to push their way thither, steamboats, called floating palaces, could be seen at almost every bend of the beautiful Ohio, and on every long reach of the solemnly impressive Mississippi. Practically all the vast area lying west of the Hudson was devoted to agriculture, while the South, as from the early days, was still raising cotton and tobacco and finding itself year after year dropping farther and farther behind the more progressive north in commercial weight and importance. But there were no great fortunes at that time, either north or south. It is safe to say that there were not throughout the land a score of men worth a million dollars. If an estate amounted to fifty thousand dollars, it was considered large. And yet under those conditions there were refinement, courage, good manners, and wide knowledge qualities that went to the making of gentlemen. Colleges, called universities, were springing up everywhere over the land. Irving, Poe, Hawthorne, and Bancroft, Longfellow, Cooper, Whittier, and Emerson had laid the foundations for our literature. In public life, the foremost statesmen of the time were Benton, Cass, Corwin, Cox, Douglas, Chase, Wade, and Giddings in the West, Seward, Hale, Banks, Sumner, and Adams in the East. While the South counted among its leaders such men as Jefferson Davis and Quitman of Mississippi, Alexander H. Stevens in Tombs of Georgia, and Hunter and Mason of Virginia. Besides these, there were Breckinridge and Crittenden of Kentucky, Benjamin and Slidell of Louisiana, Wigfall of Texas, and Yancey of Alabama. Not to mention a group of arrogant and almost frenzied agitators for secession, who seemed to rise right up from the ground that was thrown out when Calhoun's grave was dug, and to whom may be attributed in great measure the dire adversity of our Southland. The war with Mexico was still fresh in the memories of the people, and the majority of the officers who had gained distinction in it were still living and also veterans here and there of the War of 1812. And to emphasize the march of time, I may say that a frequent visitor at my father's house was a French veteran by the name of Genet, who had actually fought under Napoleon at Waterloo. Save with Mexico, our country had been at peace with all of the world for nearly fifty years. Its future, save as shadowed by slavery, glowed warmly, and pride and love for it burned in every heart. The army consisted of 16,435 officers and men. Its organization was made up of engineers, topographical engineers, ordnance, supply departments, artillery, cavalry, dragoons, and mounted rifles. The heaviest guns in the forts were 10-inch columbiads, and the small arms were all muzzle-loading smoothbores and rifles. Grant in utter obscurity and almost utter poverty, and fronting an outlook of utter hopelessness, was a clerk in a store at Galena. Farragut was sailing the seas, and not dreaming of the days to come, when, lashed to the rigging, he would lead his squadron into the Battle of Mobile Bay. Lee was commanding a post in Texas, and probably had never heard of the little town of Gettysburg. Cedric and Thomas and Jeb Stewart were all on the Texas frontier. 
and the future seemed to offer only a slow chance for promotion. And yet, in less than five years, they had risen to enduring frame. Stonewall Jackson was an instructor at the Virginia Military Institute, the West Point of the South. But he was dwelling more on the sins of this earth than on its honors, either military or civil, and was regarded by his intimates as a queer and uninteresting type of belated roundhead. Within five years he was to rise to the pinnacle of fame, his star to the country's zenith. Sherman was teaching in Louisiana, little dreaming that he should one day lead a victorious army from Atlanta to the sea. Longstreet, the Johnstons, the Hills, Hooker, Bragg, and Forrest, the latter a slave dealer, but the ablest cavalry leader in the Confederacy, and many another in the blue and the gray, unknown outside of local and professional associations, rose on the stormy tides of the mighty rebellion. Of these, Reynolds, who fell at Gettysburg, Webb, Warren, McCook, Howard, Griffin, Schofield, Hartsuff, Saxon, Weitzel, and Hazen of the Union, Hardy, Beauregard, Fitzley, Alexander, and Field of the Confederate Army, were on duty as officers at West Point. In the Corps as cadets were Wilson, Upton, Harding, Horace Porter, Merritt, Custer, and Mackenzie of the North, while bound in ties of friendship with them were Ramsour, Wheeler, Rosser, Pelham, Young, Semmix, and Deering of the South. Whenever and wherever I have thought of them, as officers or cadets, and it has been many and many a time, imagination has painted them marching unconsciously to the field of the high test of the soldier and the gentleman. The war between the states was gathering much faster than we realized. Every little while, as from a cloud, sounded low and heavy rumblings, but like distant thunder in the summer they died away and notwithstanding they came again heavier and at shorter intervals, hopes of peace like birds in the fields sang on. Everywhere there was a growing fever in the blood. The progress of events in the seventy-five years during which they had been bound together in the Constitution had forced freedom and slavery, so mutually and innately antagonistic, nearer and nearer to each other. The closer the approach, Slavery on the one hand saw herself growing more and more repulsive, while on the other the South, with increasing anger and alarm, saw in the cold look of the self-controlled North that her happiness, prosperity, social fabric, and political supremacy were threatened, if not doomed. In the Ordinance of 1787, she had seen herself excluded from all the territory north of the Ohio. In 1820, forever prohibited in all the territory ceded by France and known as Louisiana, north of 36 degrees 30 minutes. In 1846, excluded from all the territory purchased from Mexico. In 1850, California admitted as a free state, and the slave trade abolished in the District of Columbia. In 1854, slavery was expelled from the territory of Kansas, the blood of northern men dripping from its hands after a savage and brutal contest with freedom. During this process of being hemmed in, the South became more and more irritable, and unfortunately, more domineering. Naturally enough, the social, idealistic, and temperamental differences elementary in the natures and traditions of the people grew apace. We in the West, especially those of us with Southern affiliations, hated slavery, and hated New England, but generally sympathized with the South. Yet in her arrogance she fast assumed an attitude of condescension and superiority over us all. Meanwhile, the abolitionist, despised on all hands, had begun the most systematic, deliberate, and stubborn crusade that was ever waged against an institution. And this crusade was carried on until, at last, the harassed South demanded and Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law. It was a law hateful in every feature, arousing the indignation of every natural impulse, 
and humiliating to the self-respect of every official called on for its execution. Then Uncle Tom's cabin appeared. From door to door it went, and slavery heard its knell from every hearthstone before which it was read. From that time, an open hostility to the institution was in the plank of every northern platform, and constantly engaged benevolent and religious associations in earnest discussion. There was no respite, day or night, thenceforward, for the great body of the people, who, standing between the fire-eaters on the one hand and the abolitionists on the other, were ready and longing to do anything for the peace, glory, and welfare of the South, as well as the North. As early as 1850, South Carolina and Mississippi, in their provincial egotism, had threatened secession, declaring in a bullying way that they would not submit to degradation in the Union, referring to the barricades that people of the free states had thrown up against the extension of the institution of slavery. Meanwhile, Sumner, with manners more imperious and egotism more colossal than the southern states had ever exhibited, assailed slavery and, indirectly, the representatives of the South in Congress, with a kind of dogmatic statesmanship and scholastic venom, the latter intended to irritate and succeeding in its purpose, roared out in pompous and reverberating declamation. The effect of these deplorable extremes was to weaken the natural ties that bound the sections, to drive out friendship and goodwill from many a home, and to substitute in their places deep and dangerous ill feelings. Now, as I look back over it all, never, it seems to me, did provincial egotism born of slavery and bigotry born of political and moral dogma pursue their ways more blindly to the frightful wastes of blood and treasure. But let this question rest. The fire-eater is gone, and the abolitionist is gone. Were they to come back, the surprise of both of them at the results would be astounding. However that may be, in due time an idea took possession of the North, as if it had seen a vision. The Democratic Party began to break before it, and the Republican Party sprang up from Maine to California with almost the speed of a phantom. When I finally left home for West Point, James Buchanan was president, and drifting into a deeper eclipse than has befallen any other who has filled that high office. Abraham Lincoln was still unknown beyond his prairies of central Illinois. End of section 64 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Okite, Rockford, Illinois. Section 65 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Last Moment of John Brown by Thomas Hovenden, born in Ireland, 1810, died in America in 1895. Painting, page 290. According to the Compromise of 1850, it was agreed that when Kansas and Nebraska should be ready to enter the Union as states, they might be either free or slaveholding, as their inhabitants should prefer. Both pro-slavery and anti-slavery men pressed into Kansas, and what was really war on a small scale raged between them. One of the fiercest of the anti-slavery fighters was John Brown, whose one aim was, as he said, to wage eternal war with slavery. This was in 1856. Three years later he formed a plan to free the slaves. He thought that if some place in the mountains could be fortified, large numbers of slaves would escape to it, and a general revolt would result. He rented a farmhouse six miles from Harper's Ferry. To get arms, he, with twenty followers, seized the United States arsenal at that place and took some forty prisoners. On the following day he was captured by troops under Robert E. Lee after a fight in which two of his sons and nearly all of his men were killed and he himself was several times wounded. Governor Wise of Virginia, under whom he was tried for treason, said of Brown, he inspired me with great trust in his integrity as a man of truth. He was hanged, but manifested, even on the scaffold, the utmost calmness and fortitude. It is said that on the way to the place of execution, he paused a moment to kiss the little child of a slave mother. End of section 65. This recording is in the public domain.
section sixty six of the united states read for librivox dot org by jim locke the united states volume two part ten from fort sumter to chancellorsville historical note on april twelfth eighteen sixty one the confederate batteries opened fire on fort sumter in charleston harbor the civil war had begun armies were promptly raised by the united states and by the confederacy and richmond was chosen as the confederate capital little heavy fighting was done during the first year of the war except at bull run where the confederates won a decisive victory in eighteen sixty two affairs in the west were generally favorable to the unionists by the capture of forts henry and donaldson the greater part of tennessee was wrested from the confederates and by grant's victory at shiloh their second line of defense in the west was broken to gain control of the mississippi was an important matter to the union for this would separate the confederacy into two parts and would also make it easy to transport men and supplies from the north the first step was to capture new orleans if possible and this was accomplished by farragut soon after the confederate river fleet was destroyed at memphis and as far south as vicksburg the mississippi was controlled by the unionists new orleans was also as has been said in their hands and a strict blockade was established along the whole southern coast even more important than these successes was the victory of the monitor over the merrimac a victory that preserved the naval supremacy of the north and revolutionized naval warfare in the east the advantage was with the confederates in the peninsula campaign general mcclellan's advance toward richmond was thrust back with heavy loss and general lee who was now in command of the confederate army pushed forward into maryland but was defeated at antietam and withdrew into virginia a few days later lincoln issued his emancipation proclamation declaring that on the first of january eighteen sixty three all slaves in the rebellious states should be free on december thirteenth burnside who replaced mcclellan endeavored to force the confederate lines at fredericksburg but was driven back with great loss and was superseded by general hooker end of section sixty six this recording is in the public domain section sixty seven of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by sawyer ruiz the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by ava march tappan section sixty seven the bombardment of fort sumter eighteen sixty one by orville j victor punctually at the hour indicated twenty minutes past four a m the roar of a mortar from sullivan's island announced the war begun a second bomb from the same battery followed then fort moultrie answered with the thunder of a columbade cummings point next and the floating battery dropped in their resonant notes then a pause but only for a moment a roar of fifty guns burst in concert chorus up to the solemn prelude which must have startled the spirits of the patriotic dead in their slumbers sumter lay off in the waters the center of that appalling circle of fire the early morning shadows had lifted from its ramparts to discover the stars and stripes floating from the garrison staff 
but it was as silent amid that storm as if no living soul panted and fretted within its walls. It was the silence of duty, of men resolved on death if their country called for the sacrifice. For months the little garrison had been pent up in the fortress, overworked and underfed, but not a murmur escaped the men, and the hour of assault found all prepared for their leader's orders, to defend the fort to the last. The sentinels were removed from the parapet, posterns closed, and the order given for the men to keep close within the casements until the call of the drum. Breakfast was quietly served at six o'clock, the shot and shell of the enemy thundering against the walls and pouring within the enclosure with remarkable precision. After breakfast, disposition was calmly made for the day's work. The casements were supplied from the magazines, the guns, without tangents or scales, and even destitute of bearing screws, were to be ranged by the eye and fired by guess. The little force was told off in relays, composed of three reliefs, equally dividing the officers and men. Captain Doubleday took the first detachment and fired the first gun at seven o'clock. The captain directed his guns at Moultrie, at the Cummings Point Iron Battery, the floating ironclad battery anchored off the end of Sullivan's Island, and the infielding battery on Sullivan's Island, all of which were then pouring in a scathing storm of solid shot. An officer who was present thus spoke of the bombarding, the explosion of shells, and the quantity of deadly missiles that were hurled in every direction and at every instant of time made it almost certain death to go out of the lower tier of casements, and also made the working of the barbet or upper uncovered guns, which contained all of our heaviest metals, and by which alone we could throw shells quite impossible. During the first day, there was hardly an instant of time that there was a cessation of the whizzing of balls, which were sometimes coming at half a dozen at once. There was not a portion of the work which was not seen in reverse, that is, exposed by the rear, from mortars. At noon, Friday, the supply of cartridges in the front was exhausted when the blankets of the barracks and the shirts of the men were sewed into the required bags and served out. No instrument was in the fort for weighing the powder, thus forbidding all precision in the charge and, as a consequence, causing much variation in planting the shot. When we add that the guns wanted both tangents, breech, or telescopic sights, that wedges served instead of bearing screws, we can only express astonishment at the accuracy attained. Not a structure of the enemy escaped the solid balls of the columbades and faxons. The village of Moultrieville, a gathering of summer houses belonging to citizens of Charleston, was completely riddled. Saturday morning, at the earliest light, the cannonading was resumed with redoubled fury. By eight o'clock, the red-hot balls from the furnace in Moultrie came to prove that the revolutionists would use every means to dislodge the obstinate Anderson. Soon, the barracks and quarters were in flames, past all control. The men were then withdrawn from the guns to avert their now impending danger to the magazine. The powder must be emptied into the sea. Ninety barrels were rolled over the area exposed to the flames and pitched into the water. By this time, the heat from the burning buildings became intense, fairly shifting the men with its dense fumes. The doors of the vault were therefore sealed while the men crept into the casements to avoid suffocation by cowering close to the floor, covering their faces with wet cloths. An occasional gun could only be fired as a signal to the enemy and the fleet outside that the fort had not surrendered. With the color still floating from the staff, the winds bore the smoke and flames aside, its fold revealed to the enemy the glorious stars and stripes, waving there amid the ruin and treble terror unscathed. Its halyards had been shot away, but becoming entangled, the flag was fixed. Only the destruction of the staff could drag it down. This appalling conflagration seemed to inflame the zeal of the assailant. The entire circle of attack blazoned with fire, and the air was cut into hissing arches of smoke and balls. The rebel general in command has stated that two hours probably would suffice to reduce the fortress, but twenty-eight hours had not accomplished the work. And now, as the besiegers beheld another and more invincible power coming to their aid, they acknowledged the service rendered by frenzied shouts and redoubled service at their guns. About noon of Saturday, the upper service magazine exploded, tearing away the tower and upper portions of the fort, and doing more havoc than a week's bombardment could have effected. One who was present wrote, The crash of the beams, the roar of the flames, the rapid explosion of shells, and the shower fragments of the fort, with the blackness of the smoke, made the scene indescribably terrific and grand. This continued for several hours. Meanwhile, the main gates were burned down, the chassis of the barbet guns were burned away on the gorge, and the upper portions of the towers had been demolished by shells. There was not a portion of the fort where a breath of air could be got for hours, except through a wet cloth. The fire spread to the men's quarters on the right hand and on the left, and endangering the powder which had been taken out of the magazines. The men went through the fire and covered the barrels with wet cloths, but the danger of the forts blowing up became so imminent that they were obliged to heave the barrels out of the embrasures. While the powder was being thrown overboard, all the guns of Moultrie, 
of the iron floating battery and of the infielding battery and the Dahlgren battery worked with increased vigor. All but four barrels were thus disposed of, and those remaining were wrapped in many thicknesses of wet wool and blankets. But three cartridges were left, and these were in the guns. About this time, the flagstaff of Fort Sumter was shot down some fifty feet from the truck, this being the ninth time it had been struck by a shot. The men cried out, The flag is down, it has been shot away. In an instant, Lieutenant Hall rushed forward and brought the flag away, but the halyards were so inextricably tangled that it could not be righted. It was, therefore, nailed to the staff and planted upon the ramparts while batteries in every direction were played upon them. During the bombardment, a vast concourse of people gathered in Charleston and lined the wharves and promenade to witness the sublime contest. The surrounding county poured in its eager, excited masses to add to the throng. Men, women, and children stood there, hour after hour, with blanched faces and praying hearts, for few of that crowd but had some loved one in the works under fire. Messengers came hourly from several positions to assure the people of the safety of the men. The second day's conflict found the city densely filled with people crowding in by railway and private conveyance from the more distant counties until Charleston literally swarmed with humanity. The rest of the story is told in Major Anderson's dispatch to the United States government. Steamer Baltic off Sandy Hook, April 18, 1861. The Honorable S. Cameron, Secretary of War, Washington, D.C. Sir... Having defended Fort Sumter for 34 hours until the quarters were entirely burned, the main gates destroyed by fire, the gorge wall seriously injured, the magazine surrounded by flames, and its doors closed from the effects of heat, four barrels and three cartridges of powder only being available, and no provisions but pork remaining, I accepted the terms of evacuation offered by General Beauregard, being the same offered by him on the 11th instant prior to the commencement of hostilities, and marched out of the fort Sunday afternoon, the 14th instant, with colors flying and drums beating, bringing away company and private property, and saluting my flag with 50 guns, Robert Anderson, Major, 1st Artillery. End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of the United States Recorded for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Battle Hymn of the Republic, 1861 by Julia Ward Howe Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read the fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my contempt, no so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69. The Gathering of the Great Army, 1861, by Charles Carlton Coffin. At the call of the President, every village sends its soldiers, every town its company. 
when you listen to the soul thrilling music of the band and watch the long winding train as it vanished with the troops in the distance you had one little glimpse of the machinery of war as when riding past a great manufactory you see a single pulley or a row of spindles through a window you do not see the thousands of wheels belts shafts the hundred thousand spindles the arms of iron fingers of brass and springs of steel and the mighty wheel which gives motion to all and so you have not seen the great complicated far-reaching and powerful machinery of war but there is activity everywhere drums are beating men assembling soldiers marching and hastening on in regiments they go into camp and sleep on the ground wrapped in their blankets it is a new life they have no napkins no tablecloths at breakfast dinner or supper no china plates or silver forks each soldier has his tin plate and cup and makes a hearty meal of beef and bread it is hard baked bread they call it hard tack because it might be tacked upon the roof of a house instead of shingles they also have cincinnati chicken at home they called it pork fowls are scarce and pork is plenty in camp so they make believe it is chicken there is drilling by squads companies battalions and by regiments some stand guard around the camp by day and others go out on picket at night to watch for the enemy it is military life everything is done by orders when you become a soldier you cannot go and come as you please privates lieutenants captains colonels generals all are subject to the orders of their superior officers all must obey the general in command you march drill eat sleep go to bed and get up by order at sunrise you hear the reveille and at nine o'clock in the evening the tattoo then the candle which has been burning in your tent with a bayonet for a candlestick must be put out in the dead of night while sleeping soundly and dreaming of home you hear the drum beat it is the long roll there is a rattle of musketry the pickets are at it every man springs to his feet turn out turn out shouts the colonel fall in fall in cries the captain there is confusion throughout the camp a trampling of feet and loud hurried talking in your haste you get your boots on wrong and buckle your cartridge box on bottom up you rush out in the darkness not minding your steps and are caught by the tent ropes you tumble headlong upsetting to-morrow's breakfast of beans you take your place in the ranks nervous excited and trembling at you know not what the regiment rushes toward the firing which suddenly ceases an officer rides up in the darkness and says it is a false alarm you march back to camp cool and collected now grumbling at the stupidity of the picket who saw a bush thought it was a rebel fired his gun and alarmed the whole camp in the autumn of eighteen sixty one the army of the potomac encamped around washington numbered about two hundred thousand men before it marches to the battlefield let us see how it is organized how it looks how it is fed let us get an insight into its machinery go up in the balloon which you see hanging in the air across the potomac from georgetown and look down upon this great army all the country round is dotted with white tents some in the open fields and some half hid by the forest trees looking away to the northwest you see the right wing arlington is the centre and at alexandria is the left wing you see men in ranks in files in long lines in masses moving to and fro marching and counter-marching learning how to fight a battle there are thousands of wagons and horses there are from two to three hundred pieces of artillery 
how long the line if all were on the march men marching in files are about three feet apart a wagon with four horses occupies fifty feet if this army was moving on a narrow country road four cavalry men riding abreast and men in files of four with all the artillery ammunition wagons supply trains ambulances and equipment it would reach from boston to hartford or from new york city to albany a hundred and fifty miles to move such a multitude to bring order out of confusion there must be a system a plan and an organization regiments are therefore formed into brigades with usually about four regiments to a brigade three or four brigades compose a division and three or four divisions make an army corps a corps when full numbers from twenty five to thirty thousand men when an army moves the general commanding it issues his orders to the generals commanding the corps they issue their orders to the division commanders the division commanders to the brigadiers they to the colonels and the colonels to captains and the captains to the companies as the great wheel in the factory turns all the machinery so one mind moves the whole army the general-in-chief must designate the road which each corps shall take the time when they are to march where they are to march to and sometimes the hour when they must arrive at an appointed place the corps commanders must direct which of their divisions shall march first what roads they shall take and where they shall encamp at night the division commanders direct what brigade shall march first no corps division or brigade commander can take any other road than that assigned him without producing confusion and delay the army must have its food regularly think how much food it takes to supply the city of boston or cincinnati every day yet here are as many men as there are people in those cities there are a great many more horses in the army than in the stables of both of those cities all must be fed there must be a constant supply of beef pork bread beans vinegar sugar and coffee oats corn and hay the army must also have its supplies of clothing its boots shoes and coats it must have its ammunition its millions of cartridges of different kinds for there are a great many kinds of guns in the regiments springfield and enfield muskets french belgian prussian and austrian guns requiring a great many different kinds of ammunition there are a great many different kinds of cannon there must be no lack of ammunition no mistake in its distribution so there is the quartermaster's department the commissary and the ordnance department the quartermaster moves and clothes the army the commissary feeds it and the ordnance officer supplies it with ammunition the general-in-chief has a quartermaster-general a chief commissary and a chief ordnance officer who issue their orders to the chief officers and their departments attached to each corps they issue their orders to their subordinates in the divisions and the division officers to those in the brigades then there is a surgeon-general who directs all the hospital operations who must see that the sick and wounded are all taken care of there are camp surgeons division brigade and regimental surgeons there are hospital nurses ambulance drivers all subject to the orders of the surgeon no other officer can direct them each department is complete in itself it has cost a great deal of thought labor and money to construct this great machinery in creating it there has been much thinking energy determination and labor and there must be constant forethought in anticipating future wants necessities and contingencies when to move where and how the army does not exist of its own accord but by constant unremitting effort the people of the country determined that the constitution the union and the government bequeathed by their fathers should be preserved they authorized the president to raise a great army congress voted money and men the president acting as the agent of the people and as commander-in-chief 
appointed men to bring all the materials together and organize the army look at what was wanted to build this mighty machine and to keep it going first the hundreds of thousands of men the thousands of horses the thousands of barrels of beef pork and flour thousands of hogs heads of sugar vinegar rice salt bags of coffee and immense stores of other things thousands of tons of hay bags of oats and corn what numbers of men and women have been at work to get each soldier ready for the field he has boots clothes and equipments the tanner courier shoemaker the manufacturer with his swift flying shuttles the operator tending his looms and spinning jennies the tailor with his sewing machines the gunsmith the harness maker the blacksmith all trades and occupations have been employed there are saddles bridles knapsacks canteens dippers plates knives stoves kettles tents blankets medicines drums swords pistols guns cannon powder percussion caps bullets shot shells wagons everything walk leisurely through the camps and observe the little things and the great things see the men on the march then go into the army and navy departments in washington in those brick buildings west of the president's house in those rooms are surveys maps plans papers charts of the ocean of the sea-coast currents sandbar shoals the rising and falling of tides in the topographical bureau you see maps of all sections of the country there is the ordnance bureau with all sorts of guns rifles muskets carbines pistols swords shells rifle shot fuses which the inventors have brought in there are a great many bureaus with immense piles of papers and volumes containing experiments upon the strength of iron the trials of cannon guns mortars and powder there have been experiments to determine how much powder shall be used whether it shall be as fine as mustard seed or as coarse as lumps of sugar and the results are all noted here all the appliances of science industry and art are brought into use to make it the best army the world ever saw End of section sixty nine. This recording is in the public domain. Section seventy of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume thirteen. The United States edited by eva march tapin section seventy jonathan to john by james russell lowell in the latter part of eighteen sixty one the confederate sent messrs mason and slidell to ask for aid from england and france when on board the british vessel the trent they were seized by an american captain the british government was ready to declare war on the united states but president lincoln said why this is exercising the right of search that we went to war with england about in eighteen twelve and the men were surrendered the editor it don't seem hardly right john when both my hands was full to stump me to a fight john your cousin too john bull old uncle s he says i guess we know it now says he the lion's paw is all the law according to j b that's fit for you and me you wonder why we're hot john your mark was on the guns the neutral guns that shot john our brothers and our sons old uncle s he says i guess there's human blood says he by fits and starts in yankee hearts though it may surprise j b more than it would you and me if i turn mad dogs loose john on your front parlor stairs would it just meet your views john to wait and sue their heirs old uncle s he says i guess i only guess says he that if vettel on his toes fell twould kind of rile j b as well as you and me who made the law that hurts john heads i win ditto tails j b was on his shirts john unless my memory fails old uncle s he says i guess i'm good at that says he that sauce for goose ain't just the juice for ganders with j b no more'n we you or me when your rights was our wrongs john you didn't stop for fuss 
Britanny's trident prongs, John, was good enough law for us. Old Uncle S, he says, I guess, though physic's good, says he. It doesn't follow that he can swallow prescriptions signed J.B. put up by you and me. We own the ocean too, John. You mustn't take it hard. If we can't think with you, John, it's just your own backyard. Old Uncle S, he says, I guess, if that's his claim, says he, the fencing stuff will cost enough to bust up friend J.B., as well as you and me. Why talk so dreadful big, John, of honour when it's meant? You didn't care a bit, John, but just for ten per cent. Old Uncle S, he says, I guess he's like the rest, says he. When all is done, it's number one that's nearest to J.B., as well as to you and me. We give the critters back, John, cause Abraham thought twas right. It weren't your bullying clack, John, provoking us to fight. Old Uncle Ass, he says, I guess, we've a hard row now, says he, to hoe just now, but that somehow may happen to J.B., as well as you and me. We ain't so weak and poor, John, with twenty million people, and close to every door, John, a schoolhouse and a steeple. Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, it is a fact, says he. The surest way to make a man is think him so, J.B., as much as you or me. Our folks believe in law, John, and it's for her sake now. They've left the axe and saw, John, the anvil and the plough. Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, if twarn't for law, says he, There'd be one shindy from here to Indy, and that don't suit J.B., when taint twixt you and me. We know we've got a cause, John, that's honest, just, and true. We thought twould win applause, John, if nowhere else from you. Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, his love of right, says he, hangs by a rotten fibre of cotton. There's nature in J.B., as well as in you and me. The South says poor folks down, John, and all men up, say we. White, yellow, black, and brown, John, now which is your ID? Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, John preaches well, says he. But sermon through and come to do, why, there's the old J.B., a crowdin' you and me. Shall it be love or hate, John? It's you that's to decide. Ain't your bonds held by fate, John, like all the world's beside? Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, wise men forgive, says he, but not forget, and sometime yet, that truth may strike, J.B., as well as you and me. God means to make this land, John, clear through from sea to sea. Believe and understand, John, the worth of being free. Old Uncle S., he says, I guess, God's price is high, says he, but nothing else than what he sells wears long, and that J.B. may learn like you and me. End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 71 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 71. The Merrimack and the Monitor, 1862, by John S. Wise. The building of the ironclad, afterwards famous all over the world, as the Virginia or the Merrimack, was a subject of daily conversation in our household from the time the Gosport Navy Yard was burned and abandoned by the union troops in april eighteen sixty one my father during his service in congress was for some years upon the committee on naval affairs his acquaintance with naval officers resulting from that fact 
and from his long residence at rio de janeiro was unusually widespread commodore james barron was one of his constituents and warm friends commodore barron was the gallant but unfortunate officer who killed decatur in a duel and was himself severely wounded besides other contributions of value to the navy he conceived the idea of an impregnable steam propeller armed with a pyramidal beak and a terrapin shaped back at an acute angle to the line of projectiles fired from its own level he called it a marine catapulta and had complete models plans and descriptions which he exhibited to the naval committee in the effort to have a ship constructed on these lines he made little impression however for in those days steam navigation had attained no very great success much less the utilization of iron upon ships he subsequently presented the model to my father who had also a large number of models of other vessels in our rummaging about the place we boys found these models in some old boxes and took them down to our mill pond where we anchored them as part of our miniature fleet the barren model and one constructed by lieutenant williamson of the navy were the most conspicuous making quite a proud addition to our naval display this was in eighteen sixty we also possessed a brass cannon about eighteen inches long which had been cast for us by a convict in the virginia penitentiary that cannon was stamped with the words union and constitution but its use by its possessors was most lawless modelling slugs for it by pouring melted lead into holes made by sticking our rammer in the sand we were constantly firing these slugs to the great peril of everybody in the vicinity one of our neighbours a captain johnson an old seaman living about a mile down the creek had a flock of geese and from one of his voyages in indian seas he had brought back six coolie boys who were probably apprenticed to him these coolies were passionately fond of the water and were almost constantly in sight bathing or rowing or sailing a felucca rigged boat after trying the range of our gun upon captain johnson's geese we began to practise upon the coolies on a certain evening captain johnson appeared in full marine rig at our landing rowed by his six coolies and announcing to our father the sport in which we had been engaged gave notice that he had a gun of his own with which if we did not promptly cease our diversion he would open a return fire my father who was a friend of captain johnson and indignant at our reckless misconduct gave us all a but half hour in consequence of this visit we were summoned before him and after considerable discussion concerning the punishment we should receive were marched in a body to the landing and made to apologize to the coolies who grinned and showed their teeth after that we were good friends of the coolies and our future operations with the gun were confined to the mill pond on the opposite side of the farm in our new field it promptly occurred to us as it would to most boys that the best targets for our cannon were the models of the ironclads anchored out in the pond unfortunately they had no iron upon them and such was the precision we had acquired in our practice upon johnson's geese and coolies that in a few days the models of commodore barron and lieutenant williamson were riddled and ignominiously disappeared they were resting in the mud at the bottom of our mill pond when the war broke out the following spring after visiting the navy yard and seeing the partially burned merrimac my father became enthusiastic upon the subject of raising her and building upon her frame an ironclad ship on the lines of commodore barron's model imbued with this idea he instituted rigorous inquiries for the model but for reasons which may well be understood none of us boys aided him much in the search failing to find his model he wrote to general lee who was then commander-in-chief of the virginia forces 
an elaborate description of commodore barron's invention and made rough drawings urging the use of the merrimac for carrying out the design he always believed and declared that this was the first suggestion which led to the building of the virginia we all knew that an ironclad ship was being built and from time to time informed ourselves of the progress made and great things were expected from her so deep was my father's interest in her that he several times visited the navy yard to inspect her he repeatedly expressed the opinion that she was being built to draw too much water and that her beak or ramming prow was improperly constructed in this that it was horizontal at the top and sloped upward from the bottom whereas it should have been horizontal on the bottom and made to slope downward to a point when the ship was launched he was indignant because the lower edge or eaves of her armor-clad covering stood several feet out of the water and it was necessary to ballast her heavily to bring her sheathing below the water-line this increased her draught to eighteen feet which was as he declared entirely unnecessary he insisted that this condition was due to the failure of the naval architects in calculating the water which she would draw when sheathed with iron to deduct from the weight of her sheathing the weight of masts spars rigging and sails which were dispensed with admiral buchanan commodore forrest captain brooke and all the prominent naval men connected with the norfolk navy yard were personal and warm friends of my father he did not hesitate to express his views concerning these things but they as professional men generally do made light of the criticisms of a layman nevertheless i think that many naval authorities are now disposed to admit that the chief reason why the virginia did not triumph completely over the monitor was her great draught of water the loss of her prow and the twisting of her stem in ramming the cumberland after the disaster of roanoke island my father returned to his home on sick leave where for some time his life was in danger from pneumonia aggravated by exposure on the retreat from roanoke island our house was visited almost daily during this period by distinguished military and naval officers from the city who came to express their interest and sympathy it was before the day of steam launches and the appearance of the distinguished officers and of the naval boats which came up manned by a dozen oarsmen whose stroke fell as that of one man was very striking during these visits they diverted my father with full descriptions of the progress made in arming and equipping the virginia and we were advised that the time of her completion and the attack upon the vessels in hampton roads was rapidly approaching there was dear old commodore forrest tall dignified and with a face as sweet as that of a woman surmounted by a great shock of white hair like the mane of a royal beast and captain buchanan far less striking in appearance quiet kindly and as unpretentious as a country farmer but with an eye which age had not dimmed and which even then was filled with the light of battle they were both old men commodore forrest was sixty-five and captain buchanan sixty-two there was also captain brooke taciturn and dreamy and lieutenant catesby jones a quiet man of forty and lieutenant minor young quick and fidgety as a wren and all the rest of them mingling with us simply and unostentatiously as if unconscious that the issues of one of the greatest struggles the world ever witnessed were committed to their keeping and that they were to emerge from it with names which will be remembered as long as the records of naval warfare are preserved almost daily we boys went to norfolk for the mail or on some domestic mission we preferred our boat and seldom failed before we left norfolk harbour to stand over toward the gosport navy yard and sail around and take a look at the merrimac such we called her for we had never become accustomed to the new name virginia my father was now convalescent and secured the promise that he would be advised when the ship was ready to sail for the attack on march seventh he received a note from commodore forrest or one of those who knew advising him that the attack would be made upon the following day he consented that my brother richard and myself should accompany him and the next morning the horses which now had been well fed and rested for a month at home were saddled and ready for us at the door when we reached the city the merrimac accompanied by two little gunboats the beaufort and the raleigh had already passed out and all three were below fort norfolk 
the waterway is more circuitous than that by land and we were sure we should reach sewell's point the most favourable position for observing the conflict before the slow-moving vessels in this we were correct after a sharp gallop of eight miles we rode out upon the sandy hills facing hampton roads at sewell's point the scene was truly inspiring hampton roads is as beautiful a sheet of water as any on the face of the globe it is formed by the confluence of the james and the nansemond and the elizabeth rivers the james enters it from the west the nansemond from the south and the elizabeth from the east the tides in the roads run north and south and pass to and from the chesapeake bay through a narrow entrance at the north between old point comfort and willoughby's spit midway between these is the fort then known as rip raps the proper name of which was fort calhoun now changed to fort wool on the eastern side of the roads the confederates had fortified two points sewell's point where we were and lambert's point at the mouth of the elizabeth on the southern side between the mouths of the elizabeth and nansman rivers were the confederate fortifications on craney island on the western side at the entrance to the roads is fortress monroe from there the land runs westwardly to hampton thence southwardly to newport news which marks the entrance of the james river the roads are about four miles in width and seven in length from where we stood looking north fortress monroe and the riprap's were perhaps four miles away looking westward across the roads newport news was five miles away and looking south lambert's point and craney island were plainly visible three miles off upon the battlements of fortress monroe and the riprap's great numbers of union troops could be seen through field glasses and we could also make out the camps and fortifications of the enemy at newport news and between that point and hampton while our own people lined the shores and crowded the ramparts at craney island and lambert's point anchored in the roads were a great number of vessels of every description steam and sail from the smallest tugs and sloops to the largest transports and warships rumours of the attack had brought down to sewell's point a number of civilians and the whole appearance of the scene was suggestive of the greatest performance ever given in the largest theatre ever seen the merrimac and her attendants had passed craney island and were coming down the channel east of craney island light when we arrived as she passed our fortifications she was saluted and cheered and returned the salutes from the way in which she was shaping her course when first seen it looked to the uninitiated as if she proposed to sail directly upon the riprap's such hurrying and scurrying was seen among the non-combatant craft in the roads as was never witnessed before from great three-masters and double-deck steamers to little tugs and sailboats all weighed or slipped anchor and made sail or steam for fortress monroe except three dauntless war vessels two steamers the minnesota and the roanoke and one sailing vessel the st lawrence whose duty called them in the opposite direction a long tongue of shoal running out from craney island compelled the merrimac to go below sewell's point before she struck the main channel then she swung into it and pointed westward showing her destination for she headed straight for newport news where the masts and spars of the congress and the cumberland were plainly visible it was now past midday the merrimac on her new course was nearly stern to us and grew smaller and smaller as she followed the south channel to newport news the three united states vessels minnesota roanoke and st lawrence started after her by what is known as the north channel it was a bitter disappointment to us that the battle was to be waged so far away but the ships and their movements were still in view the sun was shining and a fresh march breeze would we thought blow away the smoke it seemed an eternity before the first gun was fired the merrimac cumberland and congress were nearly ranged in our line of vision the merrimac appeared to us as if she was almost in contact with the nearest of the two vessels captain buchanan states in his report that he was within less than a mile of the cumberland when he commenced the engagement by a shot at her from his bow gun we saw a great puff of smoke roll up and float off from the merrimac a moment later the flashes of broadsides and tremendous rolls of smoke from the congress the cumberland the batteries on shore and the union gunboats and then came the thunderous sounds following each other in the same order in which we had seen the smoke the engagement had begun it was a time of supreme excitement and supreme suspense for the details we who had no glasses were dependent upon those who had 
she has passed the congress exclaimed an officer who was straining forward trying to descry the positions of the ships through the smoke which now enveloped the point of newport news and the water beyond bang crash roar went the guns single shots and broadsides making all the noise that any boy could wish she is heading direct for the cumberland shouted another between the thunders of the broadsides she has rammed the cumberland was announced fifteen minutes after the first gun was heard and our people gave three cheers our teeth chattering with excitement we waited the next announcement it soon came the cumberland is sinking and again we cheered then came an ominous lull the meaning of which we did not know those watching through the glasses notified us that three steamers were in sight standing down james river and we knew it was commander tucker with the patrick henry jamestown and teaser think of it the jamestown which but four years ago had brought the remains of president monroe to richmond with the new york seventh regiment on that visit of fraternity and goodwill here she was armed as a war vessel fighting those very men once more the cannon belched and thundered this time what we saw and heard was alarming the merrimac is running up the river away from the congress and other vessels she is fighting the shore batteries as she goes it looked indeed as if she were disabled in some way again a lull and anxious waiting the merrimac is turning around and coming back again the roar of a hot engagement with the forts another lull and another heavy roll she is back pounding the congress and raking her fore and aft the congress is aground again our people went wild with enthusiasm poor fellows on the congress when the merrimac withdrew and passed upstream it was only to gain deep water in order to wind her for where she had rammed the cumberland her keel was in the mud and she could not be put about the fearless sailors on the congress deluded by the appearance of retreat believed that she had hauled off and leaving their guns gave three cheers having brought his ship around into position to attack the congress captain buchanan now came back at her and as he approached blew up a transport alongside the wharf sunk one schooner captured another and proceeded to rake the congress where she had run ashore in shoal water describing this stage of the fight captain buchanan says in his report the carnage havoc and dismay caused by our fire compelled them to haul down their colours and to hoist a white flag at their gaff and half mast and another at the main the crew instantly took to their boats and landed our fire immediately ceased and a signal was made for the beaufort to come within hail he then ordered lieutenant commander parker to take possession of the congress secure the officers as prisoners allow the crew to land and burn the ship this captain parker did receiving her flag and surrender from commander smith and lieutenant pendergrast with the side-arms of those officers they delivered themselves as prisoners of war on board the beaufort and afterwards being permitted at their own request to return to the ship to assist in removing the wounded never returned the beaufort and raleigh while alongside the congress after her surrender and while she had two white flags flying were subjected to a heavy fire from the shore and from the congress and withdrew without setting her afire after losing several valuable officers and men the lieutenant minor was sent to burn the ship which he was fired upon and severely wounded his boat was recalled and captain buchanan ordered the congress to be destroyed by hot shot and incendiary shell by this time the ships from old point opened fire upon the merrimac the minnesota grounded in the north channel the shoalness of the water prevented the near approach of the merrimac the roanoke and st lawrence warned by the fate of the cumberland and congress retired under the guns of fortress monroe the merrimac pounded away at the grounded minnesota until the pilots warned her commander that it was no longer safe to remain in that position then returning by the south channel she had an opportunity to open again upon the minnesota although the shallow water was between the two and afterwards upon the st lawrence which responded with several broadsides it was too tantalizing to see these vessels which in deep water would have been completely at her mercy protected from her assaults by the shoals by this time it was dark and the merrimac anchored off sewell's point the western sky was illuminated with the burning congress her loaded guns were successively discharged as the flames reached them until a few minutes past midnight her magazine exploded with a tremendous report thus ended the first day's doings of the merrimac soon after she anchored some of her officers came ashore and we who had been waiting all day and who had now decided to remain all night in order to see the next day's operations were gratified with a full and graphic description of the fighting 
captain buchanan lieutenant minor and the other wounded were sent to norfolk having been tendered the hospitality of sewell's point by some of the officers our party remained and were lulled to sleep by the firing of the guns of the burning congress and rudely aroused about midnight by the tremendous explosion of her magazine up betimes in the morning we saw the minnesota still ashore she was nearly in line with us and about a mile nearer to us than newport news a tug was beside her and a very odd-looking iron battery we expected great things from this day's operations about eight o'clock the merrimac ran down to engage them firing at the minnesota and occasionally at the iron battery she was now under command of lieutenant jones we confidently expected her to be able to get very near to the minnesota but in this the pilots were mistaken when about a mile from the frigate she ran ashore and was some time backing before she got afloat her great length and draught rendered it difficult to work her notwithstanding these delays she succeeded in damaging the minnesota seriously and in blowing up the tugboat dragon lying alongside her while this was going on the iron battery which looked like a cheese-box floating on a shingle moved out from behind the frigate and advanced to meet the merrimac the disparity in size between the two was remarkable we could not doubt that the merrimac would either by shot or by ramming make short work of the cheese-box but as time wore on we began to realize that the newcomer was a tough customer her turret resisted the shells of the merrimac and not only was she speedier but her draught was so much less than that of her antagonist that she could run off into shallow water and prevent the merrimac from ramming her there was no lack of pluck shown by either vessel the little monitor came right up and laid herself alongside as if she had been a giant she was quicker in every way than her antagonist and presented the appearance of a saucy kingbird pecking at a very large and very black crow the first shot fired by the merrimac missed the monitor which was a novel experience for the gunners who had been riddling the hulls of frigates then again when the eleven-inch solid shot struck the casemates knocking the men of the merrimac down and leaving them dazed and bleeding at the nose from the tremendous impact they realized that the cheese box was loaded as none of the other vessels had been neither vessel could penetrate the armor of the other both tried ramming unsuccessfully the monitor had not mass sufficient to injure the merrimac the merrimac only gave the monitor a glancing ram weakened by the monitor's superior speed and then the monitor ran off into shallow water safe from pursuit twice we thought the merrimac had won the fight on the first occasion the monitor went out of action it seems to replenish the ammunition in the turret it being impossible to use the scuttle by which ammunition was passed unless the turret was stationary and in a certain position the second occasion was about eleven o'clock when a shell from the merrimac struck the monitor's pilot-house and seemed to have penetrated the ship she drifted off aimlessly towards shoal water her guns were silent and the people on board the minnesota gave up hope and prepared to burn her this was when lieutenant warden commander of the monitor was blinded and the steersman stunned their position was so isolated that no one knew their condition for some minutes then lieutenant green discovered it took command and brought the vessel back into action shortly afterward lieutenant jones withdrew the merrimac in his report of the action he said the pilots declaring that we could get no nearer the minnesota and believing her to be entirely disabled and the monitor having run into shoal water which prevented our doing her any further injury we ceased firing at twelve o'clock and proceeded to norfolk the stem is twisted and the ship leaks we have lost the prow starboard anchor and all the boats the armor is somewhat damaged the steam-pipe and smoke-stack both riddled the muzzles of two of the guns shot away when from the shore we saw the merrimac haul off and head for norfolk we could not credit the evidence of our own senses ah we thought dear old buchanan would never have done it lieutenant jones was afterwards fully justified by his superiors but it did seem to us that he ought to have stayed there until he drove the monitor away beside the reasons assigned above lieutenant jones declared that it was necessary to leave when he did in order to cross the elizabeth river bar the inconclusive result of that fight has left to endless discussion among naval men the question which was the better ship of the two it is not within the scope of this work to investigate that problem it is certain that up to the time the monitor appeared the merrimac seemed irresistible and that but for the presence of the monitor she would have made short work of the minnesota 
it is equally certain that the monitor performed her task of defence it is said she was anxious to renew the fight but two weeks later the merrimac went down into deep water where the monitor was lying under the guns of fortress monroe and tried to coax her out but she would not come and even permitted the jamestown and beaufort to sail up to hampton and capture two schooners laden with hay the truth is that if the merrimac could have induced the monitor to meet her in deep water she would easily have rammed and sunk her on our ride back to the city my father while greatly elated at what had been done continued to deplore the errors of construction in the merrimac which the two days fighting had made all the more manifest but we boys thought she had earned glory enough and joined the others in the general jubilation everybody in norfolk knew the officers and men on board our ships many of them were natives of the town when they were granted to relief they were given a triumphal reception some time since i read an account of the dutch admiral de ruder who the day after his four days battle with the english fleet was seen in his yard in his shirt-sleeves with a basket on his arm feeding his hens and sweeping out his cabin it reminded me of the simple lives and unpretentious behaviour of those splendid fellows who handled the merrimac yesterday they revolutionised the naval warfare of the world to-day they were walking about the streets of norfolk or sitting at their firesides as if unaware that fame was trumpeting their names to the ends of the earth end of section seventy one this recording is in the public domain section seventy two of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section seventy two taken prisoner at shiloh eighteen sixty two by henry m stanley henry m stanley the famous african explorer was born in wales in eighteen forty one at the age of sixteen he came to america and on the outbreak of the civil war enlisted in the confederate army he was captured at the battle of shiloh but escaped and returned to wales his natural love of adventure soon lured him back to america and he again enlisted this time on the union side at the close of the war he served as a newspaper correspondent on the western plains and in abyssinia an account of his african explorations will be found in volume three the editor day broke with every promise of a fine day next to me on my right was a boy of seventeen henry parker i remember it because while we stood at ease he drew my attention to some violets at his feet and said it would be a good idea to put a few into my cap perhaps the yanks won't shoot me if they see me wearing such flowers for they are a sign of peace capital said i i will do the same we plucked a bunch and arranged the violets in our caps the men in the ranks laughed at our proceedings and had not the enemy been so near their merry mood might have been communicated to the army we loaded our muskets and arranged our cartridge pouches ready for use our weapons were the obsolete flintlocks and the ammunition was rolled in cartridge paper which contained powder a round ball and three buckshot when we loaded we had to tear the paper with our teeth empty a little powder into the pan lock it empty the rest of the powder into the barrel press paper and ball into the muzzle and ram home then the orderly sergeant called the roll and we knew that the dixie grays were present to a man soon after there was a commotion and we dressed up smartly a young aide galloped along our front gave some instructions to the brigadier hindman who confided the same to his colonels and presently we swayed forward in line with shouldered arms newton's story big broad and straight bore our company banner of gay silk at which the ladies of our neighbourhood had laboured as we tramped solemnly and silently through the thin forest and over its grass still in its withered and wintry hue i noticed that the sun was not far from appearing that our regiment was keeping its formation admirably that the woods would have been a grand place for a picnic and i thought it strange that a sunday should have been chosen to disturb the holy calm of those woods 
before we had gone five hundred paces our serenity was disturbed by some desultory firing in front it was then a quarter past five they are at it already we whispered to each other stand by gentlemen for we were all gentlemen volunteers at this time said our captain l g smith our steps became unconsciously brisker and alertness was noticeable in everybody the firing continued at intervals deliberate and scattered as at target practice we drew nearer to the firing and soon a sharper rattling of musketry was heard that is the enemy waking up we said within a few minutes there was another explosive burst of musketry the air was pierced by many missiles which hummed and pinged sharply by our ears pattered through the tree-tops and brought twigs and leaves down on us those are bullets henry whispered with awe at two hundred yards farther a dreadful roar of musketry broke out from a regiment adjoining ours it was followed by another farther off and the sound had scarcely died away when regiment after regiment blazed away and made a continuous roll of sound we are in for it now said henry but as yet we had seen nothing though our ears were tingling under the animated volleys forward gentlemen make ready urged captain smith in response we surged forward for the first time marring the alignment we trampled recklessly over the grass and young sprouts beams of sunlight stole athwart our course the sun was up above the horizon just then we came to a bit of pack land and overtook our skirmishers who had been engaged in exploring our front we passed beyond them nothing now stood between us and the enemy there they are was no sooner uttered than we cracked into them with levelled muskets aim low men commanded captain smith i tried hard to see some living thing to shoot at for it appeared absurd to be blazing away at shadows but still advancing firing as we moved i at last saw a row of little globes of pearly smoke streaked with crimson breaking out with spurtive quickness from a long line of bluey figures in front and simultaneously there broke upon our ears an appalling crash of sound the series of fusillades following one another with startling suddenness which suggested to my somewhat muttered sense a mountain upheaved with huge rocks tumbling and thundering down a slope and the echoes rambling and receding through space again and again these loud and quick explosions were repeated seemingly with increased violence until they rose to the highest pitch of fury and in unbroken continuity all the world seemed involved in one tremendous ruin this was how the conflict was ushered in as it affected me i looked around to see the effect on others or whether i was singular in my emotions and was glad to notice that each was possessed with his own thoughts all were pale solemn and absorbed but beyond that it was impossible for me to discover what they thought of it but by transmission of sympathy i felt that they would gladly prefer to be elsewhere though the law of the inevitable kept them in line to meet their destiny it might be mentioned however that at no time were we more instinctively inclined to obey the voice of command we had no individuality at this moment but all motions and thoughts were surrendered to the unseen influence which directed our movements probably few bothered their minds with self-questionings as to the issue to themselves that properly belongs to other moments to the night to the interval between waking and sleeping to the first moments of the dawn not when every nerve is tense and the spirit is at the highest pitch of action though one's senses were preternaturally acute and engaged with their impressions we plied our arms loaded and fired with such nervous haste as though it depended on each of us how soon this fiendish uproar would be hushed my nerves tingled my pulses beat double quick my heart throbbed loudly and almost painfully but amid all the excitement my thoughts swift as the flash of lightning took all sound and sight and self into their purview i listened to the battle raging far away on the flanks to the thunder in front to the various sounds made by the leaden storm i was angry with my rear rank because he made my eyes smart with the powder of his musket and i felt like cuffing him for deafening my ears i knew how captain smith and lieutenant mason looked how bravely the dixie gray's banner ruffled over newton story's head and that all hands were behaving as though they knew how long all this would last back to myself my thoughts came and with the whirring bullet they fled to the blue bloused ranks afront they dwelt on their movements and read their temper as i should read time by a clock 
through the lurid haze the contours of their pink faces could not be seen but their gappy hesitating incoherent and sensitive line revealed their mood clearly we continued advancing step by step loading and firing as we went to every forward step they took a backward move loading and firing as they slowly withdrew twenty thousand muskets were being fired at this stage but though accuracy of aim was impossible owing to our labouring hearts and the jarring and excitement many bullets found their destined billets on both sides after a steady exchange of musketry which lasted some time we heard the order fix bayonets on the double quick in tones that thrilled us there was a simultaneous bound forward each soul doing his best for the emergency the federals appeared inclined to await us but at this juncture our men raised a yell thousands responded to it and burst out into the wildest yelling it has ever been my lot to hear it drove all sanity and order from among us it served the double purpose of relieving pent-up feelings and transmitting encouragement along the attacking line i rejoiced in the shouting like the rest it reminded me that there were about four hundred companies like the dixie greys who shared our feelings most of us engrossed with the musket work had forgotten the fact but the wave after wave of human voices louder than all other battle sounds together penetrated to every sense and stimulated our energies to the utmost they fly was echoed from lip to lip it accelerated our pace and filled us with a noble rage then i knew what the berserker passion was it deluged us with rapture and transfigured each southerner into an exulting victor at such a moment nothing could have halted us those savage yells and the sight of thousands of racing figures coming towards them discomfited the blue coats and when we arrived upon the place where they had stood they had vanished then we caught sight of their beautiful array of tents before which they had made their stand after being roused from their sunday morning sleep and huddled into line at hearing their pickets challenge our skirmishers the half-dressed dead and wounded showed what a surprise our attack had been we drew up in the enemy's camp panting and breathing hard some precious minutes were thus lost in recovering our breaths indulging our curiosity and reforming our line signs of a hasty rouse to the battle were abundant military equipments uniform coats half-packed knapsacks bedding of a new and superior quality littered the company streets meantime a series of other camps lay behind the first array of tents the resistance we had met though comparatively brief enabled the brigades in rear of the advance camp to recover from the shock of the surprise but our delay had not been long enough to give them time to form in proper order of battle there were wide gaps between their divisions into which the quick flowing tide of elated southerners entered and compelled them to fall back lest they should be surrounded prentice's brigade despite their most desperate efforts were thus hemmed in on all sides and were made prisoners i had a momentary impression that with the capture of the first camp the battle was well nigh over but in fact it was only a brief prologue of the long and exhaustive series of struggles which took place that day continuing our advance we came in view of the tops of another mass of white tents and almost at the same time were met by a furious storm of bullets poured on us from a long line of blue coats whose attitude of assurance proved to us that we should have tough work here but we were so much heartened by our first success that it would have required a good deal to have halted our advance for long their opportunity for making a full impression on us came with terrific suddenness the world seemed bursting into fragments cannon and musket shell and bullet lent their several intensities to the distracting uproar if i had not a fraction of an ear and an eye inclined toward my captain and company i had been spellbound by the energies now opposed to us i likened the cannon with their deep bass to the roaring of a great herd of lions the ripping cracking musketry to the incessant yapping of terriers the windy whisk of shells and zipping of many bullets to the swoop of eagles and the buzz of angry wasps all the opposing armies of grey and blue fiercely blazed at each other after being exposed for a few seconds to this fearful downpour we heard the order to lie down men and continue your firing before me was a prostrate tree about fifteen inches in diameter with a narrow strip of light between it and the ground behind this shelter a dozen of us flung ourselves the security it appeared to offer restored me to my individuality we could fight and think and observe better than out in the open but it was a terrible period how the cannon bellowed and their shells plunged and bounded 
and flew with screeching hisses over us their sharp rending explosions and hurtling fragments made us shrink and cower despite our utmost efforts to be cool and collected i marvelled as i heard the unintermitting patter snip thud and hum of the bullets how any one could live under this raining death i could hear the balls beating a merciless tattoo on the outer surface of the log pinging vivaciously as they flew off at a tangent from it and thudding into something or other at the rate of a hundred a second one here and there found its way under the log and buried itself in a comrade's body one man raised his chest as if to yawn and jostled me i turned to him and saw that a bullet had gored his whole face and penetrated into his chest another ball struck a man a deadly rap on the head and he turned on his back and showed his ghastly white face to the sky it is getting too warm boys cried a soldier and he uttered a vehement curse upon keeping soldiers hugging the ground until every ounce of courage was chilled he lifted his head a little too high and a bullet skimmed over the top of the log and hit him fairly in the centre of his forehead and he fell heavily on his face but his thought had been instantaneously general and the officers with one voice ordered the charge and cries of forward forward raised us as with a spring to our feet and changed the complexion of our feelings the pulse of action beat feverishly once more and though overhead was crowded with peril we were unable to give it so much attention as when we lay stretched on the ground just as we bent our bodies for the onset a boy's voice cried out oh stop please stop a bit i've been hurt and can't move i turned to look and saw henry parker standing on one leg and dolefully regarding his smashed foot in another second we were striding impetuously toward the enemy vigorously plying our muskets stopping only to prime the pan and ram the load down when with a spring or two we would fetch up with the front aim and fire our progress was not so continuously rapid as we desired for the blues were obdurate but at this moment we were gladdened at the sight of a battery galloping to our assistance it was time for the nerve-shaking cannon to speak after two rounds of shell and canister we felt the pressure on us slightly relaxed but we were still somewhat sluggish in disposition though the officers voices rang out imperiously newton story at this juncture strode forward rapidly with the dixie's banner until he was quite sixty yards ahead of the foremost finding himself alone he halted and turning to us smilingly said why don't you come on boys you see there is no danger his smile and words acted on us like magic we raised the yell and sprang lightly and hopefully toward him let's give them hell boys said one plug them plumb center every time it was all very encouraging for the yelling and shouting were taken up by thousands forward forward don't give them breathing time was cried we instinctively obeyed and soon came in clear view of the blue coats who were scornfully unconcerned at first but seeing the leaping tide of men coming on at a tremendous pace their front dissolved and they fled in double quick retreat again we felt the glorious joy of heroes they carried us on exultingly rejoicing in the spirit which recognizes nothing but the prey we were no longer an army of soldiers but so many schoolboys racing in which length of legs wind and condition tell we gained the second line of camps continued the rush through them and clean beyond it it was now about ten o'clock my physical powers were quite exhausted and to add to my discomfiture something struck me on my belt clasp and tumbled me headlong to the ground i could not have been many minutes prostrated before i recovered from the shock of the blow and fall to find my clasp deeply dented and cracked my company was not in sight i was grateful for the rest and crawled feebly to a tree and plunging my hand into my haversack ate ravenously within half an hour feeling renovated i struck north in the direction which my regiment had taken over a ground strewn with bodies and the debris of war i overtook my regiment about one o'clock and found that it was engaged in one of these occasional spurts of fury the enemy resolutely maintained their ground and our side was preparing for another assault the firing was alternately brisk and slack we lay down and availed ourselves of trees logs and hollows and annoyed their upstanding ranks battery pounded battery and meanwhile we hugged our resting places closely of a sudden we rose and raced towards the position and took it by sheer weight and impetuosity as we had done before about three o'clock the battle grew very hot the enemy appeared to be more concentrated and immovably sullen both sides fired better as they grew more accustomed to the din but with assistance from the reserves we were continually pressing them towards the river tennessee without ever retreating an inch about this time the enemy were assisted by the gunboats which hurled their enormous projectiles far beyond us but though they made great havoc among the trees and created terror they did comparatively little damage to those in close touch with the enemy the screaming of the big shells when they first began to sail over our heads 
had the effect of reducing our fire for they were as fascinating as they were distracting but we became used to them and our attention was being claimed more in front our officers were more urgent and when we saw the growing dyke of white cloud that signalled the bullet storm we could not be indifferent to the more immediate danger dead bodies wounded men writhing in agony and assuming every distressful attitude were frequent sights but what made us heartsick was to see now and then the well-groomed charger of an officer with fine saddle and scarlet and yellow edged cloth and brass-tipped holsters or a stray cavalry or artillery horse galloping between the lines snorting with terror while his entrails soiled with dust trailed behind him our officers had continued to show the same alertness and vigour throughout the day but as it drew near four o'clock though they strove to encourage and urge us on they began to abate somewhat in their energy and it was evident that the pluckiest of the men lacked this spontaneity and springing ardour which had distinguished them earlier in the day several of our company lagged wearily behind and the remainder showed by their drawn faces the effects of their efforts yet after a short rest they were able to make splendid spurts as for myself i had only one wish and that was for repose the long continued excitement the successive tautening and relaxing of the nerves the quenchless thirst made more intense by the fumes of sulphurous powder and the caking grime on the lips caused by tearing the paper cartridges and a ravening hunger all combined had reduced me to a walking automaton and i earnestly wished that night would come and stop all further effort finally about five o'clock we assaulted and captured a large camp after driving the enemy well away from it the front line was as thin as that of a skirmishing body and we were ordered to retire to the tents there we hungrily sought after provisions and i was lucky in finding a supply of biscuits and a canteen of excellent molasses which gave great comfort to myself and friends the plunder in the camp was abundant there were bedding clothing and accoutrements without stint but people were so exhausted they could do no more than idly turn the things over night soon fell and only a few stray shots could now be heard to remind us of the thrilling and horrid din of the day excepting the huge bombs from the gunboats which as we were not far from the blue coats discomfited only those in the rear by eight o'clock i was repeating my experiences in the region of dreams indifferent to columbiads and mortars and the torrential rain which at midnight increased the miseries of the wounded and tentless an hour before dawn i awoke from a refreshing sleep and after a hearty replenishment of my vitals with biscuit and molasses i conceived myself to be fresher than on sunday morning while awaiting daybreak i gathered from other early risers their ideas in regard to the events of yesterday they were under the impression that we had gained a great victory though we had not as we had anticipated reached the tennessee river van dorn with his expected reinforcements for us was not likely to make his appearance for many days yet and if general buell with his twenty thousand troops had joined the enemy during the night we had a bad day's work before us we were short of provisions and ammunition general sidney johnston our chief commander had been killed but beauregard was safe and unhurt and if buell was absent we would win the day at daylight i fell in with my company but there were only about fifty of the dixies present almost immediately after symptoms of the coming battle were manifest regiments were hurried into line but even to my inexperienced eyes the troops were in ill condition for repeating the efforts of sunday however in brief time in consequence of our pickets being driven in on us we were moved forward in skirmishing order with my musket on the trail i found myself in active motion more active than otherwise i would have been perhaps because captain smith had said now mr stanley if you please step briskly forward this singling out of me wounded my amour propre and sent me forward like a rocket in a short time we met our opponents in the same formation as ourselves and advancing most resolutely we threw ourselves behind such trees as were near us fired loaded and darted forward to another shelter presently i found myself in an open grassy space with no convenient tree or stump near but seeing a shallow hollow some twenty paces ahead i made a dash for it and plied my musket with haste i became so absorbed with some blue figures in front of me that i did not pay sufficient heed to my companion greys the open space was too dangerous perhaps for their advance for had they emerged i should have known they were pressing forward seeing my blues in about the same proportion i assumed that the greys were keeping their position and never once thought of retreat 
however as despite our firing the blues were coming uncomfortably near i rose from my hollow but to my speechless amazement i found myself a solitary grey in a line of blue skirmishers my companions had retreated the next i heard was down with that gun see shesh or i'll drill a hole through you drop it quick half a dozen of the enemy were covering me at the same instant and i dropped my weapon incontinently two men sprang at my collar and marched me unresisting into the ranks of the terrible yankees i was a prisoner end of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain Section seventy three of the United States read for LibriVox .org by Devora Allen. The first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation by Francis Bicknell Carpenter, United States, eighteen thirty to nineteen hundred. Painting, page three hundred forty six. At the time of the memorable first reading, Lincoln called his cabinet together and spoke as follows. Gentlemen, I have, as you are aware, thought a great deal about the relation of this war to slavery, and you all remember that several weeks ago I read to you an order I had prepared on this subject, which, on account of objections made by some of you, was not issued. Ever since then my mind has been much occupied with this subject, and I have thought all along that the time for acting on it might probably come. I think the time has come now. I wish it was a better time. I wish that we were in better condition. The action of the army against the rebels has not been quite what I should have best liked. But they have been driven out of Maryland, and Pennsylvania is no longer in danger of invasion. When the rebel army was at Frederick, I determined, as soon as it should be driven out of Maryland, to issue a proclamation of emancipation, such as I thought most likely to be useful. I said nothing to anyone, but I made the promise to myself, and, hesitating a little, to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out, and I am going to fulfill that promise. I have got you together to hear what I have written down. I do not wish your advice about the main matter, for that I have determined for myself. This I say without intending anything but respect for any one of you. I am here, I must do the best I can and bear the responsibility of taking the course which I feel I ought to take. From left to right, the persons seated are Stanton, the President, Wells, Seward, and Bates. Those standing are Chase, Smith, and Blair. End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 74. Boston Hymn by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Footnote. Read in Music Hall, January the 1st, 1863, at a celebration of the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation. End footnote. The word of the Lord by night to the watching pilgrims came, as they sat by the seaside, and filled their hearts with flame. God said, I am tired of kings, I suffer them no more. Up to my ear the morning brings the outrage of the poor. Think ye I made this ball a field of havoc and war, Where tyrants great and tyrants small might harry the weak and poor? My angel, his name is Freedom, choose him to be your king. He shall cut pathways east and west, and fend you with his wing lo i uncover the land which i hid old time in the west as the sculptor uncovers the statue when he has wrought his best i show columbia of the rocks which dip their foot in the seas and soar to the airborne flocks of clouds and the boreal fleece 
i will divide my goods call in the wretch and slave none shall rule but the humble and none but toil shall have i will have never a noble no lineage counted great fishers and choppers and ploughmen shall constitute a state go cut down trees in the forest and trim the straightest boughs cut down trees in the forest and build me a wooden house call the people together the young men and the sires the digger in the harvest field hireling and him that hires and here in a pine state house they shall choose men to rule in every needful faculty in church and state and school lo now if these poor men can govern the land and sea and make just laws below the sun as planets faithful be and ye shall succour men tis nobleness to serve help them who cannot help again beware from right to swerve i break your bonds and masterships and i unchain the slave free be his heart and hand henceforth as wind and wandering wave i cause from every creature his proper good to flow as much as he is and doeth so much he shall bestow but laying hand on another to coin his labour and sweat he goes in pawn to his victim for eternal years in debt to-day unbind the captive so only are ye unbound lift up a people from the dust trump of their rescue sound pay ransom to the owner and fill the bag to the brim who is the owner the slave is owner and ever was pay him o oh, north give him beauty for rags and honour o oh, south for his shame nevada coin thy golden crags with freedom's image and name up and the dusky race that sat in darkness long be swift their feet as antelopes and as behemoth strong come east and west and north by races and snowflakes and carry my purpose forth which neither halts nor shakes my will fulfilled shall be for in daylight or in dark my thunderbolt has eyes to see his way home to the mark end of section seventy four this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone in oxford england section seventy five of the united states read for librivox dot org by jim locke the united states volume two part eleven the turning point historical note on may one eighteen sixty three general hooker with one hundred and five thousand men attacked the confederate army of fifty thousand men at chancellorsville and suffered the worst defeat experienced by the north during the war during the battle stonewall jackson was mortally wounded by the mistake of his own men lee again attempted to invade the north but was met at gettysburg on july one by the union army under general meade after three days of the most desperate fighting of modern times the confederates were forced to retreat on the day after this great battle vicksburg the strongest and most important confederate position in the west was captured by general grant after a long siege and the entire mississippi was henceforth in the hands of the unionists these two victories mark the turning point of the war while the wealthy and populous northern states could continue the struggle indefinitely the resources of the south were rapidly nearing exhaustion and it would soon be a question merely of how long the south could continue its resistance grant's almost uniform success in the west had been in such contrast with the union operations in the east 
that in march eighteen sixty four he was made commander-in-chief of all the northern armies having given command of the western army to sherman he advanced with the army of the potomac directly toward richmond undeterred by the terrible slaughter of his men at the wilderness spotsylvania and cold harbor he pushed forward and invested petersburg where he was held at bay by lee until the following spring a force detached from the confederate army to threaten washington was defeated by sheridan and the fertile shenandoah valley was devastated in the meantime general sherman after a brilliant campaign against johnston captured atlanta and started on his march to the sea end of section seventy five this recording is in the public domain section seventy six of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by valerie marino the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section seventy six stonewall jackson by the river eighteen sixty three by mary johnston the battle of chancellorsville was one of the most important engagements of the whole war an exceedingly brilliant part of the battle was the flank movement of jackson which is described as follows lee ordered jackson who had been stationed on his extreme right with thirty thousand men to make a wide detour and swinging round to the extreme right of the federal position make an unexpected assault upon the enemy's flank the direction of this movement was not apparent to the federals who began to regard it in the nature of a retreat about six p m after a march of some fifteen miles jackson fell suddenly upon the flank and rear of howard's corps which constituted the right flank of the federal army and taking it by surprise stampeded it jackson while in advance of his troops was fired upon and mortally wounded by his own men who mistook his escort for a detachment of federals the editor a very few yards from chancellorsville he checked little sorrel the horse stood four feet planted horse and rider they stood and listened hooker's reserves were up about the chancellor house on the chancellorsville ridge they were throwing up entrenchments they were digging the earth with bayonets they were heaping it up with their hands there was a ringing of axes they were cutting down the young spring growth they were making an abetus tones of command could be heard hurry 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 they meant to rush us hurry hurry a dead creeper matling a dead tree caught by some flying spark suddenly flared through its length stood a pillar of fire and showed readily the enemy's guns stonewall jackson sat his horse and looked cut them off from the ford he said never let them get out of virginia he jerked his hand into the air turning little sorrel he rode back along the plank road toward his own lines the light of the burning brush had sunk in the cannon smoke floating in the air the very thick woods made all things obscure there are troops across the road in front said an aide yes lane's north carolinans awaiting their signal a little to the east and south broke out in the wildness a sudden rattling fire sinking sinking again the blue and gray skirmishes now in touch all through the vast dark tangled beating heart of the place sprang into being attention the gray lines listened for the word advance the musket rested on the shoulder the foot quivered eyes front tried to pierce the darkness sound was unceasing and yet the mind found a stillness a lake of calm it was the moment before the moment stonewall jackson came toward the carolinans he rode quickly past the dark shell of a house sunken among pines there were with him seven or eight persons the woods were deep the obscurity great suddenly out of the brush rang a shot an accidentally discharged rifle some gray soldier among lane's tensely waiting ranks dressed in the woods to the right of the road spoke from the core of a fearful dream yankee cavalry fire called an officer of the eighteenth north carolina the volley striking diagonally across the road emptied several saddles stonewall jackson the aides and wilburn wheeled to the left dug spur and would have plunged into the wood fire said the carolinans dressed to the left of the road and fired little sorrel maddened and dashed into the woods an oak bough stuck its rider almost bearing him from the saddle with his right hand from which the blood was streaming 
in which a bullet was embedded, he caught the bridle, managed to turn the agonized brute into the road again. There seemed a wild sound, a wild confusion of voices. Someone had stopped the firing. My God, men, you are firing into us. In the road were the aides. They caught the rein, stopped the horse. Wilborn put up his arms. General, general, you are not hurt? Hold there, Morrison, Lee. They laid him on the ground beneath the pines, and they fired the brushwood for a light. One rode off for Dr. McGuire, and another with a penknife cut away the sleeve from the left arm through which had gone two bullets. A mounted man came at a gallop and threw himself from his horse. It was A.P. Hill. General, general, you are not much hurt? Yes, I think I am, said Stonewall Jackson, and my wounds are from my own men. Hill drew off the gauntlets that were all blood-soaked, and with his handkerchief tried to bind up the arm. Shattered and with the main artery cut, a courier came up. Sir, sir, a body of the enemy is close at hand. The aides lifted the wounded general. No one, said Hill, must tell the troops who was wounded. The other opened his eyes. Tell them simply that you have a wounded officer. General Hill, you are in command now. Press right on. With a gesture of sorrow, Hill went, returning to the front. The others rested at the edge of the road. At that moment, the Federal batteries opened. A hissing storm of shot and shell. A tornado meant measurably to retard that anticipated gray onrush. The range was high. Aides and couriers laid the wounded leader on the earth and made of their bodies a screen. The trees were cut, the earth was torn up, there was a howling as of unchained fiends. There passed what seemed an eternity and was but ten minutes. The great blue guns slightly changed the direction of their fire. The storm howled away from the group by the road, and the men again lifted Jackson. He stood now on his feet, and because troops were heard approaching, and because it must not be known that he was hurt, all moved into the darkness of the scrub. The troops upon the road came on Pender's brigade. Pender, riding in advance, saw the group and asked who was wounded. A field officer, answered one, but there came from some direction a glare of light, and by it Pender knew. He sprang from his horse. Don't say anything about it, General Pender, said Jackson. Press on, sir, press on. General, they are using all their artillery. It is a very deadly fire. In the darkness it may disorganize. The forage cap was gone. The blue eyes showed full and deep. You must hold your ground, General Pender. You must hold out to the last, sir. I will, General, I will, said Pender. A litter was found and brought, and Stonewall Jackson was laid upon it. The little procession moved toward Dowdall's tavern. A shot pierced the arm of one of the bearers, loosening his hold of the litter. It tilted. The general fell heavily to the ground, injuring afresh the wounded limb, striking and bruising his side. They raised him, pale, now and silent, and at last they struggled through the wood to a little clearing where they found an ambulance. Now, too, came the doctor, a man whom he loved, and knelt beside him. I hope that you are not badly hurt, General. Yes, I am, Doctor. I am badly hurt. I fear that I am dying. In the ambulance lay also his chief of artillery, Colonel Crutchfield, painfully injured. Crutchfield pulled the doctor down to him. He's not badly hurt? Yes, badly hurt. Crutchfield groaned. Oh, my God. Stonewall Jackson heard and made the ambulance stop. You must do something for Colonel Crutchfield, Doctor. Don't let him suffer. A.P. Hill, riding back to the front, was wounded by a piece of shell. Boswell, the chief engineer, to whom had been entrusted the guidance through the night of the advance upon the roads to the fords, was killed. That was a fatal cannonade from the ridge of Chancellorsville. Fatal and fateful, it continued. The wilderness chanted a battle chant, indeed to the moon, the moon that was pale and wan, as if wearied with silvering battlefields. Hill lying in a litter, just back from his advanced line, dispatched couriers for Stuart. Stuart was far towards Eli's ford, riding through the night in plume and fighting jacket. The straining horses, the recalling order reached him. General Jackson badly wounded. A.P. Hill badly wounded. I in command. My God, man, all changed like that. Right about face. Forward. March. There was that night no gray assault. But the dawn broke clear and found the gray lines waiting. The sky was a glory. The wilderness rolled in emerald waves. The red bird sang. Lee and the Second Corps were yet two miles apart. Between was Chancellorsville, and all the strong entrenchments, and the great blue guns, and Hooker's courageous men. Now followed Jeb Stewart's fight. In the dawn, the Second Corps swung from the right by a master hand, struck full against the Federal Center, struck full against Chancellorsville. In the clear May morning, broke a thunderstorm of artillery. It raged loudly, peal on peal, crash on crash. The gray shells struck the Chancellor House. They set it on fire. It went up in flames. A fragment of shell struck and stunned fighting Joe Hooker. He lay senseless for hours, and Couch took command. 
The gray musketry, the blue musketry, rolled, rolled. The wilderness was on fire. In places, it was like a prairie. The flames licked their way through the scrub. The wounded perished. Ammunition began to fail. Stuart ordered the ground to be held with the bayonet. There was a great attack against his left. His three lines came into one and repulsed it. His right and Anderson's left now touched. The Army of Northern Virginia was again a unit. Stuart swung above his head the hat with the black feather. His beautiful horse danced along the gray lines, the lines that were very grimly determined, the lines that knew now that Stonewall Jackson was badly wounded. They meant the grain lines to make this day and the wilderness remembered. "'Forward charge!' cried Jeb Stuart. "'Remember Jackson!' he swung his plumed hat. "'Yay! Yay! Yay! Yay!' yelled the gray lines and charged. Stuart went at their head, and as he went, he raised in song his golden ringing voice. "'Old Joe Hooker, won't you come out of the wilderness?' By ten o'clock the Chancellor Ridge was taken. The blue gun silenced. Hooker, beaten back toward the Rappahannock. The wilderness, after all, was Virginian. She broke into a war song of triumph. Her flowers bloomed, her birds sang, and then came Lee to the front. Oh, the army of northern Virginia cheered him. Men, men, he said. You have done well, you have done well. Where is General Jackson? He was told. Presently, he wrote a note and sent it to the field hospital near Dowdall's Tavern. General, I cannot express my regret. Could I have directed events, I should have chosen for the good of the country to be disabled in your stead. I congratulate you upon the victory, which is due to your skill and energy. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, R. E. Lee. An aide read it to Stonewall Jackson where he lay, very quiet in the deeps of the wilderness. For a minute he did not speak. Then he said, General Lee is very kind but he should give the praise to God. For four days yet they fought in the wilderness, at Salem Church, at the fords of the Rappahannock, again at Fredericksburg. Then they rested. The Army of the Potomac, back on the northern side of the Rappahannock, the Army of Northern Virginia, holding the southern shore and the road to Richmond. Richmond, no nearer for McDowell, no nearer for McClellan, no nearer for Pope, no nearer for Burnside, no nearer for Hooker, no nearer after two years of war. In the wilderness and thereabouts, Hooker lost 17,000 men, 13 guns, and 1,500 rounds of cannon ammunition, 20,000 rifles, 300,000 rounds of infantry ammunition. The Army of Northern Virginia lost 12,000 men. On the 5th of May, Stonewall Jackson was carefully moved from the wilderness to Guinea Station. Here was a large old residence, the Chandler House. Within a sweep of grass and trees, about it one or two small buildings. The great house was filled, crowded to its doors with wounded soldiers, so they laid Stonewall Jackson in a rude cabin among the trees. The left arm had been amputated in the field hospital. He was thought to be doing well, though at times he complained of the side which, in the fall from the litter, had been struck and bruised. At daylight on Thursday he had his physician called. I am suffering great pain, he said. See what is the matter with me. And presently, is it pneumonia? That afternoon his wife came. He was roused to speak to her, greeted her with love, then sank into something like stupor. From time to time he awakened from this, but there were also times when he was slightly delirious. He gave orders in a shadow of the old voice. You must hold out a little longer, men. You must hold out a little longer. Press forward, press forward press forward. Give them canister, Major Pelham. Friday went by and Saturday. The afternoon of this day, he asked for his chaplain, Mr. Lacey. Later in the twilight, his wife sang to him old hymns that he loved. Sing the 51st Psalm in verse, he said. She sang, show pity, Lord. O oh, Lord, forgive. The night passed and Sunday the 10th dawned. He lay quiet, his right hand on his breast. One of the staff came for a moment to his bedside. Who is preaching at headquarters today? He was told and said, good, I wish I might be there. The officer's voice broke. General, General, the whole army is praying for you. There is a message from General Lee. Yes, yes, give it. He sends you his love. He says that you must recover, that you have lost your left arm, but that he would lose his right arm. He says, tell you, that he prayed for you last night as he had never prayed for himself. He repeats what he said in his note, for that the good of Virginia and the South, he could wish that he were lying here in your place. The soldier on the bed smiled a little and shook his head. Better ten Jacksons should lie here than one Lee. It was sunny weather, fair and sweet. 
with all of the bloom of May, the bright trees waving, the long grass rippling, the waters flowing, the sky azure, bees about the flowers, the birds singing piercingly sweet, Mother Earth so beautiful, the sky down bending the light of the sun so gracious, warm, and vital. A little before noon, kneeling beside him, his wife told Stonewall Jackson that he would die. He smiled and laid his hand upon her bowed head. You are frightened, my child. Death is not so near. I may yet get well. The doctor came to him. Doctor, Anna tells me that I am to die today. Is it so? Oh, General, General, it is so. He lay silent a moment. Then he said, Very good, very good. It is all right. Throughout the day, his mind was now clouded, now clear. In one of the latter times, he said there was something he was trying to remember. There followed a half hour of broken sleep and wandering, in the course of which he spoke a name, Dedrick. Once he said, Horse Artillery, and once White Oak Swamp. The alternate clear moments and the lapses into stupor or delirium were like the sinking or rising of a strong swimmer, exhausted at last, the prey at last of a shoreless sea. At times he came head and shoulders out of the sea. In such a moment he opened his grey-blue eyes full on one of his staff. All the staff was gathered in grief about the bed. When Richard Cleave, he said, asks for a court of inquiry, let him have it. Tell General Lee, the sea drew him under again. It hardly let him go any more. Moment by moment now, it wore out the strong swimmer. The day drew on to afternoon. He lay straight upon the bed, silent for the most part, but now and then wandering a little. His wife bowed herself beside him. In a corner wept the old man Jim. Outside the windows there seemed a hush as of death. Pass the infantry to the front, ordered Stonewall Jackson. Tell A.P. Hill to prepare for action. The voice sank. There came a long silence. There was only heard the old man crying in the corner. Then, for the last time in this phase of being, the great soldier opened his eyes. In a moment he spoke, in a very sweet and calm voice, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. He died. End of section 76. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 77 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 77, A Three Hours Truce at Vicksburg, 1863 by W. H. Tenard of the Confederate Army. The report of a single gun within the breastworks was the signal for a concentrated fire of the enemy's batteries, which poured a perfect storm of shot and shell upon the faded point, resulting usually in the destruction of the battery and killing and wounding numbers of the artillerymen. No less than five cannonries were shot in an attempt to apply a lighted fuse to the vent of a loaded gun. Nearly all the artillery along the lines was dismounted by the furious bombardment of the 22nd. General Grant sent in a flag of truce, asking permission to bury his dead, which were lying unburied in thick profusion outside of the entrenchments, where the enemy had assaulted the lines. General Pemberton refused to grant the request, replying that the battle was not yet decided. The enemy commenced an undermining our parapet, with the intention of blowing it up. As the sound of their voices could be distinctly heard, our brave boys began to annoy them by hurling upon them every species of deadly missile which human ingenuity could invent. Twelve-pounder shells shells were dropped over the breastworks among them, and kegs filled with powder, shells, nails, and scraps of iron. A more deadly, vindictive, and determined species of warfare was never waged. The chief aim of both combatants seemed to be concentrated in the invention of apparatus for taking human life. In the afternoon of May 25th, a flag of truce was sent into the lines, requesting a cessation of hostilities for the purpose of burying the dead, and the request was granted for three hours. Now commenced a strange spectacle in this thrilling drama of war. Flags were displayed along both lines, and the troops thronged the breastworks, gaily chatting with each other, discussing the issues of the war, disputing over the differences of opinion, losses in the fights, etc. Numbers of the Confederates accepted invitations to visit the enemy's lines, where they were hospitably entertained and warmly welcomed. They were abundantly supplied with provisions and supplies of various kinds. Of course, there were numerous laughable and interesting incidents resulting from these visits. The foe were exultant, confident of success, and in high spirits, the Confederates, defiant, undaunted in soul, and equally well assured of a successful defense. The members of the 3rd Regiment found numerous acquaintances and relatives among the Ohio, 
Illinois, and Missouri regiments, and there were mutual regrets that the issues of the war had made them antagonistic in a deadly struggle. Captain F. Gallagher, the worthy commissary of the regiment, had been enjoying the hospitalities of a Yankee officer, imbibing his fine liquors and partaking of his choice viands, and as they separated, the Federal remarked, Good day, Captain. I trust we shall meet soon again in the Union of Old. Captain G., with a peculiar expression on his pleasant face and an extra side poise of his hand, quickly replied, I cannot return your sentiment. The only union which you and I will enjoy, I hope, will be in kingdom come. Goodbye, sir. At the expiration of the appointed time, the men were all back in their places. The stillness which had superseded the uproar of battle seemed strange and unnatural. The hours of peace had scarcely expired ere those who so lately intermingled in friendly intercourse were once again engaged in the deadly struggle. Heavy mortars, artillery of every caliber, and small arms once more with thunder tones awakened the slumbering echoes of the hills surrounding the heroic city of Vicksburg. End of section 77. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 78 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Union Gunboats on the Mississippi. From an Engraving. Painting page 366. Early in 1863, New Orleans and the Mississippi River above Vicksburg were in the hands of the Union. If Vicksburg and Port Hudson could be taken, the whole river would be under the control of the federal government, but it was not easy to take Vicksburg. The city stood on a bluff so high that shot could not be thrown to it from vessels on the river, while the city guns could easily sink any ship that attempted to pass. For three months General Grant and General Sherman tried to get into a position to attack the town. At last they succeeded, and the siege of seven weeks began. Day and night the shells were falling. People dug caves into the side of the hill to be safe from flying fragments. A lady who lived in one of the caves wrote that even the mules in the town seemed wild and the dogs howled madly whenever a shell exploded. By and by the cornbread and bacon failed, and mules, rats, and mice were eaten, but finally the brave, suffering, starving people surrendered. The Confederate flag was hauled down, and the banner of the Union run up. The whole Union army witnessed the scene, but not a cheer was given, says General Grant, so deeply were the courage and endurance of the people respected. A few days later, Port Hudson yielded, and the Mississippi was now controlled by the Union. End of section 78. This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sebastian Levine. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 79, A Drummer Boy at Gettysburg, 1863, by Harry M. Kiefer. Harry, I'm getting tired of this thing. It's becoming monotonous, this thing of being roused every morning at four with orders to pack up and be ready to march at a moment's notice, and then lying around here all day in the sun. I don't believe we're going anywhere, anyhow. We had been encamped for six weeks of which I need give no special account, only saying that in those summer quarters, as they might be called, we went on with our endless drilling, and were baked and browned and thoroughly hardened to the life of a soldier in the field. The monotony of which Andy complained did not end that day, nor the next. For six successive days we were regularly roused at four o'clock in the morning, with orders to pack up and be ready to move immediately, only to unpack as regularly about the middle of the afternoon. We could hear our batteries pounding away in the direction of Fredericksburg, but we did not then know that we were being held to well in hand till the enemy's plan had developed itself into the great march into Pennsylvania, and we were led off in hot pursuit. So, at last, on the 12th of June, 1863, we started, at five o'clock in the morning, in a northwesterly direction. My journal says, Very warm, dust plenty, water scarce, marching very hard. Halted at dusk at an excellent spring, and lay down for the night, with aching limbs and blistered feet. 
I passed over the six days' continuous march that followed, steadily on toward the north, pausing only to relate several incidents that happened by the way. On the 14th, we were racing with the enemy, we being pushed on to the utmost of human endurance, for the possession of the defenses of Washington. From five o'clock of that morning till three the following morning, that is to say, from daylight to daylight, we were hurried along under a burning June sun, with no halt longer than sufficient to recruit our strength with a hasty cup of coffee at noon and nightfall, nine, ten, eleven, twelve o'clock at night, and still on. It was almost more than flesh could endure. Men fell out of line in the darkness for the score, and tumbled over by the roadside, asleep almost before they touched the ground. I remember how a great tall fellow in our company made us laugh along somewhere about one o'clock that morning. Pointer, we called him, an excellent soldier, who afterward fell at his post at Spotsylvania. He had been trudging on in sullen silence for hours, when, all of a sudden, coming to a halt, he brought his piece to order arms on the hard road with the ring, took off his cap, and, in language far more forcible than elegant, began forthwith to denounce both parties to the war, from A to Izzard, in all branches of the service, civil and military, army and navy, artillery, infantry, and cavalry, and demanded that the enemy should come on in full force here and now, and I'll fight them all, single-handed and alone, the whole pack of them. I'm tired of this everlasting marching, and I want to fight. Three cheers for Pointer, cried someone, and we laughed heartily as we toiled doggedly on to Manassas, which we reached at 3 a.m. June 15th. I can assure you, we lost no time in stretching ourselves at full length in the tall summer grass. James McFadden, report to the adjutant for Camp Guard. James McFadden. Anybody know where Jim McFadden is? Now, that was rather hard, wasn't it? To march from daylight to daylight, and lie down for a rest of probably two hours before starting again, and then to be called up to stand throughout those precious two hours on guard duty. I knew very well where McFadden was, for wasn't he lying right beside me in the grass? But just then I was in no humor to tell. The camp might well go without a guard that night, or the orderly might find McFadden in the dark if he could. But the rules were strict, and the punishment was severe, and poor McFadden, bursting into tears of vexation, answered like a man, Here I am, orderly, I'll go. It was hard. Two weeks later, both McFadden and the orderly went where there is neither marching nor standing guard any more. Now comes a long rest of a week in the woods near the Potomac, for we have been marching parallel with the enemy and dare not go too fast, lest, by some sudden and dexterous move in the game, he should sweep past our rear and upon the defenses of Washington. And after this sweet refreshment, we cross the Potomac on pontoons, and march, perhaps with a lighter step since we are nearing home, through the smiling fields and pleasant villages of Maryland, my Maryland. At Poolsville, a little town on the north bank of the Potomac, we smile as we see a lot of children come trooping out of the village school, a merry sight to men who have seen neither woman nor child these six months and more, and a touching sight to many a man in the ranks as he thinks of his little flaxen heads in the faraway home. I think of them now, and think of them full tenderly too, for many a man of you shall never have child climb on his knee any more. As we enter one of those pleasant little Maryland villages, Jefferson by name, we find on the outskirts of the place two young ladies and two young gentlemen, waving the good old flag as we pass, and singing, Rally round the flag, boys! The excitement along the line is intense. Cheer on cheer is given, by regiment after regiment. As we pass along, we drummer boys beating at the colonel's express orders, the old tune, The Girl I Left Behind Me, as a sort of response. Soon we are in among the hills again, and still the cheering goes on in the far distance to the rear. Only ten days later, we passed through the same village again, and were met by the same young ladies and gentlemen, waving the same flag and singing the same song. But though we tried twice, and tried hard, we could not cheer at all. For there's a difference between five hundred men and one hundred, is there not? So that second time, we drooped our tattered flags, and raised our caps in silent and sorrowful salute. Through Middletown next, where rumor reaches us that the enemy's forces have occupied Harrisburg, and where certain ladies, standing on a balcony and waving their handkerchiefs as we pass by, in reply to our colonel's greeting, that we are glad to see so many Union people here, answer, yes, and we are glad to see the Yankee soldiers, too. From Middletown, at six o'clock in the evening, across the mountain to Frederick, on the outskirts of which city we camp for the night. At half-past five next morning, June twenty-ninth, we are up and away, in a drizzling rain, through Lewistown and Mechanicstown, near which latter place we pass a company of Confederate prisoners, twenty-four in number, dressed in well-worn gray and butternut, which makes us think that the enemy cannot be far ahead. After a hard march of twenty-five miles, the greater part of the way over a turnpike, we reach Emmitsburg at nightfall, some of us quite barefoot, and all of us footsore and weary. Next morning, June thirtieth, at nine o'clock, we were up and away again, on the road leading towards Gettysburg, they say. After crossing the line between Maryland and Pennsylvania, where the colonel halts the column for a moment, 
in order that we may give three rousing cheers for the old Keystone State, who march perceptibly slower, as if there were some impediment in the way. There is a feeling among the men that the enemy is somewhere near. Toward noon we leave the public road, and taking across the fields, form in line of battle along the rear of a wood, and pickets are thrown out. There is an air of uncertainty and suspicion in the ranks as we look to the woods, and consider what our pickets may possibly unmask there. But no developments have yet been made when darkness comes, and we bivouac for the night behind a strong stone wall. Passing down along the line of glowing fires in the gathering gloom, I come on one of my company messes, squatting about a fire, cooking supper. Joe Gutelius, corporal and color guard from our company, is superintending the boiling of a piece of meat in a tin can, while Sam Rule and his brother Joe are smoking their pipes nearby. Boys, it begins to look a little dubious, don't it? Where is Jimmy Lucas? He's out on picket in the woods yonder. Yes, Harry, it begins to look a little as if we were about to stir the Johnnies out of the brush, says Joe Gutelius, throwing another rail on the fire. If we do, says Joe Rule, Remember that you have the post of honor, Joe, and if any man pulls down that flag, shoot him on the spot. Never you fear for that, answers Joe Gutelius. We of the color guard will look out for the flag. For my part, I'll stay a dead man on the field before the colors of the 150th are disgraced. You'll have some tough tussling for your colors, then, says Sam. If the Louisiana Tigers get after you once, look out. Who's afraid of the Louisiana Tigers? I'll back the bucktails against the Tigers any day. Stay and take supper with us, Harry. We're going to have a feast tonight. I have the heart of a beef boiling in the can yonder, and it is done now. Sit up, boys, get out your knives and fall too. We're going to have a boiled lion heart for supper, Harry, says Joe Rule with mock apology for the fare. But we couldn't catch any lions. They seem to be scarce in these parts. Maybe we can catch a tiger tomorrow, though. Little do we think, as we sit thus cheerily talking about the blazing fire behind the stone wall, that it is our last supper together, and that ere another nightfall, two of us will be sleeping in the silent bivouac of the dead. Colonel, close up your men and move on as rapidly as possible. It is the morning of July 1st, and we are crossing a bridge over a stream, as the staff officer, having delivered this order for us, dashes down the line to hurry up the regiments in the rear. We get up on a high range of hills, from which we have a magnificent view. The day is bright, the air is fresh and sweet with the scent of the new mown hay, and the sun shines out of an almost cloudless sky, and as we gaze away off yonder down the valley to the left, look, do you see that? A puff of smoke in mid-air! very small and miles away, as the faint and long-coming boom of the exploding shell indicates. But it means that something is going on yonder, away down in the valley, in which, perhaps, we may have a hand before the day is done. See? Another! And another! Faint and far away comes the long-delayed boom, boom, echoing over the hills, as a staff officer dashes along the lines with orders to double-quick, double-quick! Four miles of almost constant double-quicking is no light work at any time, least of all on such a day as this memorable first day of July, for it is hot and dusty. But we are in our own state now, boys, and the battle is opening ahead, and it is no time to save breath. On we go, now up a hill, now over a stream, now checking our headlong rush for a moment, for we must breathe little. But the word comes along the line again, double quick, and we settle down to it with right good will, while the cannon ahead seems to be getting nearer and louder. There is little said in the ranks, for there is little breath for talking, though every man is busy enough thinking. We all feel, somehow, that our day has come at last, as indeed it has. We get in through the outskirts of Gettysburg, tearing down fences of the town lots and outlying gardens as we go. We pass a battery of brass guns drawn up beside the seminary, some hundred yards in front of which building, in a strip of meadow land, we halt, and rapidly form the line of battle. General, shall we unsling knapsacks? shouts some one down the line to our division general, as he is dashing by. Never mind the knapsacks, boys, it's the state now! And he plunges his spurs into the flanks of his horse, as he takes the stake and rider fence at a leap, and it is away. Unfurl the flags, color guard! Now four, double... Colonel, we're not loaded yet! A laugh rungs along the line as, hath the command, Load at will, load! The ramrods make their merry music, and at once the word is given. Forward, double quick! And the line sweeps up that rising ground with banners gaily flying, and cheers that run the air. A sight, once seen, never to be forgotten. I suppose my readers wonder what a drummer boy does in time of battle. Perhaps they have the same idea I used to have, namely, that it is the duty of a drummer boy to beat his drum all the time the battle rages to encourage the men or drown the groans of the wounded. But if they will reflect a moment, they will see that amid the confusion and noise of battle, there is little chance of martial music being either heard or heeded. Our colonel had long ago given us our orders. You drummer boys, in time of an engagement, are to lay aside your drums and take stretchers and help off the wounded. I expect you to do this, and you are to remember that, in doing it, you are just as much helping the battle along as if you were fighting with guns in your hands. And so we sit down there on our drums and watch the line going in with cheers. 
Forthwith we get a smart shelling, for there is evidently somebody else watching that advancing line besides ourselves, but they have elevated their guns a little too much, so that every shell passes quite over the line and ploughs up the meadow sod about us in all directions. Laying aside our knapsacks, we go into the seminary, now rapidly filling with the wounded. This the enemy surely cannot know, or they wouldn't shell the building so hard. We get stretchers at the ambulances, and start out for the line of battle. We can just see our regimental colors waving in the orchard, near a log house about three hundred yards ahead, and we start out for it, I in the lead, and Danny behind. There is one of our batteries drawn up to our left a short distance as we run. It is engaged in a sharp artillery duel with one of the enemies, which we cannot see, although we can hear it plainly enough, and straight between the two our road lies. So up we go, Danny and I, at a lively trot, dodging the shells as best we can, till, panting for breath, we set down our stretcher under an apple tree in the orchard, in which, under the brow of the hill, we find the regiment lying, one or two companies being out on the skirmish line ahead. I count six men of Company C lying yonder in the grass, killed, they say, by a single shell. Close beside them lies a tall, magnificently built man, whom I recognize by his uniform as belonging to the Iron Brigade, and therefore probably an Iowa boy. He lies on his back at full length, with his musket beside him, calm-looking as if asleep, but having a fatal blue mark on his forehead and the ashen pallor of death on his countenance. Andy calls me away for a moment to look after some poor fellow whose arm is off at the shoulder, and it was just time I got away, too, for immediately a shell plunges into the sod where I had been sitting, tearing my stretcher to tatters, and plowing up a great furrow under one of the boys who had been sitting immediately behind me, and who thinks, that was rather close shaving, wasn't it now? The bullets whistling overhead make pretty music with their ever-varying zip, we could imagine them so many bees, only they have such a terribly sharp sting. They tell me, too, of a certain cavalryman, Dennis Buckley, 6th Michigan Cavalry it was, as I afterward learned, let history preserve the brave boy's name, who, having had his horse shot under him, and seen that first-named shell explode in Company C with such disaster, exclaimed, That is the company for me! He remained with the regiment all day, doing good service with his carbine, and he escaped unhurt. Here they come, boys. We'll have to go and add em on a charge, I guess. Creeping close around the corner of the log house, I can see the long lines of grey sweeping up in fine style over the fields, but I feel the colonel's hand on my shoulder. Keep back, my boy. No use exposing yourself in that way. As I get back behind the house and look around, an old man is seen approaching our line through the orchard in the rear. He is dressed in a long blue swallow-tailed coat and high silk hat. Coming up to the colonel, he asks, Would you let an old chap like me have a chance to fight in your ranks, colonel? Can you shoot? inquires the colonel. Oh, yes, I can shoot, I reckon, says he. But where are your cartridges? I've got em here, sir, says the old man, slapping his hand on his trousers pocket. And so old John Burns, of whom every schoolboy has heard, takes his place in the line, and loads and fires with the best of them, and is left wounded and insensible on the field when the day is done. Reclining there under a tree while the skirmishing is going on in front, and the shells are tearing up the sod around us, I observe how evidently hard-pressed is that battery yonder in the edge of the wood about fifty yards to our right. The enemy's batteries have excellent range on the poor fellows serving it and when the smoke lifts or rolls away in great clouds, for a moment we can see the men running, and ramming, and sighting and firing, and swabbing, and changing position every few minutes, to throw the enemy's guns out of range a little. The men are becoming terribly few, and nevertheless their guns, with a rapidity that seems unabated, belch forth great clouds of smoke, and send the shells shrieking over the plain. Meanwhile, events occur which give us something more to think of than mere skirmishing and shelling. Our beloved Brigadier General, Roy Stone, Stepping out a moment to reconnoitre the enemy's position and movements, is seen by some sharpshooter off in a tree, and is carried, severely wounded, into the barn. Our colonel, Langhorn Wister, assumes command of the brigade. Our regiment, facing westward, while the line on our right faces to the north, is observed to be exposed to an enfilading fire from the enemy's guns, as well as from the long line of grey now appearing in full sight on our right. So our regiment must form in line and charge front forward, in order to come in line with the other regiments. Accomplished swiftly, this new movement brings our line at once face to face with the enemy's, which advances to within fifty yards and exchanges a few volleys, but is soon checked and staggered by our fire. Yet now, see, away to our left and consequently on our flank, a new line appears, rapidly advancing out of the woods a half mile away, and there must be some quick and sharp work done now, boys, or between the old foes in front and the new ones on our flank we shall be annihilated. To clear us of these old assailants in front before the new line can swoop down on our flank, our brave colonel, and a ringing command orders a charge along the whole line. Then, before the gleaming and bristling bayonets of our bucktail brigade as it yells and cheers, sweeping resistlessly over the field, the enemy gives way and flies in confusion. But there is little time to watch them fly, for that new line on our left is approaching at a rapid pace, 
and, with shells falling thick and fast into our ranks, and men dropping everywhere, a regiment must reverse the former movement by changing front to rear, and so resume its original position, facing westward, for the enemy's new line is approaching from that direction, and if it takes us in the flank, we are done for. To change front to rear is a difficult movement to execute even on drill, much more so under severe fire, but it is executed now, steadily and without confusion, yet not a minute too soon, for the new line of grey is upon us in a mad tempest of lead, supported by a cruel artillery fire almost before our line can steady itself to receive the shock. However, partially protected by a post and rail fence, we answer fiercely, and with effect so terrific that the enemy's line wavers, and at length moves off by the right flank, giving us a breathing space for a time. During this struggle, there have been many an exciting scene all along the line, as it swayed backward and forward over the field, scenes which we have had no time to mention yet. See yonder, where the colors of the regiment on our right, our sister regiment, the 149th, have been advanced a little, to draw the enemy's fire, while our line sweeps on to the charge. There ensues about the flags a wild melee and close hand-to-hand -hand encounter. Some of the enemy have seized the colors, and are making off with them in triumph, shouting victory. But a squad of our own regiment dashes out swiftly, led to the rescue of the stolen colors by Sergeant John C. Kensill, of Company F, who falls to the ground before reaching them, and amid yells and cheers and smoke you see the battle flags rise and fall, and sway hither and thither upon the surging mass, as if tossed on the billows of a tempest, until wretched away by strong arms, they are borne back in triumph to the line of the 149th. See yonder again! Our colonel is clapping his hand to his cheek, from which a red stream is pouring. Our lieutenant colonel, Henry S. Hood Coper, is kneeling on the ground, and is having his handkerchief tied around his arm at the shoulder. Major Thomas Chamberlain and Adjutant Richard L. Ashurst both lie low, pierced with balls through the chest. One lieutenant is waving his sword to his men, although his leg is crushed at the knee. Three other officers of the line are laying over there, motionless now, forever. All over the field are strewn men, wounded or dead, and comrades pause a moment in the mad rush to catch the last words of the dying. Incidents such as these the reader must imagine for himself, to fill in these swift sketches of how the day was won, and lost. Ay, lost, for the balls which have so far come mainly from our front begin now to sing in from our left and right, which means that we are being flanked. Somehow, away off to our right, a half mile or so, our line has given way and is already on retreat through the town, while our left is being driven in, and we ourselves may shortly be surrounded and crushed, and so the retreat is sounded. Back now along the railroad cut we go, or through the orchard in the narrow strip of woods behind it, with our dead scattered around on all sides, and the wounded crying piteously for help. Harry! Harry! It is a faint cry of a dying man yonder in the grass, and I must see who it is. Why, Willie! Tell me where you are hurt, I ask kneeling down beside him, and I see the words come hard, for he is fast dying. Here on my side, Harry, tell mother, mother. Poor fellow, he can say no more. His head falls back, and Willie is at rest forever. Ah, now, through that strip of woods, at the other edge of which, with my back against a stout oak, I stop and look at a beautiful and thrilling sight. Some reserves are being brought up, infantry in the center, the colors flying and officers shouting cavalry on the right, with sabers flashing and horses on a trot, artillery on the left with guns at full gallop sweeping into position to check the headlong pursuit. It is a grand sight and a fine rally, but a vain one. For in an hour we are swept off the field, and are in full retreat through the town. Up through the streets hurries the remnant of our shattered corps, while the enemy is pouring into the town only a few squares away from us. There is a tempest of shrieking shells and whistling balls about our ears. The guns of that battery by the woods we have dragged along, all the horses being disabled. The artillery men load as we go, double-charging with grape and canister. Make way there, men, is the cry, and the surging mass crowds close up on the sidewalks to right and left, leaving a long lane down the center of the street through which the grape and canister go rattling into the ranks of the enemy's advance guard. And so, amid scenes which I have neither space nor power to describe, we gain Cemetery Ridge toward sunset, and throw ourselves down by the road in a tumult of excitement and grief, having lost the day through the overwhelming force of numbers, and yet somehow having gained it, too, although, as yet we know it had not, for the sacrifice of our corps has saved the position for the rest of the army, which has been marching all day and which comes pouring in over Cemetery Ridge all night long. Aye, the position is saved, but where is our corps? Well may our division general, Doubleday, who early in the day succeeded to the command, when our brave Reynolds had fallen, shed tears of grief as he sits there on his horse and looks over the shattered remains of that first army corps, for there is but a handful of it left. Of the five hundred and fifty men that marched under our regimental colors in the morning, 
but one hundred remain. All our field and staff officers are gone. Of some twenty captains and lieutenants, but one is left without a scratch, while of my own company only thirteen out of fifty-four sleep that night on Cemetery Ridge, under the open canopy of heaven. There is no roll call, for Sergeant Wade and Saul will call the roll no more. Nor will Joe Gutelius, nor Joe Rule, nor McFadden, nor Henning, nor many others of our comrades whom we miss, ever answer to their names again, until the world's last great reveille. End of section 79. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sebastian Levine. Section 80 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 80. John Burns of Gettysburg, 1863 by Brett Hart. Have you heard the story that gossips tell of Burns of Gettysburg? No? Ah, well. Brief is the glory that hero earns, briefer the story of poor John Burns. He was the fellow who won renown, the only man who didn't back down when the rebels rode through his native town but held his own in the fight next day when all his townsfolk ran away that was in july sixty three the very day that general lee flower of southern chivalry baffled and beaten backward reeled from a stubborn mead and a barren field i might tell how but the day before john burns stood at his cottage door looking down the village street where in the shade of his peaceful vine he heard the low of his gathered kine and felt their breath with incense sweet or i might say when the sunset burned the old farm gable he thought it turned the milk that fell like a babbling flood into the milk pale red as blood or how he fancied the hum of bees were bullets buzzing among the trees but all such fanciful thoughts as these were strange to a practical man like burns who minded only his own concerns troubled no more by fancies fine than one of his calm-eyed long-tailed kine slow to argue but quick to act that was the reason as some folks say he fought so well on that terrible day and it was terrible on the right rage for hours the heady fight thundered the battery's double bass difficult music for men to face while on the left where now the graves undulate like the living waves that all that day unceasing swept up to the pits the rebels kept round shot ploughed the upland glades sown with bullets reaped with blades shattered fences here and there tossed their splinters in the air the very trees were stripped and bare the barns that once held yellow grain were heaped with harvests of the slain the cattle bellowed on the plain the turkeys screamed with might and main and brooding barnfowl left their rest with strange shells bursting in each nest just where the tide of battle turns erect and lonely stood old john burns how do you think the man was dressed he wore an ancient long buff vest yellow as saffron but his best and buttoned over his manly breast was a bright blue coat with a rolling collar and large gilt buttons size of a dollar with tails that the country folk call swaller he wore a broad brim bell crowned hat white as the locks on which it sat never had such a sight been seen for forty years on the village green since old john burns was a country beau and went to the quiltings long ago close at his elbows all that day veterans of the peninsula sunburnt and bearded charged away and striplings downy of lip and shin clerks at the home guard mustered in glanced as they passed at the hat he wore then at the rifle his right hand bore 
and hailed him from out their youthful lore with scraps of slangy repertoire how are you white hat put her through your head's level and bully for you called him daddy begged he disclose the name of the tailor who made his clothes and what was the value he set on those while burns unmindful of jeer and scoff stood there picking the rebels off with his long brown rifle and bell-crowned hat and the swallow tails they were laughing at twas but a moment for that respect which clothes all courage their voices checked and something the wildest could understand spake in the old man's strong right hand and his corded throat and the lurking frown of his eyebrows under the old bell crown until as they gazed there crept an awe through the ranks in whispers and some men saw in the antique vestments and long white hair the past of the nation in battle there and some of the soldiers since declare that the gleam of his old white hat afar like the crested plume of the brave navarre that day was their oriflamme of war so raged the battle you know the rest how the rebels beaten and backward pressed broke at the final discharge and ran at which john burns a practical man shouldered his rifle and bent his brows and then went home to his bees and cows that is the story of old john burns this is the moral the reader learns in fighting the battle the question's whether you'll show a hat that's white or a feather End of section 80. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone. Section 81 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. Delivered at the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery, November 19th. 1863. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honoured dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. End of section 81. This recording is in the public domain. Section 82 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 82. Alabama Dressmaking in the Days of the Blockade, 1861-1865. through 1865, By Parthenia Antoinette Haig. 
Before the war, there were in the South but few cotton mills. These were kept running night and day as soon as the Confederate Army was organized, and we were ourselves prevented by the blockade from purchasing clothing from the factories at the North or clothing imported from France or England. The cotton which grew in the immediate vicinity of the mills kept them well supplied with raw material. Yet, notwithstanding the great push of the cotton mills, they proved totally inadequate after the war began to our vast need for clothing of every kind. Every household now became a miniature factory in itself, with its cotton, cards, spinning wheels, warping frames, looms, and so on. Wherever one went, the hum of the spinning wheel and the clang of the batten of the loom was borne on the ear. Great trouble was experienced in the beginning to find dyes with which to color our stuffs, but in the course of time, both at the old mills and at smaller experimental factories which were run entirely by hand, barks, leaves, roots, and berries were found containing coloring properties. I was well acquainted with a gentleman in southwestern Georgia who owned a small cotton mill, and who, when he wanted coloring substances, used to send his wagons to the woods and freight them with a shrub known as myrtle that grew teeming in low, moist places near his mill. This myrtle yielded a nice gray for woolen goods. That the slaves might be well clad, the owners kept, according to the number of slaves owned, a number of Negro women carding and spinning and had looms running all the time. Now and then a planter would be so fortunate as to secure a bale or more of white sheeting and Osnobergs from the cotton mills in exchange for farm products, which would be quite a lift, and give a little breathing spell from the almost incessant whir, hum, and clang of the spinning wheel and loom. Wide, unbleached sheeting was also used for making dresses, and when dyed a deep, solid color and tastefully made up, the effect was quite handsome. On one occasion, when Mr. G. had been fortunate in getting a bale of unbleached factory sheeting, Mrs. G. gave to me, to her two oldest daughters and a niece of hers, who was as one of the family, enough of the sheeting to make each one of us a dress. We had to hie us to the woods for coloring matter, to dye as each one pleased. I have often joined with neighbors, when school hours for the day were over, in gathering roots, barks, leaves, twigs, sumac berries, and walnuts for the holes, which dyed wool a beautiful dark brown. Such was the variety we had to choose from to dye our cloth and thread. We used to pull our way through the deep, tangled woods by thickly shaded streams through broad fields and return laden with the riches of the southern forest. Not infrequently, clusters of grapes mingled with our freight of dyes. The pine tree's roots furnished a beautiful dye, approximating very close to garnet, which color I chose for the sheeting for my dress. A strong decoction of the roots of the pine tree was used. Caparis of our own production was used as the mordant. A cask or some small vessel was set convenient to the dwelling house and partly filled with water, in which a small quantity of salt and vinegar had been mingled. Then pieces of rusty useless iron, such as plows too much worn to be used again, rusty broken nails, old horseshoes, and bits of old chains were picked up and cast into the cask. The liquid caparis was always ready, and a very good substance we found it to fix colors in cloth or thread. The sheeting for the dress was folded smoothly and basted slightly so as to keep the folds in place. It was first thoroughly soaked in warm soap suds, then dipped into the dye, and afterwards into a vessel containing liquid lye from wood ashes. Then it went again into the dye, then the lye, and so on till the garnet color was the required shade. By varying the strength of the solution, any shade desirable could be obtained. My garnet-colored dress of unbleached sheeting was often mistaken for worsted delaine. Many of the planters in southern Alabama began to grow wool on quite a large scale as the war went on, and no woolen goods could be had. All the woolen material that could be manufactured at the cotton mills was used to clothe our soldiers, so that all the varied kinds of woolen goods that hitherto had been used with us had now to be of home handmake. In this we achieved entire success. All kinds of woolen goods, flannels both colored and white, plaids of bright colors which we thought equal to the famed Scotch plaids, Balmorals which were then in fashion, were woven with grave or gay borders as suited our fancy. Woolen coverlets and blankets were also manufactured. The woolen blankets were at first woven with the warp of cotton thread, but a woman of our settlement improved on that by weaving some blankets on the common house loom, both warp and woof of wool, spun by her own hands. 
the borders were bright red and blue of texture soft and yielding they were almost equal to those woven at a regular woolen mill the process of weaving all wool blankets with warp and woof hand spun was quite tedious yet it was accomplished various kinds of twilled woolen cloth were also woven in weaving coverlets the weaver had the draft before her to guide her in tramping the petals and throwing the design of flower vine leaf square or diamond on the right side beautiful carpets were also made on the same plan as coverlets many of the planters after the shearing of their sheep used to carry the wool to the nearest cotton mill and have it carted into rolls to facilitate the making of woolen cloth and often large quantities of lint cotton were hauled to the factories to be carted into rolls to be spun at home but carting rolls by common hand cards was a rather slow and tiresome process there was some pleasant rivalry as to who should be the most successful in producing the brightest and clearest tinge of color on thread or cloth most of the women of southern alabama had small plats of ground for cultivating the indigo bush for making indigo blue or indigo mud as it was sometimes called the indigo weed also grew abundantly in the wild state in our vicinage those who do not care to bother with indigo cultivation used to gather from the woods the weed in the wild state when in season enough of the blue was always made either from the wild or cultivated indigo plant we used to have our regular indigo churnings as they were called when the weed had matured sufficiently for making the blue mud which was about the time the plant began to flower the plants were cut close to the ground our steeping vats were closely packed with the weed and water enough to cover the plant was poured in the vat was then left eight or nine days undisturbed for fermentation to extract the dye then the plant was rinsed out so to speak and the water in the vat was churned up and down with a basket for quite a while weak lye was added as a precipitate which caused the indigo particles held in solution to fall to the bottom of the vat the water was poured off and the mud was placed in a sack and hung up to drip and dry it was just as clear and bright a blue as if it had passed through a more elaborate process the woods as well as being the great storehouse for all our dye stuffs were also our drug stores the berries of the dogwood tree were taken for quinine as they contained the alkaloid properties of cinchona and peruvian bark a soothing and efficacious cordial for dysentery and similar ailments was made from blackberry roots but ripe persimmons when made into a cordial were thought to be far superior to blackberry roots an extract of the barks of the wild cherry dogwood poplar and wahoo trees was used for chills and agues for coughs and all lung diseases a syrup was made with the leaves and roots of the mullein plant globe flower and wild cherry tree bark was thought to be infallible of course the castor bean plant was gathered in the wild state in the forest for making castor oil many also cultivated a few rows of poppies in their garden to make opium from which our laudanum was created and this at times was very needful the manner of extracting opium from poppies was of necessity crude in our hedged round situation it was indeed simple in the extreme the heads or bulbs of the poppies were plucked when ripe the capsules pierced with a large sized sewing needle and the bulbs placed in some small vessel a cup or saucer would answer for the opium gum to exude and to become insipated by evaporation the soporific influence of this drug was not excelled by that of the imported article by carbonate of soda which had been in use for raising bread before the war became a thing of the past soon after the blockade began but it was not long ere someone found out that the ashes of corn cobs possessed the alkaline property essential for raising dough whenever soda was needed corn was shelled care being taken to select all the red cobs as they were thought to contain more carbonate of soda than white cobs when the cobs were burned in a clean swept place the ashes were gathered up and placed in a jar or jug and so many measures of water were poured in according to the quantity of ashes when needed for bread making a teaspoonful or tablespoonful of the alkali was used to the measure of flour or meal required another industry to which the need of the times gave rise was the making of pottery which although not food or clothing was indispensable of course our earthenware was rough coarse and brown and its enameling would have caused a smile of disdain from the ancient etruscans nevertheless we found our brown glazed plates cups and saucers washbowls and pitchers and milk crocks exceedingly convenient and useful as temporary expedients as no tin pans could be had and we were thankful that we could make this homely ware all in our settlement learned to card spin and weave 
and that was the case with all the women in the South when the blockade closed us in. Now and then, it is true, a steamer would run the blockade, but the few articles in the line of merchandise that reached us served only as a reminder of the outside world, and of our once great plenty, now almost forgotten, and also more forcibly to remind us that we must depend on our own ingenuity to supply the necessities of existence. Our days of novitiate were short. We soon became very apt at knitting and crocheting useful as well as ornamental woolen notions, such as capes, sacks, van dykes, shawls, gloves, socks, stockings, and men's suspenders. The clippings of lamb's wool were especially used by us for crocheting or knitting shawls, gloves, capes, sacks, and hoods. Our needles for such knitting were made of seasoned hickory or oak wood a foot long or even longer. Lamb's wool clippings, when carded and spun fine by hand and dyed bright colors, were almost the peer of the zephyr wool now sold. To have the hanks spotted or variegated, they were tightly braided or plaited and so dyed. When the braids were unfolded, a beautiful dappled color would result. Sometimes corn husks were wrapped around the hanks at regular or irregular spaces and made fast with strong thread, so that when placed in the dye the encased parts, as was intended, would imbibe little or no dye, and when knit, crocheted, or woven, would present a clouded or dappled appearance. Handsome mittens were knit or crocheted of the same lamb's wool dyed jet black, gray, garnet, or whatever color was preferred. A bordering of vines with green leaves and rosebuds of bright colors was deftly knitted in on the edge and top of the gloves. Various designs of flowers or other patterns were used for gloves and were so skillfully knitted in that they formed the exact representation of the copy from which they were taken. For the bordering of capes, shawls, gloves, hoods, and sacks, the wool yarn was dyed red, blue, black, and green. Of course, intermediate colors were employed in some cases. The juice of pokeberries dyed a red as bright as aniline, but this was not very good for wash stuffs. A strong decoction of the bark of the hickory tree made a clear, bright green on wool, when alum could be had as mordant. Sometimes there were those who, by some odd chance, happened to have a bit of alum. There grew in some spots in the woods, though very sparsely, a weed about a foot and a half high called the Queen's Delight, which dyed a jet black on wool. We have frequently gone all of two miles from our home, and after a wide range of the woods, would perhaps secure only a small armful of this precious weed. We did not wonder at the name, it was so scarce and rare, as well as the only one of all the weeds, roots, barks, leaves, or berries that would dye jet black. The indigo blue of our make would dye blue of almost any shade required, and the hulls of walnuts a most beautiful brown, so that we were not lacking for bright and deep colors for borderings. Here again a pleasant rivalry arose, as to who could form the most unique bordering for capes, shawls, and all such woolen knit or crocheted clothing. There were squares, diamonds, crosses, bars, and designs of flowers formed in knitting and in crocheting. We were our own wool sorters, too, and after the shearing had our first choice of the fleeces. All the fine, soft, silky locks of wool were selected for use in knitting and crocheting. Our shoes, particularly those of women and children, were made of cloth or knit. Someone had learned to knit slippers, and it was not long before most of the women in our settlement had a pair of slippers on the knitting needles. They were knit of our homespun thread, either cotton or wool, which was, for slippers, generally dyed a dark brown, gray, or black. When taken off the needles, the slippers or shoes were lined with cloth of suitable texture. The upper edges were bound with strips of cloth of color to blend with the hue of the knitwork. A rosette was formed of some stray bits of ribbon or scraps of fine bits of merino or silk and placed on the uppers of the slippers. Then they were ready for the soles. We explored the seldom visited attic and lumber room and overhauled the contents of old trunks, boxes, and scrap bags for pieces of casimir, merino, broadcloth, or other heavy fine twilled goods to make our Sunday shoes as we could not afford to wear shoes of such fine stuff every day. Home-woven jeans and heavy plain cloth had to answer for everyday wear. When one was so fortunate as to get a bolt of Osnaburgs, scraps of that made excellent shoes when colored. What is now called the baseball shoe always reminds me of our wartime colored Osnaburgs, but ours did not have straps of leather like those which crossed the baseball shoe. Our slippers and shoes, which were made of fine bits of cloth, cost us a good deal of labor in binding and stitching with colors and thread to blend with the material used before they were sent to the shoemaker to have them sold. 
Sometimes we put on the soles ourselves by taking worn-out shoes, whose soles were thought sufficiently strong to carry another pair of uppers, ripping the soles off, placing them in warm water to make them more pliable and to make it easier to pick out all the old stitches, and then, in the same perforations, stitching our knit slippers or cloth-made shoes. We also had to cut out soles for shoes from our home tanned leather with the sole of an old shoe as our pattern, and with an awl perforate the sole for sewing on the upper. I was often surprised at the dexterity with which we could join soles and uppers together, the shoes being reversed during the stitching, and when finished, turned right side out again. And I smile even now as I remember how we used to hold our self-made shoe at arm's length and say as they were inspected, what is the blockade to us, so far as shoes are concerned, when we can not only knit the uppers but cut the soles and stitch them on? Each woman and girl her own shoemaker. Away with bought shoes, we want none of them. But alas, we really knew not how fickle a few months would prove that we were. Our sewing thread was of our own make. Spools of coats thread, which was universally used in the South before the war, had long been forgotten. For very fine sewing thread, great care had to be used in drawing the strand of cotton evenly as well as finely. It was a wearisome task, and great patience had to be exercised, as there was continual snapping of the fine hand-spun thread. From brooches of such spun sewing thread, balls of the cotton were wound, from two to three strands double, according as how coarse or fine thread was needed. The ball was then placed into a bowl of warm soap suds, and the thread twisted onto a bobbin of corn husks placed on the spindle of the wheel. During the process of twisting the thread, a miniature fountain would be set playing from the thread as it twirled upon the spindle. Bunch thread from the cotton mill, number 12, made very strong sewing thread, but little could we afford of that, it was exceedingly scarce. When the web of cloth, especially that of factory bunch thread, had been woven as closely up as the sleigh and harness could permit the warp openings for the shuttle to pass through, the ends of the weaver's threads, or thrums, generally a yard long when taken from around the large cloth beam, would be cut from the cloth and made into sewing thread. We spent many evenings around the fire if winter time, or lamp if summer weather, drawing the threads singly from the bunch of thrums and then tying together two or three strands, as the thread was to be coarse or fine. It was also wound into balls and twisted in the same manner as other sewing thread. The ball would be full of knots, but a good needleful of thread, perhaps more, could always be had in between the knots. There were rude frames in most people's yards for making rope out of cotton thread, spun very coarse, and quite a quantity of such rope was made on these roperies. A comical incident occurred at one of the rope makings which I attended. One afternoon I had gone out in the yard with several members of the household to observe the method of twisting the long coil of rope by a windlass attached to one end of the frame after it had been run off the brooches onto the frame. Two of the smaller girls were amusing themselves running back and forth under the rope while it was being slowly twisted, now and then giving it a tap with their hands as they ducked under it, when, just as it was drawn to its tightest tension, it parted from the end of the frame opposite the windlass, and in its curved rebound caught one of the little girls by the hair of her head. There was music in the air for some little time, for it was quite a task to free her hair from the hard, twisted coils of rope. Our hats and bonnets were of our own manufacture. For those we had at the beginning of the war had been covered anew, made over, turned and changed until none of the original remained. As we had no flowers of sulfur to bleach our white straw bonnets and hats, we colored those we had with walnut hulls and made them light or dark brown as we wished. Then we ripped up our tarlatan party dresses of red, white, blue, or buff, some all gold and silver bespangled, to trim hats with. Neighbor would divide with neighbor the tarlatan for trimming purposes and some would go quite a distance for only enough to trim a hat. For the plumes of our hats or bonnets, the feathers of the old drake answered admirably, and were often plucked, as many will remember, for that very purpose. Quaker or shaker bonnets were also woven by the women of Alabama out of the bulrushes that grew very tall in marshy places. Those rushes were placed in the opening of the threads of warp by hand, and were woven the same as if the shuttle had passed them through. Those the width of the warp were always used. The bonnets were cut in shape and lined with tarlatan. The skirt of the shaker was made of single slayed cloth, as we called it. In common woven heavy cloth, two threads of warp were passed through the reeds of the sleigh. For the skirts of our bonnets, we wanted the cloth soft and light. Hence, only one thread was passed through the reeds, and that was lightly tapped by the batten. 
It was then soft and yielding. When the cloth was dyed with willow bark, which colored a beautiful drab, we thought our bonnets equal to those we had bought in days gone by. There was variety enough of material to make hats for both men and women, palmetto taking the lead for hats for Sunday wear. The straw of oats or wheats and corn husks were braided and made into hats. Hats, which were almost everlasting, we used to think, were made of pine straw. Hats were made of cloth also. I remember one in particular of gray jeans, stitched in small diamonds with black silk thread. It was as perfect a hat as was ever molded by the hatter, but the oddness of that hat consisted in its being stitched on the sewing machine with silk thread. All sewing machines in our settlement were at a standstill during the period of the war, as our homemade thread was not suited to machines, and all sewing had to be done by hand. We also became quite skilled in making designs of palmetto and straw braiding and plaiting for hats. Fans, baskets, and mats we made of the braided palmetto, and straw also. Then there was the bonnet squash, known also as the Spanish dish rag, that was cultivated by some for making bonnets and hats for women and children. Such hats presented a fine appearance, but they were rather heavy. Many would make the frame for their bonnets or hats, then cover it with the small white feathers and down of the goose, color bright red with the juice of pokeberries, or blue with indigo mud, some of the larger feathers, and on a small wire form a wreath or plume with bright colored and white feathers blended together, or if no wire was convenient, a fold or two of heavy cloth or paper doubled was used to sew the combination of feathers on for wreath, plume, or rosette. Tastefully arranged, this made a hat or bonnet by no means rustic looking. End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 83 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Meg Huskin. General Order Number 11 by G. C. Brigham. Painting, page 390. During the Civil War, it was in the border states that the struggle was waged with the greatest ferocity. Missouri had been with difficulty retained by the North, but it was the scene of the operations of several guerrilla bands of Southern sympathizers. In August 1863, Quantrell, the most notorious of the guerrilla leaders, with a company of 300 men, swept across the Kansas border into the abolition town of Lawrence, pillaged and burned the settlement, and killed 140 of its inhabitants. When news of this raid reached Schofield, the Union commander, he wrote General Ewing that since these deeds were connived at by Confederate sympathizers in certain parts of Missouri, quote, it is therefore ordered that the disloyal people of Jackson, Cass, and Bates counties will be given until the blank day of blank to remove from those counties with such of their personal property as they may choose to carry away. At the end of the time named, all houses, barns, provisions, and other property belonging to such disloyal persons, and which can be used to shelter, protect, or support the bands of robbers and murderers which infest those counties, will be destroyed or seized and appropriated to the use of the government. Property situated at or near military posts and in or near towns which can be protected by troops so as not to be used by the bands of robbers will not be destroyed, but will be appropriated to the use of such loyal or innocent persons as may be made homeless by the acts of guerrillas or by the execution of this order. The commanding general is aware that some innocent persons must suffer from these extreme measures, but such suffering is unavoidable and will be made as light as possible. A district of country inhabited almost solely by rebels cannot be permitted to be made a hiding place for robbers and murderers from which to sally forth on their errands of rapine and death." End quote. General Order No. 11, to this effect, was immediately issued by Brigadier General Ewing to be carried out within 15 days. End of Section 83 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Meg Huskin
section eighty four of the united states read for librivox dot org by jim locke the united states volume two part twelve the end of the struggle historical note in eighteen sixty four lincoln was re-elected to the presidency by two hundred and twelve votes as against twenty-one for mcclellan his opponent whose platform declared that the war was a failure and should be ended in his inaugural address delivered in march eighteen sixty five lincoln said neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding with malice towards none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives us to see the right let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphans to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations the end of the war was close at hand sherman with sixty thousand men had marched from atlanta to savannah cutting a swath sixty miles wide and three hundred in length and destroying the last resources of the confederacy lee's ranks were thinning for in the utter hopelessness of his cause men were deserting by scores he could no longer protect richmond and he withdrew pursued by grant at appomattox court house a little village west of richmond lee surrendered on april ninth eighteen sixty five two weeks later johnston surrendered to sherman in north carolina thus ended the war but the heartfelt joy throughout the north was turned into mourning by the assassination of president lincoln on the fourteenth of april end of section eighty four this recording is in the public domain Section eighty five of the United States read for LibriVox dot org by Adrian Stevens. The Battle of the Crater, Petersburg by J. D. Woodward, painting, page four zero six. After his bloody repulse at Cold Harbor, Grant ordered an advance upon Petersburg, as the capture of that city would force the evacuation of Richmond the unionists moved slowly the confederates quickly and when the former reached petersburg they found it strongly fortified after losing ten thousand men in several assaults grant settled down for a siege a mine five hundred and twenty feet long was dug under the confederate works and exploded on july thirtieth with terrific force an officer who witnessed the explosion thus describes its effect Quote, it was a magnificent spectacle as the mass of earth went up into the air carrying with it men guns carriages and timbers and spread out like an immense cloud as it reached its altitude so close were the union lines that the mass appeared as if it would descend immediately upon the troops waiting to make the charge little did those men anticipate what they would see upon arriving there at the crater an enormous hole in the ground about thirty feet deep sixty feet wide and a hundred and seventy feet long filled with dust great blocks of clay guns broken carriages projecting timbers and men buried in various ways some up to their necks others to their waists and some with only their feet and legs protruding from the earth End quote. 
A regiment of Confederates was destroyed by the explosion, but the Union troops, who poured into the crater, expecting that the works could now be easily taken, were signally disappointed, as the Confederates quickly rallied and drove them back after a desperate struggle, with a loss of more than 4,000 men. End of section 85. This recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 86. The Day of the Evacuation of Richmond, 1865, by Morris Schaff. Sunday, and the bells were calling the people to worship. Old and noted Richmond families uncovered at the door and reverently sought their pews at St. Paul's. Seven out of ten of the women were in mourning. In the solemn quiet sat the aged fathers, their hair falling white, and many a mother with high-bred face sorrowing for the boys who would never come home. There, in the subdued light of the sanctuary, they sat, while the bells, which had clanged so joyfully at the birth of the Confederacy, reluctantly and sadly boomed their final notes, as if they already knew what the congregation little expected, that when they should ring again on the next Sunday at that very hour, the Confederacy would be on its deathbed, breathing its last. Jefferson Davis, president of the ill-fated cause above middle height, lithe, distinguished, neatly arrayed in gray, came up the center aisle with modest, dignified quietude of manner, entered his pew on the right, and bowed his head in prayer. His spare, austere face showed the effects of four years of care, as well it might, for whoever faced a longer and fiercer tempest, but he carried with him to St. Paul's, as everywhere, his habitual atmosphere of invincible courage and the never-failing bloom of urbanity. The organ droned the last of the colorless vinetti, and the service began. Along the sunshiny side of the empty streets, here and there, convalescents from the hospital sauntered, pale, some armless and some on crutches. On its staff above the roof of the nearby capital, the flag of the Confederacy drooped in the mild sunshine, the stars of its blue saltier shining from its folds above steeple and chimney, and over the springtime gladness of the fields out in hollywood where stuart lay with so many of the best and the bravest and where mr davis's dust is now resting the robins sparrows catbirds redbirds turtle doves and mockingbirds were building their nests among the evergreens and native trees over the rapids at the foot of the knolls of hollywood the stately james flowed murmuring by the shores of belle isle and the baleful walls of libby prison from whose dreary grated windows looked hollow-eyed, half-starved northern prisoners of war, who, as they heard the bells of Richmond ringing, no doubt recalled the bells of home and longed for release and peace. It was Communion Sunday, and the sacred elements covered with a white cloth were on the table. Dr. Charles Mingerode, the rector of St. Paul's, a diminutive, fervid, transplanted German, was delivering his usual tense, extemper address, when the sexton, a portly man, with ruffles at his wrist and bosom, and polished brass buttons on a faded suit of blue, advanced up the aisle with soft but stately tread, and after touching the president on the shoulder with solemnity becoming his station and his one day in the week lofty importance, condescendingly handed him a message. Mr. Davis threw his blue-gray eyes rapidly over the fatal dispatch. He grasped his soft, creamy white hat, rose and withdrew calmly hardly had he left the door before the sexton again marched up the aisle and bending spoke to general joseph anderson who at once took his leave then followed two more grand entries and i think the confederacy though weighing her cheek smiled faintly for like everything born in america she must have had a sense of humor heaven be blessed for the gift and i hope they buried the dignified sexton in his ruffled shirt and suit of blue with brass buttons in due pomp peace to his clay wherever it lies at his fourth presageful march up the aisle again with a message to a prominent official anxiety seized the congregation 
and like alarmed birds they rose at once and left the church and not until the bewildered people cleared the door and mingled with the throng that had already gathered in the modest vestibule and on the pavement was the purport of the message to mr davis revealed there in consternation they saw government employees of a department that occupied an opposite building frantically carrying bundles of public documents out into the middle of the street and setting them on fire then the appalling significance of it all broke on them and they melted away to their homes in dread and anguish the smoke of the burning records soon became the breath of panic and by the time the sun went down and twilight came on the city was in tragic confusion lee's lines were broken and richmond was to be evacuated that night end of section eighty six this recording is in the public domain recording by valerie marino section eighty seven of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section eighty seven carrying a message to general lee by john s wise on the morning of april sixth eighteen sixty five mounted upon as fine a mare as there was in the confederacy i sallied forth in search of general lee i started northward for the south side railroad it was not long before i heard cannon to the northeast thinking that the sounds came from the enemy in the rear of lee i endeavored to bear sufficiently westward to avoid the union forces seeing no sign of either army i was going along leisurely when a noise behind me attracted my attention turning in my saddle i saw at a distance of several hundred yards the head of a cavalry command coming from the east and turning out of a cross-road that i had passed into the road that i was travelling they saw me and pretended to give chase but their horses were jaded and my mare was fresh and swift the few shots they fired went wide of us and i galloped out of range quickly and safely my filly after her spin was meddlesome and as i held her in hand i chuckled to think how easy it was to keep out of harm's way on such a beast but this was not to be my easy day i was rapidly approaching another road which came into my road from the east i saw another column of union cavalry filing into my road and going in the same direction that i was going here was a pretty pickle we were in the woods did they see me to be sure they did of course they knew of the parallel column of their own troops which i had passed and i think they first mistook me for a friend but i could not ride forward i should have come upon the rear of their column i could not turn back the cavalry force behind was not a quarter of a mile away i stopped thus disclosing who i was several of them made a dart for me several more took shots with their carbines and once more the little mare and i were dashing off this time through the woods to the west what a bird she was that little mare at a low fence in the woods she did not make a pause or blunder but cleared it without turning a hair i resolved now to get out of the way for it was very evident that i was trying to reach general lee by riding across the advance columns of sheridan who was on lee's flank going at a merry pace just when my heart was ceasing to jump and i was congratulating myself upon a lucky escape i was struck flat aback as sailors say from behind a large oak a keen racy-looking fellow stepped forth and levelling his cavalry carbine called halt he was not ten feet away halt i did 
it is all over now thought i for i did not doubt that he was a jesse scout that was the name applied by us to union scouts to disguise themselves in our uniform he looked too neat and clean for one of our men the words i surrender were on my lips when he asked who are you i had half a mind to lie about it but i gave my true name and rank what the devil are you doing here then he exclaimed his whole manner changing i told him if that is so said he lowering his gun to my great relief i must help to get you out the yankees are all around us come on he led the way rapidly to where his own horse was tied behind some cedar bushes and mounting bade me follow him he knew the woods well as we rode along i ventured to inquire who he was curtis said he one of general rooney lee's scouts i have been hanging on the flank of this cavalry for several days they are evidently pushing for the high bridge to cut the army off from crossing there after telling him of my adventure i added you gave me a great fright i thought you were a yankee sure and came near telling you that i was one it is well you did not i am taking no prisoners on this trip he rejoined tapping the butt of his carbine significantly there they go said he as we came to an opening and saw the union cavalry winding down a red clay road to the north of us travelling parallel with our own route we must hurry or they'll reach the flat creek ford ahead of us fitz lee is somewhere near here and they'll be fun when he sees them there are not many of them and they are pressing too far ahead of their main column after a sharp ride through the forest we came to a wooded hill overlooking the ford a flat creek a stream which runs northward entering the appomattox near high bridge wait here a moment said curtis let me ride out and see if we are safe going on to a point where he could reconnoitre he turned back rose in his stirrups waved his hand and crying come on quick galloped down the hill to the ford i followed but he had not accurately calculated the distance the head of the column of union cavalry was in sight when he beckoned to me and made his dash they saw him and started toward him as i was considerably behind him they were much nearer to me than to him he crossed safely but the stream was deep and by the time i was in the middle my little mare doing her best with the water up to her chest the yankees were in easy range making it uncomfortable for me the bullets were splashing in the water all around me i threw myself off the saddle and nestling close under the mare's shoulder i reached the other side unharmed curtis and a number of pickets stationed at the ford stood by me manfully the road beyond the ford ran into a deep gully and made a turn behind the protection of this turn curtis and the pickets opened fire upon the advancing cavalry and held them in check until i was safely over when my horse trotted up with me wet as a drowned rat it was time for us all to move on rapidly in the afternoon i heard fitzley pouring hot shot into that venturesome body of cavalry and i was delighted to learn afterward that he had given them severe punishment curtis advised me to go to farmville where i would be beyond the chance of encountering more union cavalry and then to work eastward toward general lee i had been upset by the morning's adventures and i was somewhat demoralized about a mile from farmville i found myself to the west of a line of battle of infantry formed on a line running north and south moving toward the town not doubting they were union troops i galloped off again and when i entered farmville i did not hesitate to inform the commandant that the yankees were approaching the news created quite a panic artillery was put in position and preparations were made to resist when it was discovered that the troops i had seen were a reserve regiment of our own falling back in line of battle to a position near the town i kept very quiet when i heard men all about me swearing that any cowardly 
panic-stricken fool who would set such a report afloat ought to be lynched i had now very nearly joined our army which was coming directly toward me early in the afternoon the advance of our troops appeared how they straggled and how demoralized they seemed eastward not far from the flat creek ford a heavy fire opened and continued for an hour or more as i afterward learned fitz lee had collided with my cavalry friends of the morning and seeing his advantage had availed himself of it by attacking them fiercely to the north about four o'clock a tremendous fire of artillery and musketry began and continued until dark i was riding toward this firing with my back to farmville very heavy detonations of artillery were followed time and again by crashes of musketry it was the battle of sailor's creek the most important of those last struggles of which grant said there was as much gallantry displayed by some of the confederates in these little engagements as was displayed at any time during the war notwithstanding the sad defeats of the past weeks my father's command was doing the best fighting of that day when ewell and curtis lee had been captured when pickett's division broke and fled when bushrod johnson his division commander left the field ingloriously my fearless father bareheaded and desperate led his brigade into action at sailor's creek and though completely surrounded cut his way out and reached farmville at daylight with the fragments of his command it was long after nightfall when the firing ceased we had not then learned the particulars but it was easy to see that the contest had gone against us the enemy had in fact at sailor's creek stampeded the remnant of pickett's division broken our lines captured six general officers including generals ewell and curtis lee and burned a large part of our wagon trains as evening came on the road was filled with wagons artillery and bodies of men hurrying without organization and in a state of panic toward farmville i met two general officers of high rank and great distinction who seemed utterly demoralized and they declared that all was lost that portion of the army which was still unconquered was falling back with its face to the foe and bivouacked with its right and left flanks resting upon the appomattox to cover the crossings to the north side near farmville upon reaching our lines i found the divisions of field and mahone presenting an unbroken and defiant front passing from camp to camp in search of general lee i encountered general mahone who told me where to find general lee he said that the enemy had knocked hell out of picket but he added savagely my fellows are all right we are just waiting for em and so they were when the army surrendered three days later mahone's division was in better fighting trim and surrendered more muskets than any other division of lee's army it was past midnight when i found general lee he was in an open field north of rice's station and east of the high bridge a campfire of fence rails was burning low colonel charles marshall sat in an ambulance with a lantern and a lap desk he was preparing orders at the dictation of general lee who stood near with one hand resting on a wheel and one foot upon the end of a log watching intently the dying embers as he spoke in a low tone to his amanuensis touching my cap as i rode up i inquired general lee yes he replied quietly and i dismounted and explained my mission he examined my autograph order from mr davis and questioned me closely concerning the route by which i had come he seemed especially interested in my report of the position of the enemy at burkeville and westward to the south of his army then with a long sigh he said i hardly think it is necessary to prepare written dispatches in reply they may be captured the enemy's cavalry is already flanking us to the south and west you seem capable of bearing a verbal response you may say to mr davis that as he knows my original purpose was to adhere to the line of the danville road i have been unable to do so and am now endeavouring to hold the south side road as i retire in the direction of lynchburg have you any objective point general any place where you contemplate making a stand i ventured timidly no said he slowly and sadly no i shall have to be governed by each day's developments 
then with a touch of resentment and raising his voice he added a few more sailors creaks and it will all be over ended just as i have expected it would end from the first i was astonished at the frankness of this avowal to one so insignificant as i it made a deep and lasting impression on me it gave me an insight into the character of general lee which all the books ever written about him could never give it elevated him in my opinion more than anything else he ever said or did it revealed him as a man who had sacrificed everything to perform a conscientious duty against his judgment he had loved the union he had believed secession was unnecessary he had looked upon it as hopeless folly yet at the call of his state he had laid his life and fame and fortune at her feet and served her faithfully to the last after another pause during which although he spoke not a word and gave not a sign i could discern a great struggle within him he turned to me and said you must be very tired my son you have had an exciting day go rest yourself and report to me at farmville at sunrise i may determine to send a written dispatch the way in which he called me my son made me feel as if i would die for him hesitating a moment i inquired general can you give me any tidings of my father your father he asked who is your father general wise ah said he with another pause no no at nightfall his command was fighting obstinately at sailor's creek surrounded by the enemy i have heard nothing from them since i fear they were captured or or worse to these words spoken with genuine sympathy he added your father's command has borne itself nobly throughout this retreat you may well feel proud of him and of it my father was not dead at the very moment when we were talking he and the remnant of his brigade were tramping across the high bridge feeling like victors and he bareheaded and with an old blanket pinned around him was chewing tobacco and cursing bushrod johnson for running off and leaving him to fight his own way out i found a little pile of leaves in the pine thicket and laid down in the rear of field's division for a nap fearing that somebody would steal my horse i looped the reins around my wrist and the mare stood by my side we were already good friends just before daylight she gave a snort and a jerk which nearly dislocated my arm and i awoke to find her alarmed at field's division which was withdrawing silently and had come suddenly upon her warned by this incident i mounted and proceeded toward farmville to report as directed to general lee for further orders north of the stream at farmville in the forks of the road was the house then occupied by general lee on the hill behind the house to the left of the road was a grove seeing troops in this grove i rode in inquiring for general lee's headquarters the troops were lying there more like dead men than live ones they did not move and they had no sentries out the sun was shining upon them as they slept i did not recognize them dismounting and shaking an officer i woke him with difficulty he rolled over sat up and began rubbing his eyes which were bloodshot and showed great fatigue hello john said he in the name of all that is wonderful where did you come from it was lieutenant edmund r bagwell of the forty sixth the men a few hundred in all were the pitiful remnant of my father's brigade have you seen the old general asked ned he's over there oh we have had a week of it yes this is all that is left of us john the old man will give you thunder when he sees you when we were coming on last night in the dark he said thank god john is out of this dick why dick was captured yesterday at sailor's creek he was riding the general's old mare maggie and she squatted like a rabbit with him when the shells began to fly she always had that trick he could not make her go forward or backward you ought to have seen dick belaboring her with his sword but the yanks got him and ned burst into a laugh as he led me where my father was nearly sixty years old he lay like a common soldier sleeping on the ground among his men we aroused him and when he saw me he exclaimed well by great jehoshaphat what are you doing here i thought you at least were safe i hugged him and almost laughed and cried at the sight of him safe and sound for general lee had made me very uneasy i told him why i was there where is general lee he asked earnestly springing to his feet i want to see him again i saw him this morning about daybreak i had washed my face in a mud puddle 
and the red mud was all over it and in the roots of my hair i looked like a comanche indian and when i was telling him how we cut our way out last night he broke into a smile and said general go wash your face the incident pleased him immensely for at the same time general lee made him a division commander a promotion he had long deserved for gallantry if not for military knowledge no dick is not captured he got out i'm sure said he as we walked down the hill together he was separated from me when the enemy broke our line he was not riding maggie i lent her to frank johnson he was wounded and remembering his kindness to your brother jennings the day he was killed i tried to save the poor fellow and told him to ride maggie to the rear dick was riding his black horse i know it when the yankees advanced a flock of wild turkeys flushed before them and came sailing into our lines i saw dick gallop after a gobbler and shoot him and tie him to his saddle bow he was coming back toward us when the line broke and mounted as he was he has no doubt escaped but is cut off from us by the enemy yes the yanks got the bay horse and my servants joshua and smith and all my baggage overcoats and plunder a private soldier pinned this blanket around me last night and i found this tap when i was coming off the field he laughed heartily at his own plight i've never since seen a catchpin half so large as that with which his blanket was gathered at the throat as we passed down the road to general lee's headquarters the roads in the fields were filled with stragglers they moved looking behind them as if they expected to be attacked and harried by a pursuing foe demoralization panic abandonment of all hope appeared on every hand wagons were rolling along without any order or system caissons and limber chests without commanding officers seemed to be floating aimlessly upon a tide of disorganization rising to his full height casting a glance around him like that of an eagle and sweeping the horizon with his long arm and bony forefinger my father exclaimed this is the end it is impossible to convey an idea of the agony and the bitterness of his words and gestures we found general lee on the rear portico of the house that i have mentioned he had washed his face in a tin basin and stood drying his beard with a coarse towel as we approached general lee exclaimed my father my poor brave men are lying on yonder hill more dead than alive for more than a week they have been fighting day and night without food and by god sir they shall not move another step until somebody gives them something to eat come in general said general lee soothingly they deserve something to eat and shall have it and meanwhile you shall share my breakfast he disarmed every thing like defiance by his kindness it was but a few moments however before my father launched forth in a fresh denunciation of the conduct of general bushrod johnson in the engagement of the sixth i am satisfied that general lee felt as he did but assuming an air of mock severity he said general are you aware that you are liable to court-martial and execution for insubordination and disrespect towards your commanding officer my father looked at him with lifted eyebrows and flashing eyes and exclaimed shot you can't afford to shoot the men who fight for cursing those who run away shot i wish you would shoot me if you don't some yankee probably will within the next twenty-four hours growing more serious general lee inquired what he thought of the situation situation said the bold old man there is no situation nothing remains general lee but to put your poor men on your poor mules and send them home in time for spring ploughing this army is hopelessly whipped and is fast becoming demoralized these men have already endured more than i believed flesh and blood could stand and i say to you sir emphatically that to prolong the struggle is murder and the blood of every man who is killed from this time forth is on your head general lee this last expression seemed to cause general lee great pain with a gesture of remonstrance and even of impatience he protested oh general do not talk so wildly my burdens are heavy enough what would the country think of me if i did what you suggest country be damned was the quick reply there is no country there has been no country general for a year or more you are the country to these men they have fought for you they have shivered through a long winter for you without pay or clothes or care of any sort their devotion to you and faith in you have been the only things which have held this army together 
if you demand the sacrifice there are still left thousands of us who will die for you you know the game is desperate beyond redemption and that if you so announce no man or government or people will gainsay your decision that is why i repeat that the blood of any man killed hereafter is upon your head general lee stood for some time at an open window looking out at the throng now surging by upon the roads and in the fields and made no response then turning his attention to me he said cheerfully that he was glad my father's plight was not so bad as he had thought it might be at the time of our conversation the night before after a pause he wrote upon a piece of paper a few words to the effect that he had talked with me and that i would make a verbal report if occasion arose he would give further advices this said he you will deliver to the president i fear to write lest you be captured for those people are already several miles above farmville you must keep on the north side to a ford eight miles above here and be careful about crossing even there he always referred to the enemy as those people then he bade me adieu and asked my father to come in and share his breakfast i hugged my father in the presence of general lee and i saw a kindly look in his eyes as he watched us remembering that my father had no horse i said take my mare i can easily get another what said he laughing a dispatch bearer giving away his horse no sir that is too pretty a little animal to make a present to a yankee i know they will bag us all horse foot and dragoons before long no i can walk as well as anybody have you any chewing tobacco i was immensely flattered at this request and gave him a plug of excellent tobacco it was the first time that he had recognized me as entitled to the possession of all the modern improvements of a soldier and so i left them as i rode along in search of the ford to which general lee had directed me i felt that i was in the midst of the wreck of that immortal army which until now i had believed to be invincible End of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain section eighty eight of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by valerie marino the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section eighty eight lee's surrender eighteen sixty five by morris chafe conversations between longstreet and lee as to grant's prospective terms continued in broken sentences till babcock was seen approaching and then as lee still seemed apprehensive of humiliating demands longstreet suggested to him that in that event he should break off the interview and tell grant to do his worst the thought of another round seemed to brace him and he rode with colonel marshall to meet the union commander so closes longstreet's account of that incident lee directed marshall to find a suitable house for the conference and he chose mclean's the best in the town a brick building with elms and locusts about it and rose bushes blooming on the lawn with a cool inviting veranda it stood facing west the last in the village marshall sent his orderly back to notify lee and he and babcock soon were seated in the parlor the left-hand room as you enter the hall meanwhile traveller's humane groom removed his bit and he began to nip the fresh springing grass in the dooryard while babcock's orderly sat mounted out in the road to notify grant on his arrival ord sheridan custer griffin and with him my friend merrill and their staffs were up on the road only a few hundred yards away and in full view grant after dispatching babcock mounted at once and followed the walker's church road till he came to the lagrange road this he took to the left and then struck down across plain run to the lynchburg road as he passed to the left of the first new york dragoons someone shouted there comes general grant he rode directly to sheridan's group saying as he drew rein how are you sheridan first rate thank you how are you replied sheridan with an expressive smile and then he told grant what had happened and that he believed it was a ruse on the part of the confederates to get away but grant answered that he had no doubt of the good faith of lee and asked where he was in that brick house responded sheridan 
Well, then, we'll go over, said Grant, and asked them all to go along with him. This must have been about one o'clock, for Lyman says that at two-twenty, Colonel Kellogg, Sheridan's chief commissary, accompanied by a member of Lee's staff, brought a note from Grant to Meade to suspend hostilities. Cincinnati, sired by the king of the turf, Lexington, with his delicate ears, high and thoroughbred port, led the way, and at his side was Rienzi, carrying Sheridan, for some reason or other, perhaps because as a boy I played with the colts, on the old home farm, those horses, from the day I saw Grant on Cincinnati, and Sheridan on Rienzi, in the wilderness, have seemed like acquaintances to me, and now it pleases my fancy to put them with Traveller in a pasture far, far beyond the reach of thundering guns or lamenting bugles, a pasture that remains eternally green. As Grant mounted the steps and entered the hall, Babcock, who had seen his approach, opened the door. Sheridan, Ord, and the other officers remained outside and took seats on two benches, one on either side of the door and the steps of the veranda. Grant, about five feet eight inches tall, his square shoulders inclined to stoop, was without a sword, wore a soldier's dark blue flannel displaying a waistcoat of like material and ordinary top boots with trousers inside. Boots and clothing were spattered with mud and in his memoirs, with his usual unstudied frankness, he says, In my rough traveling suit, the uniform of a private, with the straps of a lieutenant general, bullion bordered rectangles holding on their ground of black velvet, one large and two smaller stars, I must have contrasted strangely with a man so handsomely dressed, six feet high and of faultless form. But this was not a matter that I thought of until afterwards. Never was a great man less self-conscious than he, though, as I have observed elsewhere. While at the head of the Army of the Potomac, he maintained his dignity day in and day out, without charging the air of his headquarters with the usual pompous military fuss. This I know from experience, and although I was a mere boy, had he shown any affections, I believe I should have noticed them. The kind and cut of his beard, deep brown in shade, the way his hair lay and the outline of his face are familiar, but his eyes so charitable, direct, and his voice so softly vibrant, voracious, and sweet, must have been seen and heard to be duly appreciated. Under the depths of his quiet and modest reserve lay a persistent and intense doggedness of purpose, as prompt and unconquerable as Lee's pride and burning enthusiasm. And thus, strangely balanced, stood those types and creations of American society of their generation facing each other. Grant greeted Lee very civilly, says Marshall, and I have no doubt that he and his superb kinsman and chief at once felt the charm of that gentle, inflexible composure which every crowned head of the world who afterward met him felt and remarked upon. Lee said to Grant, with his customary urbanity, that he remembered him well in the old army, to which Grant, with his usual modesty, replied that he remembered him perfectly, but thought it unlikely that he had attracted Lee's attention sufficiently to be remembered after such a long interval. Lee soon found himself in a stream of pleasant reminiscences with Grant about the Mexican War, and it could not have been otherwise, for there was something so quietly companionable in Grant's manner that everyone whom he met informally and socially always joined him in his unpremeditated talk, and I think I can see Lee's brown, vigilant eyes kindle with inquisitive wonder as in the course of their conversation they fell on him. The same wonder had been in Meade's and every old officer's eyes, save Sherman's since Grant's star broke through its dark eclipse. There stood the man whose marvelous career had started wave after wave of camp gossip in both armies. The hero of Fort Donelson, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga, now about to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia and leave a name shining unchallenged and unclouded at the climax of the war. And yet, in the full glow of this impending fame, mild, unconscious of self, and unpretentious, it was Lee who finally had to remind Grant of the object of their meeting and suggest that he put his terms in writing. 
another proof of Grant's inherent delicacy, which made him reluctant to broach a painful subject. Grant asked for his manifold orderly book, and on receiving it took a seat at the little center table and rapidly, with only a single momentary pause, wrote his terms. He says that when he put his pen to its task, he did not know the first word he should make use of in his writing. The terms were as follows. Appomattox, C.T., H. V. A., April 9, 1865. General R. Lee, commanding C.S.A. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th inst., I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia on the following terms, to wit, rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer to be designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate, the officers to give their individual paroles, not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged, and each company or regimental commander to sign a like parole for the men of their commands, the arms, artillery, and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the sidearms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage, this done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home, not to be disturbed by the United States authorities, so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. Very respectfully, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. When he came to the end of the sentence, closing with, appointed by me to receive them, he raised his eyes, and they fell on Lee's lion-headed, stately sword, and then he wrote, this will not embrace the sidearms of the officers, nor their private horses. Grant probably thought of Traveler, and the pang it would give him to part with Cincinnati were he in Lee's place. It is needless for me to point out the significance of the last sentence, binding as it did the passions and pledging the honor of his country. In short, it meant that there should be no judicial bloodshed, no gibbets, and no mourning exiles. These terms, in the light of all that, might have happened after the assassination of Mr. Lincoln, which took place within five days of the surrender, lent elevation, repose, and dignity to humanity, and I have no doubt the eyes of the country's guardian angel welled with tears of joy. Grant finishes the terms, rises, goes to Lee, and hands him the open order book. Remaining seated, Lee lays it on the table beside him, and with deliberation takes out his spectacles and adjusts them. Slowly and carefully he reads line after line. All eyes are on Lee. A hush silent as death prevails. When Lee came to the end, he raised his eyes, looked at Grant, and remarked, This will have a very happy effect upon my army. Grant then said he would have the terms copied in ink unless he had some suggestions to make. Lee replied one only, that the cavalry and artillerymen owned their own horses, and he would like to understand whether or not they would be allowed to retain them. Grant told him the terms as written would not allow of this, but as he thought this was about the last of the war, he would instruct the officers in carrying them out to allow everyone claiming to own a horse or mule to take the animal to his home, so that they could put in a crop to tide them over through the next winter, which he feared might be one of want and suffering, owing to the wide devastation. Lee is reported to have said, then, this will have the best possible effect upon the men. It will be very gratifying and will do much toward conciliating our people. While the terms were being copied, Lee told Grant that he had a number of prisoners whom he should be glad to release, as he had no provisions for them or his own men who had been living for the last few days on parched corn and what they could gather along the route. Grant asked him to send the prisoners within his lines and said that he would take steps at once to have Lee's army supplied, but was sorry to say that he was entirely out of forage for the animals. In inquiry as to the number of men to be fed, Lee was unable to answer, and Grant asked, Suppose I send over 25,000 rations, will that be enough? More than enough, replied Lee. 
Grant directed Morgan, his chief commissary, to see that Lee's army was fed. By this time, the terms were copied, and when they were signed, it was about half past two or three o'clock. Lee shook hands with Grant, bowed to the other officers, and left the room. Colonel Payne of Ord's staff says, as Lee came out of the room and stopped for a moment in the doorway, those of us on the porch arose and complimented him with the usual salute to a superior officer. He seemed pleased at this mark of respect, and looking to the right and left, he raised his own hat in recognition of the attention. As he drew on a pair of apparently new gloves, he stood so close to me that his initials worked in white silk on the guard of the gauntlet were plainly observed. Having signaled for his horse, Lee stood on the lowest step of the veranda while the groom was rebridling him, and from time to time his eyes rested on the leaning fields, spotted by the colors of the army. He had just surrendered. He smote his gauntleted hands together unconsciously. When Traveler was led up, he mounted him at once. Grant then stepped down from the veranda, and as he passed Lee, touched his hat. Lee returned the salute and rode away. Marshall says that if General Grant and the other officers who were present at the McLean house had studied how not to offend, they could not have borne themselves with more good breeding. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 89 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 89. America after the civil war by william ewart gladstone if there be those in england who think that american democracy means public levity and intemperance or a lack of skill and sagacity in politics or the absence of self-command and self-denial let them bear in mind a few of the most salient and recent facts of history which may profitably be recommended to their reflections we emancipated a million of negroes by peaceful legislation america liberated four or five millions by a bloody civil war yet the industry and exports of the southern states are maintained while those of our negro colonies have dwindled the south enjoys all its franchises but we have pro pudor found no better method of providing for peace and order in jamaica the chief of our islands than by the hard and vulgar, even where needful, expedient of abolishing entirely his representative institutions. The Civil War compelled the states, both North and South, to train and embody a million and a half of men, and to present to view the great, instead of the smallest, armed forces in the world. Here there was supposed to arise a double danger. First, that on a sudden cessation of the war, military life and habits could not be shaken off, and having become rudely and widely predominant, would bias the country toward an aggressive policy, or still worse, would find vent on predatory or revolutionary operations. Secondly, that the military caste would grow up with its habits of exclusiveness and command, and would influence the tone of politics in a direction adverse to republican freedom but both apprehensions proved to be wholly imaginary the innumerable soldiery was at once dissolved cincinnatus no longer an unique example became the commonplace of every day the type and mould of a nation the whole enormous mass quietly resumed the habits of social life the generals of yesterday were the editors the secretaries and the solicitors of to-day the just jealousy of the state gave life to the now forgotten maxim of judge blackstone who denounced as perilous the erection of a separate profession of arms in a free country the standing army expanded by the heat of civil contest 
to gigantic dimensions settled down into the framework of a miniature with the returning temperature of civil life and became a power well nigh invisible from its minuteness amidst the powers which sway the movements of a society exceeding forty millions more remarkable still was the financial sequel to the great conflict the internal taxation for federal purposes which before its commencement had been unknown was raised in obedience to an exigency of life and death so as to exceed every present and every past example it pursued and worried all the transactions of life the interest of the american debt grew to be the highest in the world and the capital touched five hundred and sixty million sterling here was provided for the faith and patience of a people a touchstone of extreme severity in england at the close of the great french war the propertied classes who were supreme in parliament at once rebelled against the tory government and refused to prolong the income tax even for a single year we talked big both then and now about the payment of our national debt but sixty-three years have since elapsed all of them except two called years of peace and we have reduced the huge debt by about one-ninth that is to say by a little over one hundred millions or scarcely more than one million and a half a year this is the conduct of a state elaborately digested into orders and degrees famed for wisdom and forethought and consolidated by a long experience but america continued not long to bear on her unaccustomed and still smarting shoulders the burden of the war taxation in twelve years she has reduced her debt by one hundred and fifty eight million sterling or at the rate of thirteen millions for every year in each twelve months she has done what we did in eight years her self-command self-denial and wise forethought for the future have been to say the least eightfold ours these are facts which redound greatly to her honor and the historian will record the surprise that an enfranchised nation tolerated burdens which in england a selected class possessed of the representation did not dare to face and that the most unmitigated democracy known to the annals of the world resolutely reduced of its own cost prospective liabilities of the state which the aristocratic and plutocratic and monarchical government of the united kingdom has been contented ignobly to hand over to posterity and such facts should be told out it is our fashion so to tell them against as well as for ourselves and the record of them may some day be among the means of stirring us up to a policy more worthy of the name and fame of england End of section eighty nine. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section ninety of the United States, read for LibriVox dot org by Jim Locke. The United States, volume two part thirteen stories of the western indians historical note most of the indian outbreaks of the last half century have been caused by the governmental command to move on during the presidency of jackson the indians were bidden to remove to the country west of the mississippi some made no resistance but others opposed bitterly and the black hawk war in illinois and wisconsin as well as the war in florida were the result as the number of white inhabitants increased they called for more arable land then too silver and gold were discovered to make desirable regions available for the whites the government forced the indians not once but again and again to leave their homes and depart to some less valuable part of the country there is as much variety in indian tribes and in individual indians as in white folk some are fierce and warlike others are inclined to be friendly some are industrious and eager to learn while others are lazy and willingly ignorant as a race the indians are rapidly disappearing within the last seventy years of the nineteenth century the pawnees for instance decreased from twelve thousand 
to fewer than seven hundred the native california indians have almost entirely died out twenty tribes on the oregon coast have dwindled to four hundred and thirty seven persons end of section ninety this recording is in the public domain section ninety one of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr Nater. the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety one a choctaw holiday about eighteen fifty by george cutlin when i was staying at the choctaw agency in the midst of their nation it seemed to be a sort of season of amusements a kind of holiday when the whole tribe almost were assembled around the establishment and from day to day we were entertained with some games or feats that were exceedingly amusing horse racing dancing wrestling foot racing and ball playing were amongst the most exciting and of all the catalogue the most beautiful was decidedly that of ball playing this wonderful game which is the favourite one amongst all the tribes and with these southern tribes played exactly the same can never be appreciated by those who are not happy enough to see it it is no uncommon occurrence for six or eight hundred or a thousand of these young men to engage in a game of all with five or six times that number of spectators of men women and children surrounding the ground and looking on and i pronounce such a scene with its hundreds of nature's most beautiful models denuded and painted of various colors running and leaping into the air in all the most extravagant and varied forms in the desperate struggle for the ball a school for that painter or sculptor equal to any of those that ever inspired the hand of the artist in the olympian games or the roman forum i have made it a uniform rule whilst in the indian country to attend every ball play i could hear of if i could do it by riding a distance of twenty or thirty miles and my usual custom has been on such occasions to straddle the back of my horse and look on to the best advantage in this way i have sat and oftentimes reclined and almost dropped from my horse's back with irresistible laughter at the succession of droll tricks and kicks and scuffles which ensue in the almost superhuman struggle for the ball these plays generally commence at nine o'clock or near it in the morning and i have more than once balanced myself on my pony from that time till near sundown without more than one minute of intermission at a time before the game has been decided while at the choctaw agency it was announced that there was to be a great play on a certain day within a few miles on which occasion i attended and made three sketches and also the following entry in my notebook which i literally copy out monday afternoon at three o'clock i rode out with lieutenants s and m to a very pretty prairie about six miles distant to the ball playground of the choctaws where we found several thousand indians encamped there were two points of timber about half a mile apart in which the two parties for the play with their respective families and friends were encamped and lying between them the prairie on which the game was to be played my companions and myself although we had been apprised that to see the whole of a ball play we must remain on the ground all the night previous had brought nothing to sleep upon resolving to keep our eyes open and see what transpired during the night during the afternoon we loitered about amongst the different tents and shanties of the two encampments and afterwards at sundown witnessed the ceremony of measuring out the ground and erecting the bys or goals which were to guide the play each party had their goal made with two upright posts set firm in the ground with a pole across at the top these goals were about forty or fifty rods apart and at a point just halfway between was another small stake driven down where the ball was to be thrown up at the firing of a gun to be struggled for by the players all this preparation was made by some old men who were it seemed selected to be the judges of the play who drew a line from one by to the other to which directly came from the woods on both sides a great concourse of women and old men boys and girls and dogs and horses where bets were to be made on the play 
The betting was all done across this line, and seemed to be chiefly left to the women, who seemed to have marshalled out a little of everything that their houses and their fields possessed. Goods and chattels, knives, dresses, blankets, pots and kettles, dogs and horses and guns, and all were placed in the possession of stakeholders, who sat by them and watched them on the ground all night preparatory to the play. The sticks with which this tribe play are bent into an oblong hoop at the end, with a sort of slight web of small thongs tied across, to prevent the ball from passing through. The players hold one in each hand, and by leaping into the air they catch the ball between the two nettings and throw it, without being allowed to strike it or catch it in their hands. In every ball play of these people it is a rule of the play that no man shall wear moccasins on his feet or any other dress than his breechcloth around his waist with a beautiful bead belt and a tail made of white horsehair or quills and a mane on their neck of horsehair dyed of various colors this game had been arranged and made up three or four months before the parties met to play it and in the following manner the two champions who led the two parties and had the alternate choosing of the players through the whole tribe sent runners with the ball sticks most fantastically ornamented with ribbons and red paint to be touched by every one of the chosen players who thereby agreed to be on the spot at the appointed time and ready for the play the ground having been all prepared and preliminaries of the game all settled and the bettings all made and goods all staked night came on without the appearance of any players on the ground but soon after dark a procession of lighted flambeaux was seen coming from each encampment to the ground where the players assembled around their respective vice and at the beat of the drums and chants of the women each party of players commenced the ball-play dance each party danced for a quarter of an hour around their respective buys in their ball-play dress rattling their ball sticks together in the most violent manner and all singing as loud as they could raise their voices whilst the women of each party who had their goods at stake formed into two rows on the line between the two parties of players and danced also in a uniform step and all their voices joined in chants to the great spirit in which they were soliciting his favour in deciding the game to their advantage and also encouraging the players to exert every power they possessed in the struggle that was to ensue in the meantime four old medicine men who were to have the starting of the ball and who were to be the judges of the play were seated at the point where the ball was to be started and busily smoking to the great spirit for their success in judging rightly and impartially between the parties in so important an affair this dance was one of the most picturesque scenes imaginable and was repeated at intervals of every half hour during the night and exactly in the same manner so that the players were certainly awake all the night and arrayed in their appropriate dress prepared for the play which was to commence at nine o'clock the next morning in the morning at the hour the two parties and all their friends were drawn out and over the ground where at length the game commenced by the judges throwing up the ball at the firing of a gun when an instant struggle ensued between the players who were some six or seven hundred in numbers and were mutually endeavouring to catch the ball in their sticks and throw it home and between their respective stakes which whenever successfully done counts one for the game in this game all the players were dressed alike that is divested of all dress except the girdle and the tail which i have before described and in these desperate struggles for the ball when it is up where hundreds are running together and leaping actually over each other's heads and darting between their adversary's legs tripping and throwing and foiling each other in every possible manner and every voice raised to the highest key in shrill yelps and barks there are rapid successions of feats and of incidents that astonish and amuse far beyond the conception of any one who has not had the singular good luck to witness them in these struggles every mode is used that can be devised to oppose the progress of the foremost who is likely to get the ball and these obstructions often meet desperate individual resistance which terminates in violent scuffle and sometimes in fisticuffs when their sticks are dropped and the parties are unmolested whilst they are settling it between themselves 
unless it be a general stampedo to which they are subject who are down if the ball happens to pass in their direction every weapon by a rule of all ball play is laid by in their respective encampments and no man allowed to go for one so that the sudden broils that take place on the ground are presumed to be as suddenly settled without any probability of much personal injury and no one is allowed to interfere in any way with the contentious individuals there are times when the ball gets to the ground and such a confused mass rushing together around it and knocking their sticks together without the possibility of any one getting or seeing it for the dust that they raise that the spectators loses his strength and everything else but his senses when the condensed mass of ball sticks and shins and bloody noses is carried around the different parts of the ground for a quarter of an hour at a time without any one of the mass being able to see the ball and which they are often thus scuffling for several minutes after it has been thrown off and played over another part of the ground for each time that the ball was passed between the stakes of either party one was counted for their game and a halt of about one minute when it was again started by the judges of the play and a similar struggle ensued and so on until the successful party arrived to one hundred which was the limit of the game and accomplished at an hour's sun when they took the stakes and then by a previous agreement produced a number of jugs of whisky which gave all a wholesome drink and sent them all off merry and in good humour but not drunk after this exciting day the concourse was assembled in the vicinity of the agency house where we had a great variety of dances and other amusements the most of which i have described on former occasions one however was new to me and i must say a few words of it this was the eagle dance a very pretty scene which is got up by their young men in honour of that bird for which they seem to have a religious regard this picturesque dance was given by twelve or sixteen men whose bodies were chiefly naked and painted white with white clay and each one holding in his hand the tail of the eagle while his head was also decorated with an eagle's quill spears were stuck in the ground around which the dance was performed by four men at a time who had simultaneously at the beat of the drum jumped up from the ground where they had all sat in rows of four one row immediately behind the other and ready to take the place of the first four when they left the ground fatigued which they did by hopping or jumping around behind the rest and taking their seats ready to come up again in their turn after each of the other sets had been through the same forms in this dance the steps or rather jumps were different from anything i had ever witnessed before as the dancers were squatted down with their bodies almost to the ground in a severe and most difficult posture i have already in a former letter while speaking of the ancient custom of flattening the head given a curious tradition of this interesting tribe accounting for their having come from the west and i here insert another or two which i had as well as the former one from the lips of peter pinchlin a very intelligent and influential man in the tribe the deluge our people have always had a tradition of the deluge which happened in this way there was total darkness for a great time over the whole of the earth the choctaw doctors or mystery men looked out for daylight for a long time until at last they despaired of ever seeing it and the whole nation were very unhappy at last a light was discovered in the north and there was great rejoicing until it was found to be great mountains of water rolling on which destroyed them all except a few families who had expected it and built a great raft on which they were saved future state our people all believe that the spirit lives in a future state that it has a great distance to travel after death towards the west that it has to cross a dreadful deep and rapid stream which is hemmed in on both sides by high and rugged hills over this stream from hill to hill there lies a long and slippery pine log with the bark peeled off over which the dead have to pass to the delightful hunting grounds on the other side of the stream there are six persons of the good hunting ground with rocks in their hands which they throw at them all when they are on the middle of the log the good walk on safely to the good hunting grounds where there is one continual day 
where the trees are always green, where the sky has no clouds, where there are continual fine and cooling breezes, where there is one continual scene of feasting, dancing, and rejoicing, where there is no pain or trouble, and people never grow old, but for ever live young and enjoy the youthful pleasures. The wicked see the stones coming and try to dodge, by which they fall from the log and go down thousands of feet to the water, which is dashing over the rocks and is smelling of dead fish and animals where they are carried round and brought continually back to the same place in whirlpools, where the trees are all dead and the waters are full of toads and lizards and snakes, where the dead are always hungry and have nothing to eat, are always sick and never die, where the sun never shines, and where the wicked are continually climbing up by thousands on the sides of a high rock from which they can overlook the beautiful country of the good hunting grounds, the place of the happy, but they can never reach it. End of section 91section ninety two of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety two what the indians thought of the white men by george bird grinnell knowledge of the white man came to the different tribes of the west at different times but a century ago most of them knew little of him and there are many tribes which have had a real intercourse with the whites for a still shorter time long before this the spaniards in the southwest and on the pacific coast had made their presence felt but the indians usually do not consider that spaniards are of the same race with the people of european origin who came to them from the east and often they have a special name for them even after the indians had learned of the existence of the white people they did not at once come into contact with them it was often quite a long time before they even began to trade with them and when they did so it was in a very small way the first articles traded for were arms beads blankets and the gaudy finery that the savage loves horses which transformed the indian from a mild and peaceful seeker after food to a warrior and a raider were by many tribes first obtained not directly from the whites but by barter from those of their own race most tribes still preserve traditions of the time when they first met the white men as well as of the time when they first saw horses but in many cases this was so long ago that all details of the occurrence have been lost it is certain that the spaniards and their horses had worked their way up the pacific slope into oregon and washington long before there was any considerable influx of white trappers into the plains country and the rocky mountains and that of the western tribes those which in miles were farthest from mexico were the last to learn of the whites and their wonderful powers one of these peoples was the blackfeet of whom i have been told by men still living in the tribe that fifty years ago no blackfoot could count up to ten and that a little earlier the number of horses in all three tribes of that confederation was very small then they had but few guns and many of them even used still the stone arrowheads and hatchets and the bone knives of their primitive ancestors a people whose intercourse with the whites has been so short and until recent times so limited ought to retain some detailed account of their earliest meeting with civilized men and such a tradition has come to me from john monroe a half-breed pigeon now nearly seventy years old it tells of the first time the blackfeet saw white people a party of traders from the east either frenchmen 
from montreal or one of the very earliest parties of hudson bay men which ascended the saskatchewan river john monroe first heard the narrative when a boy from a blood indian named satani who was then an old man and satani's grandfather was one of the party who met the white people the occurrence probably took place during the latter half of the eighteenth century when this people lived in the north a party of the blackfeet started out to war they travelled on always going southward until they came to a big water while passing through a belt of timber on the north bank of this river they came upon what they took for strange beaver work where these animals had been cutting down the trees but on looking closely at the cuttings they saw that the chips were so large that it must have been an animal much bigger than a beaver that could open its mouth wide enough to cut such chips they did not understand what this could be for none of them had ever seen anything like it before each man expressed his mind about this and at last they concluded that some great underwater animal must have done it at one place they saw that the trunk of a tree was missing and found the trail over the ground where it had been dragged away from the stump they followed this trail so as to see where the animals had taken the log and what they had done with it and as they went on they found many other small trails like this one all leading into one larger main trail they then saw the footprints of persons but they were prints of a foot shaped differently from theirs there was a deep mark at the heel the tracks were not flat like those made by people they followed the trail which kept getting larger and wider as it went every little while another trail joined it when they came to where they could look through the timber they saw before them a little open spot on the bank of the river they looked through the underbrush and saw what they at first thought were bears and afterward took to be persons lifting logs and putting them up in a large pile they crept closer to where they could see better and then concluded that these were not people they were very woolly on the face long masses of hair hung down from their chins they were not clothed wore no robes the blackfeet said why they have nothing on they are naked some of them said those are suya tupi water people they stole around to another point of the timber still nearer where they could see better there they came close to one of these people alone he was gathering sticks and putting them in a pile they saw that the skin of his hands and face was white this one had no hair on his face so they said well this must be a she water animal the he ones have hair in the face and the she ones do not the oldest man of the party then said we had better go away maybe they will smell us or feel us here and perhaps they will kill us or do something fearful let us go so they went away when they got back to their camp they told what they had seen that to the south they had found animals that were very much like people water animals they said that these animals were naked that some of them had red bodies footnote wore red shirts end of footnote and some were black all over except a red mark around the bodies and a fine red tail footnote the red sash worn by the old hudson's bay men end of footnote moreover these people wore no robes or leggings and no breech clouts this description caused a great excitement in the camp some thought that the strange beings were water animals and others that they were of new people all the men of the camp started south to see what this could be before they left the camp the head man told them to be very careful in dealing with the animals not to interfere with them nor to get in their way and not to try to hurt them nor to anger them the party started and when they reached the opening the animals were still there at work after they had watched them for some time the head man of the party said to the others all you stay here and i will go down to them alone if they do nothing to me you wait here but if they attack or hurt me you rush on them and we will fight hard and try not to let them capture any of us the man started and when he came close to the corner of the houses he stood still one of the men who was working near by walked up to him looked him straight in the face and stretched out his arm the indian looked at him and did not know what he wanted some more of the men came up to him and the indian saw that all of them were persons like himself 
except that they were of a different colour and had a different voice the hair on their faces was fair when the other indians saw that no harm had been done to their leader some of them went down to him one by one and by twos and threes but most of the party remained hidden in the timber they were still afraid of these strange new beings the whites spoke to them and asked them to come into the house making motions to them but the indians did not understand what was meant by these signs the whites would walk away and then come back and take hold of the indians robes and pull them at last some of the black feet followed the white men into the house those who had gone in came back and told the others strange stories of the wonderful things they had seen in this house as they gained confidence many others went in while still others would not go in nor would they go close to the new people the whites showed them a long and curious-looking piece of wood they did not know of what kind of stone one part of it was made it was hard and black the white man took down from the wall a white cow's horn and poured out some black sand into his hand and poured it down into a hole in this long stick then he took a little bunch of grass and pushed this into the hole with another stick and measured with his fingers the length of the stick left out of the hole then he took a round thing out of a bag and put it into the hole and put down some more fine grass then he poured out some more of the black sand into the side of the stick the indians stood around taking great interest in the way the man was handling the stick the white man now began to make all kinds of signs to the indians which they did not understand sometimes he would make a big sound with his mouth and then point to the stick he would put the stick to his shoulder holding it out in front of him and make a great many motions then he gave it to one of the indians he showed him the under parts and put his finger there the indian touched the under part and the stick went off in the air and made a thundering sound a terrible crash the indian staggered back and the others were very much scared some dropped to the ground while all the whites laughed and shook their heads at them all laughed and made many signs to the black feet none of which they understood the white man took down the horn of black sand and again did these things to the stick but this time the indians all stood back they were afraid when he had finished the motions the white man invited them out of doors then he sat down and took aim at a log lying on the ground the same great thunder sounded he walked up to the log showed the bullet hole and pushed a little stick into it then he loaded the gun again by this time the indians were beginning to understand the power of the stick after the white men had loaded it he handed the gun to the indian took him close to the log showed him how to aim the gun and how to pull the trigger the indian fired and hit the log the white men showed these black feet their knives whittling sticks with them and showing them how well they could cut the indians were very much delighted with the power of these knives then they saw a big woolly white man standing out in front of the house and he with his axe would cut a big log in two in only a short time all these things were very strange to them the white men looked closely at the black feet wore dresses and arms and wanted them and gave their visitors some knives and copper cups for their dresses and the skins that they wore the visitors stayed with the white men some days camping near by they kept wondering at these people at how they looked the things which they had and what they did the white men kept making signs to them but they understood nothing of it all after a time the blackfeet returned to their camp afterward many others visited the whites and this was the beginning of a friendly intercourse between the two peoples after a time they came to understand each other a little and trade relations were opened the indians learned that they could get the white man's things in exchange for the skins of small animals and they began to trade and to get guns it was when they got these arms that they first began to take courage and to go out of the timber on to the prairie toward the mountains end of section ninety two this recording is in the public domain section ninety three of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section ninety three 
the indian story of the custer tragedy eighteen seventy seven by james mclaughlin in the first place mrs spotted hornbull was there which is more than can be said for some of the other ladies and gentlemen who have told of the events of that dreadful day when custer led his gallant fellows into the jaws of death and worse she was not then carried on the rolls of the indian department as mrs spotted hornbull a more imaginative sponsor than the indian agent had given her the more euphonious and let us hope more correctly descriptive appellation of pretty sun waste wind twenty-eight years ago when she first came to the agency at standing rock when spotted hornbull who was killed with sitting bull was still in the land of the living dakotas she was a strikingly good-looking indian woman and much esteemed by her neighbors for her intelligence and capacity she had also the gift of eloquence rare in an indian woman and a fluency in language and readiness of gesture which placed her high in the esteem of her story-loving tribesmen and many a big man among the sioux had been content to hold his peace when petison waste wind raised her voice not that the voice was raucous or that beautiful white cow the english rendition of her name was a scold i've heard a story that she on one occasion manhandled a big chief of the sioux nation who she learned had maligned her and that the manhandling followed his remark woman be silent you have the mouth of a white man and knowing mrs spotted horn bull as i do i have never doubted the verity of the incident so far as her attack was concerned she is now a sturdy upstanding woman of sixty to sixty-five years of age born of the hunk papa sioux a band that has provided the nation with many of its noted men she was handsome according to the indian canons of taste in her youth and indeed i am not sure that the indian taste in these matters might not well be accepted by some more advanced peoples she was married in early youth to spotted hornbull a chief of his band and a man of prominence as a warrior and adviser but no orator she appears to have brought to the family the attributes in which her husband was lacking for she sat in council of her tribe and i know of no other indian woman of her nation who was so signally honored her voice was always listened to for in addition to her gift of eloquence she was a clear thinker and could make effective the ideas of her silent husband since she became a widow and the sioux no longer hold councils her neighbors seek her advice in business matters she has steadfastly refused to accept christianity though she has listened to all the arguments that have been made to her she elects to cling to the beliefs of her fathers a fact that does not at all detract from the esteem in which the missionaries hold her a few months ago i met mrs spotted hornbull by appointment at my son harry's trading store located at oak creek on the standing rock reservation she had come in fifteen miles from her home on the missouri river near the mouth of oak creek for the meeting i was accompanied by a friend and she greeted us with the effusive welcome of her people as different as possible in its warmth and volubility from the greeting one not acquainted intimately with the sioux might expect she was a striking figure as she stood up to greet us this historian and poetess of the sioux wore the ordinary costume of a woman of her people but her gingham dress was of the campbell plaid her shawl blanket of native make her moccasins neat her jetty hair falling into braids on each side of a smiling and expressive countenance she looked a much younger woman than she really was and by way of demonstrating that she still felt young she danced a few steps laughingly declaring that she had met and danced with many prominent people it was after a substantial supper to which mrs spotted hornbull did full justice that we sat down in my son's little parlor and listened to her story of the affair on the little big horn i've always deplored the fact 
that english writers have never been able to render in their native elegance and appositeness the similes used by indian orators and story-tellers i now deplore the lack of that same capacity in myself mrs spotted hornbull exhausted the stores of her flowery vocabulary in the relation we listened to she talked with great fluency her voice pitched to a sort of breathless stage of excited feeling i remember hearing a young woman declaim the chorus in henry v put on by an american actor-manager a few years ago the sioux story-teller reminded me of the actress she illustrated her every sentence in pantomime and when she feared that she had not pictured the scene her memory brought up she seized a pencil and paper and drew a sketch of the valley of the little big horn showing the location of the indian village on the west bank the distribution of the bands of the sioux the points of attack by custer and reno and the fatal hill now marked by a monument where custer fell this sketch she used constantly to explain her meaning and she was perfectly frank about the occurrences of june twenty five eighteen seventy six except on one point she ignored all questions as to the whereabouts of sitting bull during the fight skilfully avoiding the interrogation or totally ignoring it she made many excursions into sioux history of that time but sitting bull her kinsman who skulked in the hills while his people were carrying out the annihilation of the troops she would not speak of once exasperated by the questions of the third party to the hearing she asked if he was a lawyer and being assured that he was not she shook hands with him very solemnly and continued her relation and this is the tale she told my brother white eyebrows had been to a dance all through the night he had been making glad the hearts of the maidens for my brother was good to look upon and the women of the hunk papa know a good man all the night he had danced with the other young people it was not a war dance but just a merry-making of the younger people a few days previous our men had fought with the crows and shoshones general crook's allies and the enemies of my people had fallen as leaves when they turned yellow we were not harmed and there was no mourning in the village of the sioux on the plateau beside the greasy grass the river that the white men call the little big horn when my brother came to my tepee from the dance i still slept late the night before i and the other women of the hunk papa had laboured to make ready for the march that we were to take up that morning where we were going i know not where the men of the sioux go there go the women it is their duty and their pleasure our people were roaming through the country that had been given them before the coming of the whites the country was good there was rich grass for the ponies and sweet water the fields glowed with prairie flowers of yellow and red and blue there were buffaloes in the valleys and indian turnips on the hills for the digging we were rich in provisions and no man had a right to put out his hand and tell us that we should not roam the village by the greasy grass was but the stopping-place for a day or two and we had no thought of a fight with the white man the crows and shoshones we had no fears of for the lodges of the sioux were many and their men brave as the lion of the mountains but we were to move out to the northwest and i had made many bundles of my store thus it was that i lay sleeping when my brother came to the tepee in the dawn and asked for food i unpacked some of the bundles and prepared his breakfast buffalo meat stewed with turnips and set it before him and as he ate the people of the village awakened and the sun rose higher i have said that our lodges were many but how many people there were i know not there were about ten thousand indians including women and children in the village but the women were all at work and the ponies were being rounded up and preparations for leaving went on that we might be away before the heat of the day became great as it sometimes is in the country of my people and in the valleys near the big hills the village was made along the greasy grass and between that river and the big horn which flows north to the yellowstone the blackfeet who were not many had the place at the south end of the village next to the blackfeet and closer to the river were my people the hunkpapa down the river and next to the hunkpapa were the minneconju and below them the sansart behind the hunkpapa away from the river were the ogallala and the brule and below the minneconju to the north were the cheyennes up the river from the village of the blackfeet there was thick timber and through this we could not see 
i have seen my people prepare for battle many times and this i know that the sioux that morning had no thought of fighting we expected no attack and our young men did not watch for the coming of long hair custer and his soldiers most of the women were occupied in packing their stores preparatory to breaking camp and some of them were working along the bank of the river on the east side of the river an old man had shot a buffalo that morning and near where the buffalo lay dead some women and children were digging indian turnips these people first saw the soldiers who then were far to the east they were on the little hills between the greasy grass and the rosebud rivers they were six to eight miles distant when first seen and some of the younger people hurried in from the place where the buffalo was killed to notify the camp we could see the flashing of their sabres and saw that there were very many soldiers in the party my people went on with their work making ready to move across the big horn but the tepees were not yet down the men of the sioux were much excited and they watched the coming of long hair and hurried the women the village was not made for a fight and they would move on we had seen the soldiers marching along the high ridge on the east side of the river and were watching them but had not seen these others approaching mrs spotted hornbull halted in her story and thought for a few moments then she struck her hands sharply together to imitate the rattling of carbine fire and continued like that the soldiers were upon us through the tepee poles their bullets rattled the sun was several hours high and the tepees were empty bullets coming from a strip of timber on the west bank of the greasy grass passed through the tepees of the blackfeet and hunk papa the broken character of the country across the river together with the fringe of trees on the west side where our camp was situated had hidden the advance of a great number of soldiers which we had not seen until they were close upon us and shooting into our end of the village where from seeing the direction taken by the soldiers we were watching we felt comparatively secure the women and children cried fearing they would be killed but the men the hunk papa and blackfeet the thogalala and many kanju mounted their horses and raced to the blackfeet tepees we could still see the soldiers of long hair marching along in the distance and our men taken by surprise and from a point whence they had not expected to be attacked went singing the song of battle into the fight behind the blackfeet village and we women wailed over the children for we believed that the great father had sent all his men for the destruction of the sioux some of the women put loads on the travois and would have left but that their husbands and sons were in the fight others tore their hair and wept for the fate that they thought was to be the portion of the sioux through the anger of the great father but the men were not afraid and they had many guns and cartridges like the fire that driven by a great wind sweeps through the heavy grassland where the buffalo range the men of the hunk papa the blackfeet the ogallala and the many kanju rushed through the village and into the trees where the soldiers of the white chief had stopped to fire the soldiers renos had been sent by long hair to surprise the village of my people silently had they moved off around the hills and keeping out of sight of the young men of our people had crept in south of what men now call reno hill they had crossed the greasy grass and climbed the bench from the bank the way from the river to the plateau upon which our tepees stood was level but the soldiers were on foot when they came in sight of the black feet then it was that they fired and warned us of their approach mrs spotted hornbull stopped an instant and then said if the soldiers had not fired until all of them were ready for the attack if they had brought their horses and rode into the camp of the sioux the power of the dakota nation might have been broken and our young men killed in the surprise for they were watching long hair only and had no thought of an attack anywhere while they could see his soldiers travelling along parallel with the river on the opposite side and more than a rifle shot back from the river long hair had planned cunningly that reno should attack in the rear while he rode down and gave battle from the front of the village looking on the river but the great spirit was watching over his red children he allowed the white chief reno to strike too soon and the braves of the sioux ran over his soldiers and beat them down as corn before the hail they fought a few minutes and the men of the hunk papa the blackfeet ogallala and the many kanju bore them down and slew many of them all who did not get across the river were killed and long hair was still three miles away when nearly all of the blue coats that came to kill the sioux at our end of the village were dead only those escaped who were mounted on horses and got across the river 
those who crossed the river got on a high hill to the east where our young men did not attack them further until after custer and his men were killed two score of the blue coats lay dead on the field and our people took their guns and many cartridges and the morning was in the houses afar off where the women of the white braves waited to hear of the victory they expected their young men to win the shadow of the sun had not moved the width of a t p pole's length from the beginning to the ending of the first fight and while it was going on the old man who had shot the buffalo east of the river and some of the women and children who had been digging indian turnips and were cut off by the approach of reno's men came to the camp they had seen the soldiers of long hair and had heard the firing of reno's men and had secreted themselves in the timber along the river until the guns no longer spoke down the greasy grass river three or four miles from where reno's men had crossed the river and over across from the camps of the cheyennes and the sands arc there is an easy crossing of the greasy grass the crossing is near a butte and around the butte there runs a deep ravine from long hair's movements the sioux warriors knew that he had planned to strike the camp of my people from the lower end as reno struck it from the upper end even the women who knew nothing of warfare saw that reno had struck too early and the warriors who were generals in planning even as long hair was knew that the white chief would attempt to carry out his plan of the attack believing that reno had beaten our young men there was wild disorder in our camp the old women and children shrieked and got in the way of the warriors and the women were ordered back out of the village so that they might not be in the way of our soldiers and our men went singing down the river confident that the enemy would be defeated even as we believed that all of reno's men had been killed and i wept with the women for the brave dead and exulted that our braves should gain a great victory over the whites led by long hair who was the greatest of their chiefs and whose soldiers could then be plainly seen across the river from a hill behind the camp at first and then from the bank of the river i watched the men of our people plan to overthrow the soldiers of the great father and before a shot was fired i knew that no man who rode with long hair would go back to tell the tale of the fight that would begin when the soldiers approached the river at the lower end of the village the story-teller paused and was then asked the question where was sitting bull during the fight she went on as though she had not heard the question from across the river i could hear the music of the bugle and could see the column of soldiers turn to the left to march down to the river to where the attack was to be made all i could see was the warriors of my people they rushed like the wind through the village going down the ravine as the women went out to the grazing ground to round up the ponies it was done very quickly there had been no council the night before there was no need for one nor had there been a scalp dance nothing but the merry-making of the young men and the maidens when we did not know there was to be a fight we could not be prepared for it and our camp was not pitched anticipating a battle the warriors would not have picked out such a place for a fight with white men open to attack from both ends and from the west side no what was done that day was done while the sun stood still and the white men were delivered into the hands of the sioux but no plan was necessary our chiefs and the young men rode quickly down to the end of the village opposite to the hill upon which there now stands the great stone put up by the whites where long hair fell between that hill and the soldiers was a ravine which started from the river opposite the camp of the sands arc and ran all the way across the butte to get to the butte long hair must cross the ravine but from where he was marching with his soldiers he could not see into the ravine nor down to the banks of the river the warriors of my people of all the bands the sans arc the cheyenne the brule the minikanju the okalala the blackfeet all had joined with the hunk papa on our side of the greasy grass and opposite the opening into the ravine soon i saw a number of cheyennes ride into the river then some young men of my band then others until there were hundreds of warriors in the river and running up into the ravine when some hundreds had passed the river and gone into the ravine the others who were left still a very great number moved back from the river and waited for the attack and i knew that the fighting men of the sioux many hundreds in number were hidden in the ravine behind the hill upon which long hair was marching and he would be attacked from both sides and my heart was sad for the soldiers of long hair though they sought the lives of our men but i was a woman of the sioux and my husband my uncles and cousins and brothers all taking part in the battle where men who could fight and plan and i was satisfied pizzy gall 
and many of his young men had recrossed the greasy grass river after the white men had been driven off or killed in the earlier engagement at the upper end of the village where he with some of our warriors had been shooting at the soldiers who were chased to the hill and the soldiers had been shooting at them but could not hit the sioux when pizzi gall recrossed the river many women followed his party and we heard him tell his men to frighten the horses of the soldiers which were held in small bunches with shoutings that we could hear across the river the young men stampeded the horses and the women captured them and brought them to the village the indians fought the soldiers with bullets taken from the first party that attacked their village and many rode the horses captured from the white men who had fled to the hill to the northwest a great many women and children were driving in the ponies of the sioux but i remained with many other women along the bank of greasy grass river i saw crazy horse lead the cheyennes into the water and up the ravine crow king and the hunk papa went after them and then gall who had led his young men and killed the soldiers he had been fighting farther up the river rode along the beach by the river to where long hair had stopped with his men i cannot remember the time when men fight and the air is filled with bullets when the screaming of horses that are shot drowns the war whoop of the warriors a woman whose husband and brothers are in the battle does not think of the time but the sun was no longer overhead when the war whoop of the sioux sounded from the river bottom and the ravine surrounding the hill at the end of the ridge where long hair had taken his last stand the river was in sight from the butte and while the whoop still rung in our ears and the women were shrieking two cheyennes tried to cross the river and one of them was shot and killed by long hair's men then the men of the sioux nation led by crow king hump crazy horse and many great chiefs rose up on all sides of the hill and the last we could see from our side of the river was a great number of gray horses the smoke of the shooting and the dust of the horses shut out the hill and the soldiers fired many shots but the sioux shot straight and the soldiers fell dead the women crossed the river after the men of our village when we came to the hill there were no soldiers living and long hair lay dead among the rest there were more than two hundred dead soldiers on the hill and the boys of the village shot many who were already dead for the blood of the people was hot and their hearts bad and they took no prisoners that day the woman sat playing with the edge of her blanket of the dreadful things that took place on the hill after the command of the unfortunate custer had been annihilated she would of course say nothing the women of her nation finished the work of the warriors on that awful field i asked her if there was any more fighting not much the men on the hill renos were safe to stay there until they wanted water gall kept his men along the river some of the soldiers were shot as they tried to reach the water there was some fighting too but none of our young men were killed that night the sioux men women and children lighted many fires and danced their hearts were glad for the great spirit had given them a great victory all along the valley of the greasy grass fires were lighted and the women laughed as they labored hard to bring in the fuel for in the darkness they could see the gleam of the flames on the arms of the soldiers fastened in a trap on reno hill the people had taken many guns cartridges horses and much clothing from the soldiers and they rejoiced while the fires lit up the field on the hill across the river where the naked bodies of the soldiers lay we had much money but did not know at the time what its real value was and a lot of green paper money was kept in my teepee for some time before being disposed of all night the people danced and sang their songs of victory and they were strong in their might and would have attacked the soldiers who lay through the night on what you call reno hill but gall and crow king and crazy horse would waste no lives of the sioux braves they said we will shoot at them occasionally but not charge they will fall into our hands when the thirst burns in their throats and makes them mad for drink this was the counsel of the chiefs and the young men saw that it was good so while many feasted a few held the hill and the soldiers did not know it for of those who stole to the river to drink none went back alive there was fighting the next day but the sioux knew early in the day that many soldiers were coming up from the north and preparations were made to leave for new hunting grounds and while our hearts were singing for the victory our braves had won there were wailing women in the village for they had their dead since the sioux first fought the men who are our friends now they had not won so great a battle and at so little cost twenty-two dead were counted and the price was not great but what wife or mother or sister gives thought to victory when she finds her dead on the field so it was that in the midst of the rejoicing there was sorrowing among the women 
who would not be comforted in knowing that their dead had gone to join the ghosts of the brave the dead we took with us laid on travoy and carried for many days for among the white men were crow and shoshone scouts who would desecrate our dead and we would have no sioux scalps dangling at their teepee poles so we went out from greasy grass river and left long hair and his dead to their friends the people scattered and the pursuit did not harm us but i still remember the bitterness of the suffering of the sioux that winter after we had met and talked with bear coat general miles on the yellowstone when we were on our way north into the land of the redcoats where we remained five winters and were frequently very destitute while we remained there so it was that the sioux defeated long hair and his soldiers in the valley of the greasy grass river which my people remember with regret but without shame we are now living happily and in friendship with the whites knowing that their hearts are good toward us the great chiefs who led that fight are dead gall crow king crazy horse big road and the other head men are dead and gone to the land of ghosts but their deeds live and we of the sioux nation keep them in our memories even as we keep in remembrance long hair and his men whose bravery in battle makes the bravery of their conquerors a thing that cannot be buried in the grave nor forgotten because their ghosts are at peace and mrs spotted hornbull put the corner of her shawl to her face and wiped away a tear forced perhaps by the thought that the husband of her youth whom she has not forgotten though she has had many offers from chief men of her people was with the ghosts of those others who fought with and against him on that june day thirty-three years ago in the valley of the little big horn end of section ninety three this recording is in the public domain Section 94 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 94 the temecula valley an american grand pre eighteen sixty nine by helen hunt jackson most of the original mexican grants included tracts of land on which indians were living sometimes large villages of them in many of these grants in accordance with the old spanish law or custom was incorporated a clause protecting the indians they were to be left undisturbed in their homes the portion of the grant occupied by them did not belong to the grantee in any such sense as to entitle him to eject them the land on which they were living and the land they were cultivating at the time of the grant belonged to them as long as they pleased to occupy it in many of the grants the boundaries of the indians reserved portion of the property were carefully marked off and the instances were rare in which mexican grantees disturbed or in any way interfered with indians living on their estates there was no reason why they should there was plenty of land and to spare and it was simply a convenience and an advantage to have a skilled and docile indian laborer on the ground but when the easy-going, generous, improvident Mexican needed or desired to sell his grant, and the sharp American was on hand to buy it, then was brought to light the helplessness of the Indian's position. What cared the sharp American for that sentimental clause, without injury to the Indians? Not a farthing. Why should he? His government, before him, had decided that all the lands belonging to the old missions excepting the small portions technically held as church property and therefore out of commerce were government lands none of the indians living on those lands at the time of the american possession were held to have any right not even color of right to them that they and their ancestors had been cultivating them for three quarters of a century made no difference Americans wishing to preempt claims on any of these so-called government lands did not regard the presence on them of Indian families or communities as any more of a barrier than the presence of so many coyotes or foxes. They would not hesitate to certify the land office that such lands were 
unoccupied. Still less, then, need the purchaser of tracts covered by old Mexican grants hold himself bound to regard the poor cumberers of the ground, who, having no legal right whatever, had been all their years living on the tolerance of a silly, good-hearted Mexican proprietor. The American wanted every rod of his land, every drop of water on it. His schemes were boundless, his greed insatiable, he had no use for Indians. His plan did not embrace them, and could not enlarge itself to take them in. They must go. This is, in brief, the summing up of the way in which has come about the present pitiable state of the California Mission Indians. In some instances, whole villages of them had been driven off at once by fraudulently procured and fraudulently enforced claims. One of the most heartrending of these cases was that of the Temecula Indians. The Temecula Valley lies in the northeast corner of San Diego County. It is watered by two streams and has a good soil. It was an appanage of the San Luis Rey Mission, and the two hundred Indians who were living there were the children and grandchildren of San Luis Rey neophytes. The greater part of the valley was under cultivation. They had cattle, horses, sheep. In 1865, a special agent of the United States government held a Grand Indian Convention there. Eighteen villages were represented, and the numbers of inhabitants, stock, vineyards, orchards were reported. The Indians were greatly elated at this evidence of the government's good intentions toward them. They set up a tall liberty pole, and bringing forth a United States flag, which they had kept carefully hidden away ever since the beginning of the Civil War, they flung it out to the winds in token of their loyalty. It is astonishing, says one of the San Diego newspapers of the day, that these Indians have behaved so well, considering the pernicious teachings they have had from the secessionists in our midst. There was already anxiety in the minds of the Temecula Indians as to their title to their lands. All that was in existence to show that they had any was the protecting clause in an old Mexican grant. To be sure, the man was still alive who had assisted in marking off the boundaries of their part of this original Temecula grant, but his testimony could establish nothing beyond the letter of the clause as it stood. They earnestly implored the agent to lay the case before the interior department. Whether he did or not, I do not know, but this is the sequel. On April 15, 1869, an action was brought in the district court in San Francisco by five men against Andrew Johnson, Thaddeus Stevens, Horace Greeley, and 1,000 Indians and other parties whose names are unknown. It was a bill to quiet title, an action to recover possession of certain real estate bounded thus and thus. It included the Temecula Valley. It was based on grants made by Governor Michael Torina in 1844. The defendants cited were to appear in court within twenty days. The Indians appealed to the Catholic bishop to help them. He wrote to one of the judges an imploring letter, saying, Can you not do something to save these poor Indians from being driven out? But the scheme had been too skillfully plotted. There was no way, or at any rate no way was found, of protecting the Indians. The day came when a sheriff, bringing a posse of men and a warrant which could not be legally resisted, arrived to eject the Indian families from their houses, and drive them out of the valley. The Indians' first impulse was as determined as it could have been if they had been white, to resist the outrage. But on being reasoned with by friends, who sadly and with shame explained to them that by thus resisting they would simply make it the duty of the sheriff to eject them by force, and, if necessary, shoot down any who opposed the executing of his warrant, they submitted but they refused to lift hand to the moving. They sat down, men and women, on the ground, and looked on, some wailing and weeping, some dogged and silent, 
while the sheriff and his men took out of the neat little adobe houses their small stores of furniture clothes and food and piled them on wagons to be carried where anywhere the exiles chose so long as they did not chance to choose a piece of any white man's land a mexican woman is now living in that temecula valley who told me the story of this moving the facts i had learned before from records of one sort and another but standing on the spot looking at the ruins of the little adobe houses and the walled graveyard full of graves and hearing this woman tell how she kept her doors and windows shut and could not bear to look out while the deed was being done i realized how different a thing is history seen from history read it took three days to move them procession after procession with cries and tears walked slowly behind the wagons carrying their household goods they took the tule roofs off the little houses and carried them along they could be used again some of these indians wishing to stay as near as possible to their old home settled in a small valley only three miles and a half away to the south it was a dreary hot little valley bare with low rocky butts cropping out on either side and with scanty growths of bushes there was not a drop of water in it here the exiles went to work again built their huts of reeds and straw set up a booth of boughs for the priest when he came to say mass in and a rude wooden cross to consecrate their new graveyard on a stony hillside they put their huts on barren knolls here and there where nothing could grow on the tillable land they planted wheat or barley or orchards some patches not ten feet square the largest not over three or four acres they hollowed out the base of one of the rocky butts sunk a well there and found water i think none of us who saw the little refugee village will ever forget it the whole place was a series of pictures and knowing its history we found in each low roof and paling the dignity of heroic achievement near many of the huts stood great round baskets woven of twigs reaching halfway up to the eaves and looking like huge birds nests these were their granaries holding acorns and wheat women with red pottery jars on their heads and on their backs were creeping about bent over carrying loads of faggots that would have seemed heavy for a donkey aged women sitting on the ground were diligently plaiting baskets too busy or too old to give more than a passing look at us a group of women was at work washing wool in great stone bowls probably hundreds of years old the interiors of some of the houses were exquisitely neat and orderly with touching attempts at adornment pretty baskets and shelves hanging on the walls and over the beds canopies of bright calico on some of the beds the sheets and pillowcases were trimmed with white hand-wrought lace made by the indian women themselves this is one of their arts which date back to the mission days some of the lace is beautiful and fine and of patterns like the old church laces it was pitiful to see the poor creatures in almost every one of the hovels bringing out a yard or two of their lace to sell and there was hardly a house which had not the lace-maker's frame hanging on the wall with an unfinished piece of lace stretched in it the making of this lace requires much time and patience it is done by first drawing out all the lengthwise threads of a piece of fine linen or cotton then the threads which are left are sewed over and over into an endless variety of intricate patterns sometimes the whole design is done in solid buttonhole stitch or solid figures are filled in on an open network made of the threads the baskets were finely woven of good shapes and excellent decorative patterns in brown and black on yellow or white every face except those of the very young was sad beyond description they were stamped indelibly by generations of suffering immovable distrust also underlying the sorrow it was hard to make them smile to all our expressions of goodwill and interest they seemed indifferent 
and received in silence the money we paid them for baskets and lace. The word temecula is an Indian word, signifying grief or mourning. It seems to have had a strangely prophetic fitness for the valley to which it was given. End of section 94「Section 95 of the United States」read for LibriVox.org by Piotr Nater The United States, Volume 2, Part 14, The Spanish War Historical Note The Spanish rule in Cuba was so harsh that the Cubans tried many times to win their freedom. In 1895 they revolted again and fought with the utmost desperation. Spain could not suppress the revolt, but she treated all Cubans who fell into her hands with the greatest cruelty. On grounds of common humanity, and also to protect American interests in the island, the United States was feeling the necessity of interference when the main was blown up in the harbor of Havana. The belief that Spain was privy to the deed aroused the whole country to wrath, and in 1895 war against Spain was declared. The first blow was struck in the Philippines by Commodore Dewey, who steamed into the harbor of Manila and destroyed ten Spanish warships and one transport without the loss of a man. Spain then sent a fleet across the Atlantic. The vessels went into Santiago de Cuba for coal and were promptly bottled up, and American troops were sent to capture the town. When the Spanish fleet attempted to leave the bottle, the ships were destroyed by the American warships. By this battle, Spain lost property valued at $13 million. She had no more warships, and without them she could not hold island possessions. Santiago was surrendered, Puerto Rico was also given up, and in July Spain asked for peace, agreeing to free Cuba and to surrender Puerto Rico to the Americans, as well as Guam, a small island in the Ladrones. The Philippines she sold to the United States for $20 million. By this war of 113 days, Spain lost all her possessions in the West Indies and in the Pacific Ocean, and owns no longer a foot of the land in the Western world which her mariners discovered four centuries ago. End of section 95「Section 96 of the United States」read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Cuba to Columbia by Will Carleton April 1896 A voice went over the waters, a stormy edge of the sea. Fairest of freedom's daughters, have you no help for me? Do you not hear the rusty chain? clanking about my feet have you not seen my children slain whether in cell or street oh if you were sad as i and i as you were strong you would not have to call or cry you would not suffer long patience have i not learned it under the crushing years freedom have i not earned it toiling with blood and tears not of you my banners wave not on egyptian shore or by armenia's mammoth grave but at your very door oh if you were needy as i and i as you were strong you should not suffer bleed and die under the hoofs of wrong is it that you have never felt the oppressor's hand fighting with fond endeavour to cling to your own sweet land were you not half dismayed there in the century's night till to your view a sister's aid came like a flash of light oh what gift could ever be grand enough to pay the debt if out of the starry western land should come my lafayette end of section ninety six this recording is in the public domain Section 97 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. 
Section 97 The Sinking of the Main 1898 By Willis J. Abbott Humanitarian considerations, rather than regard for imperiled interests, brought the United States into a war which most emphatically their people did not desire. The great New York newspapers, day by day, printed circumstantial accounts of the frightful sufferings in Cuba. One journal secured a large number of photographs of scenes among the starving reconcentrados, which, greatly enlarged, were publicly exhibited in all parts of the Union. These pictures, showing the frightful distortions of the human body as the result of long starvation, showing little children mere skeletons looking mutely down on the dead bodies of their parents, brought home to the mind of the people the state of life in a neighboring land as no writing, however brilliant, could. A cry went up from every part of the United States that a Christian duty was imposed upon our nation to interfere for the alleviation of such horrible suffering. Charity came to the rescue with free contributions of provisions, and Congress made a heavy appropriation of money for the relief of the Cubans. But everywhere the opinion grew that philanthropy alone could not right this great wrong, but that the strong hand of the United States must reach forth to pluck out the Spaniard from the land he ravaged. And when a number of senators and representatives in Congress made journeys to Cuba, and returning, described in formal addresses at the Capitol the scenes of starvation and misery, this opinion hardened into positive conviction. Then, almost as if planned by some all-knowing power, came a great and inexplicable disaster, which made American intervention inevitable and immediate. During the latter years of the Cleveland administration, the representatives of American interests in Cuba urged that a United States ship of war should be permanently stationed in Havana Harbor. The request was reasonable, the act in thorough accord with the custom of nations. But, fearing to offend Spain, President Cleveland avoided taking the step, and President McKinley for months imitated him. In time, this act, which in itself could have no hostile significance, came to be regarded as an expression of hostility to Spain, and all the resources of Spanish diplomacy were exerted to prevent any American warship from entering Havana Harbor. Ultimately, however, the pressure of public opinion compelled the executive to provide for representation of American authority in the disordered island, and the battleship Maine, a sister ship to the Iowa, was sent to Havana. The night of February 15th, the Maine lay quietly at her anchorage in Havana Harbor. Her great white hull, with lights shining brilliantly from the ports aft, where the officers' quarters were, gleamed in the starlight. On the berth deck, the men swung sleeping in their hammocks. The watch on deck breathed gratefully the cool evening air after the long tropic day. Captain Sigsby was at work in his cabin, and the officers in the wardroom were chatting over their games or dozing over their books. The lights of the town and of the ancient fortress of Moro shone brightly through the purpling light. Not far away, the Spanish man of war, Alfonso XIII, lay at her moorings, and an American merchantman, brightly lighted, was near. The scene was peaceful, quiet, beautiful, true in the minds of many officers, and the man on the American warship there was a lurking and indefinable sense of danger. Their coming had been taken by the Spaniards in Havana as a hostile act, though all the perfunctory requirements of international courtesy had been complied with. Salutes interchanged, visits of ceremony paid and returned. There was yet in the Spanish greeting an ill-concealed tone of anger. In the cafes, Spanish officers cursed the Yankees and boasted of their purpose to destroy them. On the streets, American blue jackets, on shore leave, were jostled, jeered, and insulted. Yet the ill temper of the Spaniards, though apparent, was so ill defined that no apprehension of a positive attack was felt, as in the practice on men of war. However, the utmost vigilance was maintained. Only the employment of a boat patrol and the use of torpedo nettings were lacking to give the main the aspect of a ship in an enemy's harbor. Then came the disaster that shocked the world, a disaster in which it is impossible not to suspect the element of treachery, a disaster which, if purely accidental, 
occurring to a hated ship in a port surrounded by men who were enemies at heart was the most extraordinary coincidence in history this much we know at about half past nine those on the main who lived to tell the tale heard a sudden dull explosion with a slight shock then a prolonged deep furious roar which shook the ship to its very vitals the people on the other side in the harbor saw the whole forward portion of the main suddenly become a flaming volcano belching forth fire men huge pieces of steel and bursting shells portions of the ship's hull rained down on decks a thousand yards away when the first fierce shock of the explosion was passed it was seen that the main was on fire and was rapidly sinking how wonderful is the power of discipline on the human mind on the great battleship with hundreds of its men blown to pieces or penned down by steel debris to be drowned in the rapidly rising waters there was no panic captain sigsbury rushing from his cabin door is met by the sergeant of marines who serves him as orderly not a detail of naval etiquette is lacking sergeant william anthony salutes i have to report sir that the ship is blown up and is sinking he says as he would report a pilot boat in the offing the captain reaches the deck to find his officers already at work the men who have not been injured all at their stations boats are lowered and ply about the harbor to rescue survivors though the flames rage fiercely and the part of the ship which they have not yet reached is full of high explosives there is no panic at the first alarm every man has done what years of drill and teaching have taught him to do the after magazines have been flooded the boat's crews called away even preparations for a fight had been attempted lieutenant jenkins hearing the first explosion sprang so quickly for his station at a forward gun that he was caught in the second explosion and slain though a bolt from heaven or a shock from hell had struck the main it brought death only not fear nor panic the work of rescuing survivors and caring for the wounded was pushed apace for the ship sunk rapidly until only her after superstructure was above the waters boats from the spanish man-of-war joined in the work of mercy and her officers as though conscious that the suspicion of treachery was first in every man's mind exerted themselves in every way to show solicitude for the wounded and sorrow for the disaster when all was done that could be done and the roll of the ship's company was called it was found that two hundred and sixty-six brave americans were lost in havana harbor a friendly port after the raising of the main the american board of inquiry found that the destruction was caused by the explosion of a low form of explosive exterior to the ship on march sixteenth nineteen twelve the remains of the vessel were towed out to sea and sunk with all naval honors the bodies of the crew which had been recovered were buried in the national cemetery at arlington the editor end of section ninety seven this recording is in the public domain section ninety eight of the united states this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Huskin The World Story, Volume 13, The United States Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 98 The Battle of Santiago, 1898 from the account of a newspaper correspondent. The following graphic account of this battle was written by a newspaper correspondent who was aboard the American battleship Texas during the encounter. The Editor Almost before the leading ship was clear of the shadow of Morro Castle, the fight had begun. Admiral Cervera started it by a shell from the Almirante Oquendo to which he had transferred his flag. It struck none of the American vessels. In a twinkling, the big guns of the Texas belched forth their thunder, which was followed immediately by a heavy fire from our other ships. The Spaniards turned to the westward under full steam, 
pouring a constant fire on our ships, and evidently hoping to get away by their superior speed. The Texas, still heading inshore, kept up a hot exchange of shots with the foremost ships, which gradually drew away to the westward under the shadow of the hills. The third of the Spanish vessels, the Vizcaya, or Infanta Maria Teresa, was caught by the Texas in good fighting range, and it was she that engaged the chief attention of the first battleship commissioned in the American Navy. The Texas steamed west with her adversary, and as she could not catch her with speed, she did with her shells. The din of the guns was so terrific that orders had to be yelled close to the messenger's ears, and at times the smoke was so thick that absolutely nothing could be seen. Once or twice, the twelve-inch guns in the turrets were swung across the ship and fired. The concussion shook the great vessel, as though she had been struck by a great ball, and everything movable was splintered. The men near the guns were thrown flat on their faces. Meanwhile, the Oregon had come in on the run. She passed the Texas and chased after the Commodore Schley on the Brooklyn to head off the foremost of the Spanish ships. The Iowa also turned her course westward and kept up a hot fire on the running enemy. At ten ten o'clock, the third of the Spanish ships, the one that had been exchanging compliments with the Texas, was seen to be on fire, and a mighty cheer went up from our ships. The Spaniard headed for the shore, and the Texas turned her attention to the one following. The Brooklyn and the Oregon, after a few parting shots, also left her contemptuously and made all steam and shell after the foremost two of the Spanish ships, the Almirante Oquendo and the Cristobal Colon. Just then, the two torpedo boat destroyers Pluton and Ferrer were discovered. They had come out after the cruisers without being seen, and were boldly heading west down the coast. All small guns on the torpedo boats, was the order on the Texas, and in an instant, a hail of shot was pouring all about them. A six-pounder from the starboard battery of the Texas, under ensign guise, struck the foremost torpedo boat fairly in the boiler. A rending sound was heard above the roar of the battle. A great spout of black smoke shot up from the destroyer, and she was out of commission. The Iowa, which was coming up fast, threw a few complimentary shots at the second torpedo boat destroyer and passed on. The little Gloucester, formerly a yacht, then sailed in and finished the second boat. Gun for gun and shot for shot, the running fight was kept up between the Spanish cruisers and the four American vessels. At 10.30 o'clock, the Infanta Maria Teresa and Vizcaya were almost on the beach and were evidently in distress. As the Texas was firing at them, a white flag was run up on the one nearest her. Cease firing, called Captain Philip, and a moment later both the Spaniards were beached. Clouds of black smoke arose from each, and bright flashes of flame could be seen shining through the smoke. Boats were visible, putting out from the cruisers to the shore. The Iowa waited to see that the two warships were really out of the fight, and it did not take her long to determine that they would never fight again. The Iowa herself had suffered some very hard knocks. The Brooklyn, Oregon, and Texas pushed ahead after the Colon and Almirante Oquendo, which were now running the race of their lives along the coast. At 10.50 o'clock, when Admiral Severa's flagship, the Almirante Oquendo, suddenly headed inshore, she had the Brooklyn and Oregon abeam, and the Texas astern. The Brooklyn and Oregon pushed on after the Cristobal Colon, which was making fine time, 
and which looked as if she might escape, leaving the Texas to finish the Almirante Oquendo. This work did not take long. The Spanish ship was already burning. At 11.05 o'clock, down came a yellow and red flag at her stern. Just as the Texas got a beam of her, she was shaken by a mighty explosion. The crew of the Texas started to cheer. Don't cheer. The poor devils are dying, called Captain Philip. And the Texas left the Almirante Oquendo to her fate to join in the chase of the Cristobal Colon. That ship, in desperation, was plowing the waters at a rate that caused the fast Brooklyn trouble. The Oregon made great speed for a battleship, and the Texas made the effort of her life. Never since her trial trip had she made such time. The Brooklyn might have proved a match to the Cristobal Colon in speed, but she was not supposed to be her match in strength. It would never do to allow even one of the Spanish ships to get away. Straight into the west, the strongest chase of modern times took place. The Brooklyn headed the pursuers. She stood well out from the shore in order to try to cut off the Cristobal Colon at a point jutting out into the sea far ahead. The Oregon kept a middle course, about a mile from the cruiser. The desperate dawn ran close along the shores, and now and then he threw a shell of defiance. The old Texas kept well up in the chase, under the forced draft, for over two hours. The fleet Spaniard led the Americans a merry chase, but she had no chance. The Brooklyn gradually forged ahead so that the escape of the Cristobal Colon was cut off at the point above mentioned. The Oregon was a beam of the Colon then, and the gallant Don gave it up. At 1.15 o'clock, he headed for the shore, and five minutes later down came the Spanish flag. None of our ships was then within a mile of her, but her escape was cut off. The Texas, Oregon, and Brooklyn closed in on her and stopped their engines a few hundred yards away. Commodore Schley left the Brooklyn in a small boat and went aboard the Cristobal Colon and received the surrender. Meantime, the New York, with Admiral Sampson on board, and the Vixen were coming up on the run. Commodore Schley signaled to Admiral Sampson, We have won a great victory. Details will be communicated. Then, for an hour after the surrender, in that little cove under the high hills, was a general Fourth of July celebration, though a little premature. Our ships cheered one another, the captains indulged in compliments through the megaphones, and the Oregon got out its band, and the strains of the star-spangled banner echoed over the lines of the Spaniards, drawn up on the deck of the last of the Spanish fleet, and up over the lofty green-tipped hills of the Cuban mountains. End of section 98 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Meg Huskin. Section 99 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Meg Huskin. The Charge at El Canet by Frank T. Merrill. Painting, page 488. While the Spanish fleet under Cervera was shut into the harbor of Santiago. It was decided to capture the town with a land force, and on the morning of July 1st, a general attack was made against the Spanish entrenchments on the heights of El Cane and San Juan. El Cane was held by about 500 Spaniards, who made a gallant stand against a force of nearly ten times their number and did not retreat until more than half of them were killed or captured. Quote, the attacking force was composed entirely of regulars, 
with the exception of the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment in Ludlow's brigade. These volunteers, never in action before, behaved extremely well, coming up steadily under fire and taking their places in the firing line. But the moment they opened with their archaic Springfields and black powder, which they owed to the narrow parsimony of Congress, and to the lack of energy and efficiency in the system of the War Department, they became not only an easy mark for the Spanish Mausers, but made the position of more peril to all the other troops. In consequence of this, they had to be withdrawn from the firing line, but not until they had suffered severely and displayed an excellent courage. The lack of artillery and the black powder made the assault on El Cane a work to which infantry should not have been forced. Yet they were forced to it, and supported by only four guns, but splendidly led by Parton, Chafee, and Ludlow. They carried the position at heavy cost by sheer courage, discipline, and good fighting, manifesting these great qualities in a high degree, and one worthy of very lasting honor and remembrance. End quote. Henry Cabot Lodge this illustration shows the 2nd Massachusetts Volunteers charging up the hill at El Cane. It is from a painting made under the direction of Colonel Embury P. Clark, Springfield, Massachusetts, commander of the regiment, and is reproduced through the courtesy of Mr. C. W. Gersh of New York City, holder of the copyright. End of section 99. This recording is in the public domain. Section 100 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Flag Goes By by Henry Holcomb Bennett. Hats off! Along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums, a flash of color beneath the sky. Hats off! The flag is passing by. Blue and crimson and white it shines over the steel-tipped ordered lines hats off the colors before us fly but more than the flag is passing by sea fights and land fights grim and great fought to make and to save the state weary marches and sinking ships cheers of victory on dying lips days of plenty and years of peace march of a strong land swift increase Equal justice, right, and law, stately honor and reverend awe, sign of a nation great and strong, to ward her people from foreign wrong, pride and glory and honor, all live in the colors to stand or fall. Hats off, along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums, and loyal hearts are beating high. Hats off. The flag is passing by. End of section 100. This recording is in the public domain. Section 101 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 15. The 20th Century. Historical Note. The history of the first part of the 20th century is almost startling in the rapid progress which it records. The numbers of discoveries and inventions which have reached their highest development and have come into general use within the 20th century are countless. Comfort, convenience, and the extension of trade have been sought in numerous ways. Irrigation has enlarged the amount of arable land in the United States. Pure food laws have made this country a more desirable place to live in and have given promise to its people of longer and more healthy lives. Facilities for transportation of things and people have greatly increased. The parcel post has at last been introduced. The functions of the Red Cross have broadened until it is looked to as the first friend in any kind of public calamity. Aviation has made amazing progress. The Panama Canal has been built. The various applications of electricity electric cars, the telephone, wireless telegraphy, etc., have become necessities of everyday life, and by no means should the little conveniences be forgotten. 
tiny but most valuable aids to comfort and safety. Younger folk take all these things as a matter of course, older ones look at them half wonderingly, and peer forward in imagination to the twenty-first century, thinking of the power, the resources, and the problems of the country, but confident that a solution of the problems will be found, and that the power and resources will work for the happiness and the best good of those who will then be the people of the United States and citizens of the blessed land of room enough. End of section 101. This recording is in the public domain. Section 102 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 102, The Romance of the Reindeer, 1905. By Mary Gay Humphreys. Something was known of the Alaskan coast in the 16th century, and during the 18th it was visited by explorers of Russian, English, and other nationalities. Russian colonies developed the fur trade, but as furs decreased, the country was looked upon as of small value, and when the United States in 1867 bought Russian America, as it was then called, and paid $7,200,000, it was regarded by many as an exceedingly foolish purchase. The Russians knew that both gold and copper existed in the land, but they made no attempt to develop the minerals, and even after the country came into the hands of the United States, there was for many years only a very moderate amount of mining done. In 1896, gold was found in the Canadian Klondike, and soon after in several different parts of Alaska, and in a few months the lonely northern country was full of eager miners. In 1898, there were more than 40,000 persons in the Klondike region alone, and in a single year, the gold mines of this, quote, wearless land of ice and snow, end quote, yielded more than double its purchase price. In order that the agricultural possibilities of Alaska might be developed, and the vast mineral wealth made accessible, Congress, in 1914, at the recommendation of President Wilson, appropriated forty million dollars for the construction of a railroad into the interior the editor a mistress went to castle garden when that was a port of entry for a maid she found a demure little swede can you cook the mistress asked no ma'am can you sweep and make beds no ma'am what then can you do she asked in desperation i can milk reindeer ma'am in that day, to come to this country to milk reindeer was like going to Tahiti to cut ice. Now you can cut ice in Tahiti, and there are thousands of reindeer in this country waiting to be milked, and prepared to furnish butter and cheese, and perform duties which they alone can perform. The civilization of Alaska by reindeer is one of the prettiest tales ever told of imagination justified by experience, one of the most convincing stories of the glance of the prophetic eye fully and speedily realized. It is also the story of discouragement, ridicule, persistence against overwhelming odds, and, what is more difficult, of the combat with skepticism, against which only the most enlivening faith, undaunted hope, and unconquerable energy can make way. Until gold was found in Alaska, it was the neglected stepchild of the country. Except to the missionary and the seal hunters of the coast, the inhabitants of the Arctic Circle had not even a place in the census. The missionary is a curious person. He sees things through the eye of faith, as others see through knowledge. To this trade is due, as so many other vital but unrecognized acts are due, that machinery of the new civilization in Alaska, now so successfully under way. Of this the reindeer is the motive power. It was the missionary that supplied it. In 1890, Dr. Sheldon Jackson, making his inspecting tour among the Alaskan missions, became aware of an impending dangerous situation. The greed of the white man was devastating both land and sea. The whalers had driven the whales to other seas. The walrus was nearly exterminated by steam and rapid-firing guns. The hunted seals no longer played about the coastline. To find them, the native had to go far out to sea. This meant that the inhabitants of northern Alaska were being deprived of their food, 
their clothing, light, implements, and their industries. Famine was depopulating them, and it was inevitable that the government would soon have thousands of helpless persons dependent on its bounty for food. Across the thirty miles of water we know as Bering Straits was Siberia, with a people comfortably prosperous and living under almost the same natural conditions. The contrast was too striking not to excite attention and inquiry. To Dr. Jackson the answer seemed to lie in the possession of the Siberians of the domestic reindeer. To the Siberian the reindeer was food, clothing, beast of burden, and article of commerce. The reindeer is prolific. It costs nothing for its keep. Under the vast snowfields of the frozen north lies the reindeer moss on which it feeds. Why, then, should the reindeer not be to the Alaskan what it is to his neighbor across the Bering Straits? The proposition was so convincing that Dr. Jackson hastened to Washington to lay it before Congress and ask for a small appropriation to buy a few Siberian reindeer for the present emergency, and in the belief that they would secure Alaska against future catastrophes. To Congress this was only one of those rainbow schemes for which it is so often called upon to provide. Senator Teller, indeed, urged the appropriation, but his voice was lost in this handsome opportunity for oratorical satire and senatorial puns. Dr. Jackson did not get his appropriation, but a sufficient number of outside people were interested in the project to subscribe $2,000 as a venture, and the government did allow the revenue cutter Tetis to take Dr. Jackson to Siberia to make his purchases. But the Siberians did not want to sell. The Tetis sailed 1,500 miles before an owner could be found willing to part with his deer. Money he refused. What were bits of metal to him? At last he consented to barter for American goods. Thus, sixteen deer only were secured. This was in 1891, a beginning so insignificant that it attracted no attention. Meanwhile, Senator Teller continued to press the matter on the Senate, and at last senatorial courtesy prevailed. Quote, Teller has this at heart. He only asks six thousand dollars. It is a small sum. Let him have it. End quote. So the senators argued, and the first appropriation was made in 1894. In 1897, this was increased to $12,000. In 1900, it was changed to $25,000 and has since continued at this figure. In all, the government has given $183,000 for the propagation and purchase of reindeer for Alaska, with the following results. Today, there are 8,000 reindeer in Arctic and subarctic Alaska. Of these, the government owns 4,000 and the natives own 4,000. Any one of these is worth for the butcher alone fifty dollars. This is to say that, for food merely, the government and the native each have two hundred thousand dollars in reindeer out of the original investment of one hundred eighty-three thousand dollars. It would be interesting to know how many of the investments of the government pay as well. Satisfactory as the reindeer have been from a financial point of view, this is the least important result. The reindeer is so prolific that this modest beginnings soon entailed a system of distribution which has since been successfully followed. At first, Siberian herders were brought over to care for the herd. To these, Eskimos were apprenticed in order to learn the care of the deer, to train and break them to harness. They served five years, receiving food and clothes from the government. They were also to have the loan of two female deer a year and to regard these and their fawns as the nucleus of a future herd. After five years, if the apprentice was satisfactory, he was to receive a loan of enough deer to bring the number up to fifty. As a herder, he was now obliged to supply himself and family, and could take apprentices himself. For twenty years the government exercises supervision over these herders. If a herder should drink, or not take proper care of his herd, he can be dispossessed, and his herd loaned to another person. On his part, he agrees not to sell any female deer to any purchaser except the government. Deer were also loaned to the mission station, with the same provisions as to the apprentices and sale, they agreeing to return to the government when called upon the original number of deer loaned. One instance alone illustrates the value of these loans to the missions. In 1894, 100 deer were loaned to the Congregational Mission at Cape Prince of Wales. 
Since then the mission has repaid the loan, and now owns 1,000 head of deer. Such ownership means to the mission a permanence it could not otherwise have, since the natives, not being required to go afar for food, escape the demoralization of the mining camps. It also affords an opportunity of encouraging and rewarding worthy native families and promoting their material interests. It affords, moreover, a source of revenue in selling male deer to the miners for food and for transportation. A sledge deer is valued at one hundred and fifty dollars, and is superseding dogs for this purpose. A couple of deer in harness will haul seven hundred and fifty pounds, and find their own food in the reindeer moss beneath the snow. As food, the deer afford a constant supply of fresh meat, which means much to people condemned to live on canned goods the greater part of the year. Of the sixty owners of herds, two-thirds are Eskimos, who have secured their deer through apprenticeship, and have been trusted to become owners. Two are women, and one of these, with the exception of the mission at Cape Prince of Wales, is the foremost of what will yet come to be the reindeer aristocracy of Alaska, a class corresponding to the great cattle ranchers of the plains. Mary Antisarluk, now Andriuk, owns 358 deer and fawns. A woman who can neither read nor write, she speaks seven languages, and has been of great service to the government as interpreter. If to her natural abilities as a linguist, woman of affairs, and executive ability, she has had the advantages of education, and been placed outside of the Arctic regions, she would have been, quote, one of the women of our times, end quote. As it is, she is the, quote, unquote, reindeer queen of Alaska. This is what the reindeer has done in a few years for the material prosperity of the natives of Alaska. It is but the beginning of the future of the reindeer over a pasturage which will easily accommodate ten million head, a pasturage of perpetual snow over which no other animal can graze. The reindeer is a timid animal. A sudden movement will put him to flight. Being timid, he is gregarious, and a herder can easily care for one thousand heads. He is so gentle that, being domesticated, he will eat out of hand and follow like a dog. He is so speedy that Paul de Chailloux tells of travelling 150 miles in a day in a reindeer sledge. A pair can hold 750 pounds and can make 35 miles a day through the unbroken snow, finding their own food, and this for weeks at a time. The colder it is, the better they thrive. It is the reindeer that has transformed the postal facilities of Alaska. There are now semi-monthly mails to the Yukon and Nome during the winter, where before there were none. The longest route is that to Point Barrow, the most northern post office on the globe. Here are a whaling station and a mission that formerly received but one mail a year, and that sometimes failed. Now reindeer carry a winter mail over 1,300 miles without road or trail, the thermometer from 20 to 60 degrees below zero, to that faraway post on the Arctic Ocean. There have been acts of beneficence accomplished through prolonged peril that deserve a place among the records of heroic deeds, which only the presence of the reindeer have made possible. In the autumn of 1897, eight whalers and 275 men were caught in the ice near Point Barrow, with only three months' provision. It would be at least a year before the ice released them and starvation awaited them. No vessel with food could get within 2,000 miles of them, nor was there any method of transporting food over land. But there were herds of deer at Cape Nome. Responding to a call for volunteers, Lieutenants Jervis and Berthold and Surgeon Cole of the Navy made their way by dog sleds to Cape Nome to the Congregational Mission. Here they secured 500 deer, and aided by W. T. Lopp, the missionary in charge, and Eskimo herders, made their way over the unbeaten snow 750 miles in an Arctic winter, arriving at Point Barrow, after a journey of three months, just in time to save the starving men. Of the reindeer, 246 were used for food, and the remainder kept to form the nucleus of a herd at Point Barrow, to provide against future emergencies. Five years before this, rescue could not possibly have been effected, and in this case it was due entirely to the prophetic eye which saw what reindeer might be to the frozen north. In 1900, the soldiers employed in building the government telegraph on the Yukon were imprisoned by the winter storms. The Russians were failing, 
and the mules had given out when word reached a mission station. Dr. Gambrill and an assistant started immediately with deer, and the troops with their camp equipage were brought out in safety. Thereafter the deer were kept with them, meanwhile hauling telegraph poles until the work was done. The discovery of gold and the influx of miners has given a new impetus to the reindeer industry. The miner must be fed, and he must be carried long distances prospecting. A dog team required to go a long distance can carry only its own supplies. With a reindeer team, the miner can haul his own outfits and supplies, and the reindeer feeds himself. The mining interest alone, which in the beginning was not a factor to be considered, has opened an immense field to the reindeer industry, and helped to ensure a livelihood for the Alaskan natives, who bade fair so short a time to be a national charge. The increase of the deer, and the ease with which the fawns are cared for, the herds doubling every three years, warrant the conservative estimate that in three decades there will be ten million reindeer in Alaska. There are also those who believe that within that time reindeer hams and tongs will be shipped to the United States, helping to feed our population. End of section 102